The story starts with the introduction of the Heavy Knight class, which specialized in defense. However, when compared to all other defensive classes, this one wasn't as versatile and therefore people frowned upon it. And to make the matter even worse, the attack stats were also very low, which made leveling up a hell. Some would argue that that was the worst class that ever existed. And with that said, we can start with our story and I think you see where this is going. Now we see our main protagonist having a flashback about how he always always felt that everything was familiar to him while he learned new information as a child. He had that flashback on the day of the divine blessing ceremony when he was about to receive his baptism and find out his class. Boy oh boy he's in for a treat. So our protagonist was the heir of the Edwin family and his name was Elma and to him the ceremony itself felt rather familiar and it seemed like he had been through the whole thing before even though that was his first and only time being baptized. His father the head of the Edwin family, encouraged him and said that he would receive a powerful class because he was his son after all. And while the priest was conducting the baptism process, Elma couldn't shake off the feeling that he had experienced that before and his memory goes back even to the time when he wasn't even born. Elma, having that strange familiar feeling, hoped that he would obtain the heavy knight class and that was indeed what happened. Elma was happy and he hurried to notify his father about his class, but seeing the look on his father's face made him question his enthusiasm. His father was furious, but he pretended that Elma said that he became a sword saint which was deemed as the most powerful class. It was only then that Elma realized that what felt familiar to him were the memories of his previous life and that in this world, classes which were easy to master were valued and the ones that required skill and effort effort were considered bad. Elma thought that the evaluation system was broken, but that didn't matter to his father. He came up to Elma and took his hand by force to check the status menu to see his class. He was filled with rage and shouted at Elma for becoming a heavy knight and he added how it was the worst class out there because his stats were all low and he didn't even have a single attacking skill. Elma tried to say that his defensive stats are top notch but his father smacked him across the face and said that he couldn't care less about his defense. Come on bro we need tanks in this world, nobody wanna play a tank. Now he added how he was happy that the ceremony wasn't performed publicly and while he was showing his disgust with his son, a girl in high heels walked towards them. She came in front of everyone and informed them that her divine blessing ceremony should take place that same day as well. Her name was Maris and she belonged to a branch family of the Edwin household and Elma remembered how they used to play together when they were kids. Bros, I swear these names are so confusing to me. Elma is a girl's name in my native la language and Maris is a boy's name and here we have it opposite. It's, it's messing me up, man. Now, anyways, Elma's father said that it would be okay to have her baptized as well, but Elma had a bad, bad feeling about it. She of course got the sword saint class and she immediately started looking down on Elma and as Elma had expected his father immediately cheered up and told Maris that she would become his daughter and his next successor. Maris loved every single bit of attention that she was getting but she tried to play innocent by saying how she thought that Elma was the next successor and that was when his father exploded with anger once again. He told Elma that he was a disgrace to the Edwin family for having gotten the heavy knight class and when Elma tried to stand up for himself his father cut him off. I mean bro it's not like he could choose and he made a wrong choice. What the heck man? <laughs> now he even disowned him and kicked him out on the streets and forbade him from ever using the Edwin name on the streets. And without even listening to Elma, his father took off together with Maris and Elma was kicked on the streets with just his belongings. The very next morning, Elma woke up in an inn and he was furious at his father for having kicked him out and made him start his life from a zero. But despite all that that happened, Elma was still happy that he had become a heavy knight. It seemed that Elma's deja vu feelings were related to a game he used to play, but the city of Rondelm was clearly different from the one he was used to. Elma would need to explore everything once again, but before 
before anything, he wanted to check whether his class was still the same like how he remembered it, and when he opened the status menu, he was delighted to see that everything was just how he wanted it to be. Elma explained the system skill tree, it was basically the same like in any other game, and the only difference was that in that world, classes had a specific skill tree on top of the one that was accessible to every other class, and the only skill that was class specific that Elma had was the vow of the heavy armor skill, which was actually considered to be very bad because it was too difficult to master. The other two skills that Elma could have spent his five remaining skill points on, which he got from the baptism, were increased defense skill and novice swordsmanship, which increased the defensive and attacking stats respectively. However, Elma decided to spend all of his skill points to upgrade his class specific skill and by doing so his defense went up by 10 points and he even acquired a new skill called Rampert Return, Rampet Return, I don't know, for some reason I feel like it's pronounced Rampet Return, but it has R in it, I'm not sure, help a brother out, tell me down in the comments below how do you pronounce R-A-M-P-A-R-T, Rampert or Rampet? Anyways, Elma immediately went out in the woods and we can see that his equipment was poor and he had a soldier sword and some iron armor. As soon as he got there, he encountered a frog which was actually a demon monster called Lana. Elma knew its stats and the frog immediately attacked him the moment it saw him. Elma was surprised by the sudden attack but he didn't flinch nor move. He just stood where he was. As soon as the frog made impact with his armor, it was sent flying back and that was enough to kill it. Killing the frog increased Elma's level to 2 and he was able to do it because of his rampant return skill that blocked off any attacks and redirected them back to the enemy. However, that was only possible when Elma's defensive stats were higher than the enemy's attacking stats. The frog disintegrated and it dropped a level to mana stone, which Elma decided to keep even though it wasn't very valuable. Elma heard a voice and it seemed that someone was screaming for help. A scared adventurer was running towards Elma and it seemed that an army of Lanas were after him. Elma stood in front of the scared adventurer and the guy thought that Elma might have been someone very strong after he saw the way he was dressed, but Elma had to disappoint him by saying that he had just leveled up for the very first time ever and that made the guy even more disheartened because he thought that even he himself was stronger than Elma. The guy closed his eyes as the frog slapped on Elma, but Elma just stood there like a boss. <laughs> he hadn't moved an inch and the frogs were all killed and their dead bodies had bounced off of his armor. When the guy opened his eyes and saw all the dead Lanas, he asked Elma who he was and instead of saying he was from the Edwin household, Elma introduced himself as Elma the Heavy Knight. After defeating all of those Lanas, Elma got the unshakable title. He checked his status menu once again and it really seemed that the whole system was exactly like how he remembered it. The scared guy from earlier stood up and introduced himself as Ares. He went on to say how he came from a small village and he was left out on his own because no one wanted to party with him because they thought that he was too weak. He thanked Elma but Elma told him that he would keep all the mana stones for himself and there was no reason to thank him. Ares had a proposition, he thought that when they go back to the town, Elma and him could join the party because Elma's defensive stats were great and on top of that, the best way of defensive classes to level up was that they work together with others. Elma wasn't thinking of teaming up with anyone though and he had to decline his offer which didn't make sense to Ares. The reason why Elma didn't want to enter a party was that larger parties meant that the experience would be shared between all the members and that would make his journey a longer one. What he wanted was to earn as much items and skills as he possibly could, but he was also aware of the fact that doing everything on his own would be almost impossible. Ares tried to talk some sense to Elma to persuade him to team up with others, but as he was talking, Elma sensed something. Right behind Ares, a huge spider jumped from the bushes and attacked him. If Ares hadn't jumped to the side, he would have been dead as the spider attacked him with one of his clawed legs. Ares was happy that he was still alive, but they had to deal with that demon spider now. Its full name was Aranda Ape and it was twice the level of Elma. Elma realized that the monster was smart as it had the skill to move silently and on top of that, its attacking skills were a poison that restricted movement and fire claw which was its main weapon. 
Elman realized that his return rampage skill would be useless because the monster was way stronger than him and if he was to get hit even once it would be all over. Airy stood up and said that it was his fault that they were in that situation that they were in and he felt like he needed to take responsibility for his actions. But Elma knew that he was scared to death so he told him that everything would be alright and that he would take care of the giant spider monster. Ares warned Elma that this wasn't a game and that he could die if he gets pierced by the spider's claw and he added how the monster was too strong for him to handle. But Elma just opened his status menu and as he had 28 skill points from all the Lanas he killed, he used all of them to improve his vow of the heavy armor skill and when he did that, he got just the skill he needed in order to defeat the Aranda ape. That skill was called heady therm and what it did was that it lowered the attacking stats of any enemy for a short period of time. It lasted just for a minute but it lowered the monster's attack by 20%. Elmo was now ready to take on the monster and he waited for it to attack and he loved the adrenaline that his heavy knight class brought with him. It was very difficult and risky but that made the rewards greater as well. So the monster screeched out very loudly and started attacking but Elma could dodge its attack because he could remember the monster's attacking pattern. However, Elma knew that it wouldn't be easy. The spider anchored itself and started channeling a spell. It took it some time but when it was ready, it fired off a beam of spider web directly at Elma who just took a defensive stance and took the shot head on. Elma was completely covered in spider web but he was able to make it all go away with just one swing of his sword and he also inflicted some damage to the demon spider as well. The damage was minimal because the spider's spell also reduced some of Elma's attacking stats. The demon spider didn't like that it took damage from Elma and that sent him into rage. He got up on his back legs and raised his claws and it was getting ready for a powerful attack. The spider unleashed a barrage of attacks on Elma and Aerys was worried that that might be it for his fellow adventurer. But as soon as the smoke from the attacks had disappeared, Aerys saw that Elma was still standing tall. Elma knew that the spider was um, uh, out of mana because it only had 11 mana points and the spider web skill it just used required 7 mana points and its flame claws required 5 mana points. Elma knew that that was his chance to attack and that's exactly what he did. Elma took some time to take everything that happened into account. He inflicted 2 blows to the monster. His heady therm spell was still working but it was slowly wearing off and the spider's attack was reduced by 10% now. But there was one more thing that Elma needed to take into consideration for the calculations he was doing and that was that he gained a 40% increase in all defensive stats while he stood still and that was the effect of the immovable title he had acquired. Having said that, he was happy with all the conditions and he ran to create some distance between him and the demon spider. When he thought that he ran enough, Elma turned around and took a defensive stance and proceeded to remain still as he waited for the monster to attack him. When the monster's attack made impact with Elma, his return rampage skill had activated and to the demon spider it felt like it attacked a fortified castle. That's what stunned the demon monster and Elma went to kill it off with his sword. When he finally killed it, he obtained 4 skill points and he immediately went to check his status menu. But when he opened it, there was nothing special for him to see. There was one more thing that Elma wanted to check and when he wiped his status window, he saw one special spec which only said heavy but he couldn't investigate what it meant because Aeris was running towards him. Elmo was happy that he unlocked all the basic skills for his class and Aerys couldn't believe what Elma just managed to do and while he was shocked, Elma thought to himself that he would indeed be able to defeat any monster on his own and as he crouched down to pick up the large mana stone that was dropped by the demon spider, Elma started feeling a bit dizzy. It seemed that the demon spider had released some type of poison and because of that, Elma had to ask Aerys to help him back into the town. When Elma recovered from the poison, he went to the adventurer's guild to register himself as an adventurer. He went inside and stated his name and level and the receptionist, having confirmed his class, stamped his ID card and Elma was finally officially an adventurer. He explained how there was a total of 7 ranks of adventurers and he was currently rank F. 
Why that was important was the fact that there was a limit to how much one could upgrade his skills and that meant that Elmo would need to become an E rank adventurer as soon as he possibly could. Elmo took out a bag that was filled with mana stones, but before he could give it to the receptionist to inspect them, other adventurers that were there started making fun of him. They said how no one wanted to work with a low level heavy knight class and the whole adventurers guild started to laugh. The receptionist didn't know what to say, but Elmo wasn't moved by their words. He just confirmed that there weren't many heavy knight adventurers and that he would remain a solo adventurer for the time being. He finally emptied the contents from his bag and the first thing that the receptionist asked him was whether he had been hunting all by himself and Elma said that that was true. He gathered all of the mana stones by himself and he wanted them inspected as soon as possible. The adventurers that made fun of Elma just moments ago thought that he must have tricked someone to steal their mana stones. Either that or the only other explanation they could come up with was that Elma was somehow cheating. But Elma couldn't care about what they thought as the receptionist had finished inspecting the mana stones and he had been paid a lot of money making it rain. So he was now registered and settled for a while and that made the other adventurers angry. They couldn't stand the fact that a heavy knight class adventurer had managed to gain that much money in such a short amount of time. Elma had one more question for the receptionist and he asked her whether there were any available quests for his promotion to rank E. The receptionist took a look at the list of available quests and even though she saw quite a few of them, she didn't think any of them were suitable for Elma's current level. But that was all he needed to know and he took one of the quests and made his way to the site. Elma made his way to a graveyard and when he got there, he saw that he wasn't the only one that wanted to take the promotion quest. The place was filled with all sorts of adventurers and they all seemed to be listening to one person that was in charge. The first thing that the bearded guy said was that there were many adventurers whose actions were very silly and that they hadn't thought them through and he even turned to Elma to tell him that he was one of them. The bearded guy also thought that Elma was a fraud that tried to make his way up the rank by using all sorts of tricks and he refused to believe that Elma was able to beat an Aranda ape all by himself. He wanted to beat him up for that but Elma just stood there without flinching. Elma hated the fact that no one believed him but he knew that how he reacted to those words would affect the outcome of whether he would be accepted to take part in the promotion quest or not so he decided to act humble. He begged the bearded guy to accept him and even though he wasn't actually happy with that he chose to give Elma a chance. His name was Mr. Geutam? I swear this manga and the names in it. G-A-U-T-A-M. How do you pronounce this? How do you? <laughs> Anyways, his name was Mr. Geutam, and he immediately ordered his subordinate called Tail to start with the scouting. Tail used her scouting spell, and she immediately sensed a swarm of 30 demon monsters coming their way. Geutam congratulated her, and she jokingly asked him to promote her to a higher rank. But when Tail noticed Elma, she told him how she had heard everything that happened at the guild and that's why she was interested in him. Elma inspected her outfit and from the looks of it, he deducted that she was probably a red magician. Red magicians excelled in all sorts of magic and they were the most versatile magician class that existed. Tail also added that even though there was all that fame surrounding Elma's huge mana stone hole, she felt pity for him for having Heavy Knight as his class. Elma defended his class and said how he liked it, but Tail wasn't particularly impressed and just told him not to slack. Elma remembered how in the game the Red Magician class was really powerful and it was known for its stealth features. Geltem announced that the monsters that were coming at them were led by monsters that were called ghoul heads and he said that he would take care of them as they were a bit too strong for novice adventurers and he also added that he wouldn't spend his time protecting anyone. Elma could remember that monster from the game as well and they weren't dangerous when they looked only at their stats but they had one skill called the breath of Hades that could make whites out of lion corpses and that was a pain to deal with. Elma thought that they could end up victorious if Geutem was actually a D-rank adventurer and when he took everything into account, 
Elma calculated that their chances of survival were about 80%. Elma had thought that those odds were pretty good for a game, but now the conditions were different and he wasn't playing a game, now it was a matter of life and death. That's why Elma decided to walk up to Gautam and try to make him listen to him. Elma tried persuading him to change their strategy, but Gautam felt offended by Elma telling him what they should or what they shouldn't do. Elma told Gautam that seeing the undead hordes in person wasn't the same as was told in the report, but Gautam simply said how it was too late to change their plan now. Elma just stood there hoping that Gautam would change his mind after he told him that all the adventurers there were of very low levels and that they all relied on him, but Gautam simply said that he disliked babysitting and that was the end of their discussion. Tail walked up and started making fun of Elma and she thought that Elma was scared of the undead when in reality he was just trying to help everyone else because he knew what was coming at them. Tail continued to belittle our hero who just stood there silently. Tail also told Gautam that there was no need for him to listen to someone like Elma. She continued talking and now she was speaking to everyone and she said that if anyone was afraid, they should just stay behind her back and take cover, but she hadn't realized that they were already being ambushed. When she finally understood that there was an odd silence surrounding her, she turned around and when she saw the army of the dead crawling towards her, she got scared to death and immediately fell on the floor. Gautam and Elma were prepared to act immediately and that's what they did. Gautam ran in front of everyone to meet the army of the undead first and he shouted at Tail and Paul to follow him as they were his subordinates. The leading ghoul head was holding a club and Elma knew that it wasn't anything special and even if it was, it seemed that it wouldn't have made the difference at all. Our protagonist rallied the other adventurers and told them that they were actually the ones with bigger heads, meaning that they had brains they could use to outsmart the monsters, but the other adventurers were hesitant because they were so scared. Elma explained to them that even though the whites were really slow and you could see them coming from afar, they could surprise you with an attack and that could potentially be a fatal blow, so they needed to be very, very careful. Elma also added that he won't be able to stay with them as he would probably be battling the boss, but he understood that the reason why the adventurers were afraid was that they were fighting off demons for the very first time. Elma knew that without proper orders, the adventurers would be scattered all over the place and they would probably lose their life panicking, so he decided to lead them. He told them to split into three groups and told them that if they took care of each other's backs, they would survive. One of the adventurers listened carefully to what Elma was telling them, but he didn't notice that he was getting ambushed by a white and were it not for Elma who warned him he would be D.E.A.D. -E the adventurer turned his head in the very last moment and was able to get away with only a scratch over his right cheek and Elma jumped in between him and the white. And there was more to this white than it appeared initially because he could actually use a skill called parry which enabled them to block attacks with their swords and shields which made it easier for them to attack. Elma started attacking a larger group of whites so he could redirect their attention onto him himself and that took some time and effort. When he finally thought that he taunted enough whites, he quickly jumped back to create some distance between them, which would give him just enough time to take a defensive stance, which in the end activated his special skill that made the attacking whites feel like they had hit a concrete wall. The adventurers were completely baffled when they saw that Elma was able to defeat so many whites all by himself and Elma told them that they should immediately note notify each other if something bad was to happen. As Elma was battling and killing off the whites all by himself, the adventurers were completely shocked by the sight of that and they couldn't believe that someone who was a heavy knight was able to fight off so many whites all on his own. From all the battling, Elma had leveled up and he was satisfied with the whole thing because he couldn't have dreamed of things going better for him and the sheer number of monsters was more than efficient for his level. He was now level 16 and all of his stats went up and he even got another title, 
the unshakable adventurer of the class and he was rather satisfied with his progress. The adventurers were happy that they had someone like Elmo on their side, but seeing him, a heavy knight, fighting so proficiently made them feel more uneasy than battling off the whites themselves. The fight continued and even the adventurers were giving it their all and after some time the fight has come to an end. One of the adventurers asked Elma whether or not they should join up with Mr. Gautem and Elma explained how the ghoul head was actually on a much higher level and it would be best if Gautem took care of it all by himself. And in the meantime, Gautem was having a fierce battle with the leader of the undead horde. The ghoul head was swinging his club and Gautem was able to dodge without much effort and he immediately went on the counter attack and slashed the ghoul head across the face with his axe. The ghoul head let out a terrifying scream and Gautam was too focused on his opponent that he had lost the sense for his immediate environment and he was caught by a couple of whites. Gautam was furious and he shook the whites off of himself and he yelled at his subordinates pole and tail and told them to attract more whites onto them so he could freely fight the leader of the horde one on one. He told them that they won't be promoted if they kept slacking. Tail was paralyzed with fear and while she was trying to act tough, Gautem was attacked by the ghoul head and he was almost hit because he was too busy with looking at his cowardly subordinates. Gautem somehow managed to dodge the attack and he jumped in the air and slashed the ghoul head across his face once again. The blow was so hard that it sent the ghoul head flying into a pile of tombstones. Elma was running towards Gautem to help him and he thought to himself that Gautem was doing a good job because one more blow would finish off the ghoul head. Gautem was about to finish the ghoul head but some whites had gotten in his way and they slowed him down and in the meantime the leader of the undead horde grabbed one of his white soldiers and straight up ate him. Yummy yummy in my tummy! The ghoul head did that because it recovered his health points but there was something that just felt wrong. Elma first thought that the ghoul head was a corpse eater that just ate his soldiers for recovery but something else was actually happening. Normally the corpse eaters only eat one white and they replenish their strength but this one was eating a whole bunch of them and after it finally had enough it shouted out material. Elma knew that that wasn't a good sign and when Gautem finally shook off the whites he wanted to finish the fight with the ghoul head once and for all and he ran towards the monster. Elma shouted to Gautem that he should immediately get back because something bad was about to happen but Elma didn't know whether or not Gautem heard him. The ghoul head's body completely transformed and it looked both scarier and stronger than just a couple of moments before. The ghoul head had evolved right in front of their eyes into a mad head and by eating all of those whites it raised its level from 33 to 40 which made it much much stronger. If you don't know how strong it is actually is it's almost 30% strength increase so that's pretty considerable amount of strength increase. Now Elma knew that now they were in big trouble and Gautem couldn't even understand what had happened. Evolution was something that happened very rarely and it only occurred when a monster was cornered and it had no other choice to escape danger but to try and evolve. That information wasn't really known in that world and Elma simply blamed it on their bad luck. As Gautem was standing close to the mad head, Elma shouted at him to make some distance between himself and the leader of the horde. But it was already too late as the monster had used his intimidating shout to send Gautem in a daze and Elma now had to react. He told Tail and Paul to somehow distract the mad head and direct its attention away from Gautem but Tail was too afraid and she couldn't move at all. Elma said that if Gautem gets killed, they were all as good as dead anyways. And just as he finished talking to Tail, Gautem got hit by the mad head and he started coughing up blood from the impact that sent him flying. The hit he suffered applied a paralyzing toxin to his body, but the mad head wasn't going to stop there. It reached out with his hand to take Gautem's paralyzed body, but Elma jumped in front of it and defended Gautem. Elma barely managed to hold off the attack because the 
monster was way stronger than him, but somehow he remained on his two feet. Elma told Tail that he would keep the mad head busy and that in the meantime she should try to use heal and paralysis heal on Gautam to try and make him fit for another round. Tail was still completely terrified, but she somehow shouted back that she could only use the basic heal spell and Elma said that that would do, but they needed to get Gautam out of there quickly. Elma knew that the Mad Head's special skill of the Paralyzing Toxin normally lasted for 3 minutes and then it wore off on its own and if he could somehow manage to last 3 minutes fighting off a monster that was 24 levels above him that would give Tail enough time to try and heal Gautem's wounds. But with all that in mind, fighting the monsters while playing the game wasn't even comparable to the thrill you get when you fought them in real life and Elma was now completely aware of the fact that though those two things were totally different. The Mad Head's health points were completely replenished, but Elma wasn't going to back down. He gripped his sword more tightly and he was determined to last until Gautam was able to return back to the fight. The other adventurers were also terrified, but while some of them couldn't believe that Elma was really going to try to fight off such a strong monster, the others were urging everybody else to run away as they were all about to be killed when Elma dies. To the mad head. Elma took everything into account, his level was 16 and his opponent's level was 40. He knew very well that if he was to make even the smallest of mistakes, he would be killed on the spot. And with that said, the mad head started his attack. It raised its fist and was about to strike Elma with full force. Even though Elma tried to parry the attack, the impact was so strong that he couldn't hold on and he was sent flying across the graveyard. Elma was hit pretty badly and he thought to himself how he tried his best to avoid getting into such situations where he needed to risk his life to get some great rewards. But there he was and there was nothing he could do about it now. After all, he was feeling the adrenaline pump through his veins and he was completely fired up from the fight. Some of the adventurers decided to stay as they were really interested in the outcome of the fight. One of them couldn't believe how well Elma was doing against the monster that had defeated Gautem just a couple of moments ago and the other told him that if he took a closer look, he would see that Elma was also having a tough time. And even though that was true and Elma was all bruised up and bleeding, his facial expression showed that he was determined to fight off the monster until Gautam came back or even to defeat the Mad Head all by himself if he could do it. But there was no time for chit chat as the Mad Head continued with his attacks on Elma and Elma managed to dodge but he realized that he couldn't keep on running and dodging attacks like that because that was a guaranteed failure. He thought to himself that the only way to stay alive was if he started using some faint attacks and to do that he first had to spend some of his skill points on the beginner swordsmanship skill so he could unlock the direct slash skill. That particular skill was great for point blank range when you are eye to eye with your opponent and it could inflict great damage even if the opponent's defensive stats were off the charts. The Mad Head wasn't going to wait for Elma to get ready and its attacks were already on their way towards Elma's body. Elma used parry to deflect the Mad Head's fist and the impact sent him flying back but Elma got an idea. He switched the way he was holding his sword and immediately after that he stabbed his sword into the ground which he used as an anchor point to propel himself behind the mad head through the monster's legs. The mad head was left confused as it couldn't understand what had happened and how Elma was gone missing from his sight and Elma was happy that his strategy worked and now he had a chance to try out his direct slash skill as he was standing directly behind the monster. So our protagonist slashed the mad head's back and after the monster immediately felt a sharp pain, it turned around but Elma was quick to fall back and create some safe distance between the two of them. Elma explained how everyone thought that the direct slash skill was bad because it needed to be used when you were standing right next to your opponent and our protagonist said that it was a perfect skill for heavy knights because it greatly amped 
their attacking stats. However, even though that skill was great, it wasn't even nearly enough to take the Mad Hat down. All Elma managed to do was to enrage the monster even more and the Mad Hat let out a deafening shout. The Mad Hat started his attacks once again, but it seemed that Elma was able to dodge them more easily now and none of the monster's attacks made contact with his body. Elma proclaimed that its moves were becoming slower and they weren't as organized as before. That infuriated the monster even more, but our protagonist said that on purpose and he added that the real thing was just about to start. Elma said that he had done his job successfully and it was only then that the monster sensed something was wrong. But it was already too late for the Mad Head as Gautam was flying through the air and he was ready to kill the Mad Head with one strike from his battle axe. Gautam used his special skill called the Dragon Slayer and split open the Mad Head's brain with his battle axe and the pool of blood spawned around them from the dead Mad Head bread. Lead. I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> Anyways, Gautam kicked the corpse off of his battle axe and Elma's level went up from 16 all the way to 23 and he was so happy he was progressing really well. Gautam was really impressed by Elma for being able to fight for more than 3 minutes against the monster that nearly killed Gautam. Elma's feat was even greater because he was an F rank and Gautam was a D rank adventurer. But our protagonist was humble as always and he thanked Gautam for saving him and added that if it hadn't been for him he would have certainly died and Gautam didn't say anything for a moment. He went down on his knees and he asked Elma to forgive him for his arrogance. Gautam said how he was a lousy leader and he did a poor job of organizing the group and everything happened just as Elma had said it would and he was really sorry he didn't listen to his advice. Elma was really surprised by Gautam's words as he didn't expect that of him and Gautam had something else to say as well. He showed Elma the mana stone that the Mad Head had dropped and told him that it was his. Elma knew that the level 40 magic stone was worth quite a lot and he could really use that to improve his status but he asked Gautam whether that would be okay for him to take it. Gautam told him that it was perfectly fine because the Mad Head was defeated only thanks to Elma and that's why Gautam was going to let Elma reap the rewards basically. They noticed that the Mad Head also dropped an item and it was a shield with an Oni's head and Elma asked Gautam whether he wanted to keep it. Gautam said that he was a man of his word and he had already said that Elma was the one that deserved all the credit for defeating the Mad Head and they Therefore, everything that the monster dropped was his by default. But Gautam couldn't hide his interest and he asked Elma only to check the item status. Elma picked up the shield and saw that its estimated value was around 3 million gold coins and it had a special effect. The shield's name was the Shield of Madness, it boosted the user's defensive stats by 25 and it empowered any attack by 8 points after using the shield to block an incoming attack. Elma knew that this Rampart Return spell only worked if the enemies attacked his armor but he thought that the shield could help him be more versatile in his fighting style and he could easily block attacks that were of the same level. On top of that, the insane value of that rare item was also something to take into account. Gautam really seemed interested in that shield but when Elma turned around he pretended like he didn't care about it at all. There was one more thing that Elma wanted to ask Gautam and that was his promotion but before he could even ask the question Gautam was quick enough to give him an answer. He told Elma that he would tell the guild to promote him to a rank E adventurer and that made Elma really really happy. Gautam continued to tell Elma how the guild had asked him to keep a close eye on Elma to see whether or not he was really a cheater of some kind but Gautam said how that was completely unnecessary and that he would fight with anyone that would think otherwise. Tail thought that that was a great chance for her to ask Gautam about her promotion while he was in a good mood and she added how it was her heal spell that brought him back on his feet but Gautam was still kinda angry with her. He told her that she was the main reason that he needed to be healed in the first place and there was no way he could possibly ever give a promotion to someone like her because a lot more dangerous raids were on their list and Tail failed to show her sincerity on the very first and 
than the easiest one. Gauten finished his speech by telling Teo that she needed more battle experience and she also needed to become braver if she wanted to be in his party. Tail already knew all of this, but hearing it from Gautam made her feel down and she turned around and started to walk, but it seemed that she was sour and felt some type of hatred towards Elma, even though Elma said nothing that would potentially make her hostile towards him. Ah, women? They all made their way back to the Adventurer's Guild, and when they entered, Elma and Gautam immediately went to the receptionist to see their rewards. The receptionist was giving Elma his rewards, and there was a total of three of the rewards. The first one was 130k gold coins for a job well done, the second one was 200k for 10 white mana stones, and the last reward for Elma was whopping 600k for the Mad Head's mana stone. The whole guild couldn't believe what they just heard and Gautam laughed and said how Elma was able to collect more rewards than he was and Elma was very happy that he had participated in the raid. The receptionist was a bit skeptic and she asked Gautam whether or not Elma really defeated the level 40 mad head. The adventurers in the guild were suspecting that it wasn't possible that Elma, who was a heavy knight, could earn so much from a simple raid and they really thought that he was cheating in one way or the other. But those comments made Gautam really angry and he slammed his fist on the receptionist counter and told everyone that if they didn't believe Elma, that implied that they doubted his his own judgment and when he said that everyone in the guild stopped talking as they knew that Gautem was too strong to mess with and Elma was happy that Gautem stood up for him. No one had any other comments and Elma was normally promoted to a rank E adventurer. Elma exited the adventurer's guild now and while he was walking through the city streets he wondered what should be his next move. Being an E rank adventurer had opened some doors for him and he could now partake in dungeon raids on his own but but his fighting style greatly depended on his use of the Rampart Return skill and I still don't know how to pronounce it and that wasn't enough to successfully clear all the dungeons all by himself. He remembered one item that would change everything and the item's name was the skill book of the Smoldering Fang of Madness and it really looked impressive and it really had a name like a typical manga where you have like 10,000 words and sentences in the name. And that was the most important item, that book, for a heavy knight adventurer and Elma was determined to find it. Elma explained how the true potential of the heavy knight class was only visible when they max out their vow of the heavy armor and they are able to use the smoldering mad fang. When those things are found together in a heavy knight class adventurer, they stop being a defense specialist and they aren't an attack specialist as well. What the heavy knight ends up becoming is actually something way bigger and stronger the greatest human weapon that exists in the world. That's why the smoldering fang of madness was so important, but it was very rare and even though Elma searched the city streets and checked all sorts of shops and markets looking for it, he doubted that he would be able to find that item in the city shop. Elma went into a shop and asked the shopkeeper to sell him three healing potions and the receptionist stood up to fetch them for Elma and she came back holding three healing potions which were 72 2,000 gold coins in total. Elma thought to himself how the price was a bit expensive, but he really needed them so he ended up buying them anyway. But before he left he wanted to ask the shopkeeper something and she listened carefully to what he had to say. What Elma wanted to know was whether or not there was any place that sold skill books as he had searched the whole town looking for them and he couldn't find a single one. The shopkeeper seemed to pity Elma for not knowing anything and she guessed that it was his first year of being an adventurer. She told him that selling and buying skill books was banned for quite some time and it was only possible to use one if you find one in one of the raids or dungeons or something like that. All other skill books were bought by the guild and afterwards they were distributed between noble families and churches. Elma didn't know that and he was shocked with what the receptionist had just told him. He compared the state of the world to that of the game he used to play and it seemed that noble families had a lot more influence here. Elma couldn't have imagined something like that would ever be possible but he realized that all the skill books that the city of Rondelm had to offer were probably in the hands of the Advent family 
from which he was disowned. However, the shopkeeper saw that Elma wasn't very happy about that and she took a piece of paper and pen and she drew a map for him. Even though she shouldn't do such things, she felt like she needed to thank Elma for buying those three healing potions from her, which were hella expensive. Elma picked up the paper and he wasn't sure what the map represented and the shopkeeper told him that it was a map to a shop that had items that were taken away from dead adventurers. Elma couldn't understand how they were able to do that because he thought that they had to report all of their findings to the guild, but the shopkeeper explained that they were well aware of the existence of black markets and they let them operate because not all adventurers were able to afford stuff legally and it seemed like they had an agreement between them. The shopkeeper explained that all the dismantled items from dead adventurers weren't given back to their families and instead they were sold to anyone that had enough money to buy them and usually they ended up in the hands of nobles and the same was the case with skill books. She added how noble families collected skill books and they never even used them and Elmo was angry with the way the world operated and he thought to himself that he would probably already be in the possession of the smaller in Fang of Madness had he been back baptized as a sword saint. Before he left the shop, the shopkeeper told Elma to keep the place on the map a secret, and our protagonist told her that her secret was safe with him and he exited the shop. Elma immediately followed the map around the town and he entered a small shop in one of the back alleys. When he got in, he was met with an awful stench and the place was so dusty and it smelled pretty badly. Elma had to cover his mouth because the smell was so strong and he wondered whether he would be able to find any skill books in a place that was so run down. Elma took a look around the shop and he could see all sorts of things like swords, daggers, shields, boots and he finally saw some skill books and there was a total of five of them. But just as he was about to inspect them, the witch that ran the place told him that his armor was pretty weak and looking at him, she didn't think that he would be a good customer in her shop. The full name of the shop was the Shattered Grimoire Hall and its owner resembled the state the shop was in. She looked dirty and she wore ragged clothes. Elma told her that he had enough money to buy something and he asked the witch to show him her collection of skill books. The witch simply told him that he was more than welcome to take a look all by himself, the prices of her items wouldn't change if they were inspected. Our protagonist took the first book from the shelf that had five of them and he saw that it was the skill book of beginner's archery. Its market value was 2 million gold coins and he remembered how the value of that skill book in the game was only 500k gold coins and he was blown away with the price. Now, to make matters even worse, the witch told him that that same book was selling for 3 million gold coins in her shop and Elma was at a complete loss for words. The witch explained that the high price was reasonable because she had to cross a very dangerous bridge to acquire that skill book and she explained how she was putting her life in danger whenever she was trying to get some dismantled items, especially skill books. If anyone from the higher ups found out that she did that, she would have been shot dead. Elma thought to himself how even the beginner skill books were quite expensive and he thought that even if he sold the shield of madness that he acquired from the mad head, he would only be able to get that beginner skill book and he couldn't even fathom the thought of acquiring a rare skill book. Elma inspected the other skill books the witch had to offer and the ones on the table in front of him were the following books, uh, beginner archery, magic power up, jack in a box and elemental guard. They were all rare skill books, but Elma wasn't interested in any of them, and when he picked up the last skill book from the bookshelf, he was surprised. It was the skill book of Smoldering Fang of Madness, the only thing he was actually looking for. If he could buy the skill book from the witch, he could make his skill tree perfect and he would be very satisfied. The witch noticed that he was inspecting that particular book with some bliss in his eyes and when Elma asked her for the price, she told him that that particular skill book was 50 million gold coins. 
When Elma heard that, he almost passed out, but he realized that he couldn't do anything to change the witch's mind, so he just let out a deep sigh. He told the witch that she should hire some bodyguards to level up her security because she was selling such valuable items. The witch wasn't really worried nor concerned that she was going to be robbed because she was very comfortable with her own capabilities. She even said how she beat up five people like it was nothing. There was only one more thing that Elma could try and he asked the witch to keep that skill book reserved for him and he promised that he would most definitely gather the money she wanted for the skill book. The witch was cunning and she wanted to hear what Elma would do for her if she was to grant him his wish and Elma wasn't sure what to tell her. But the witch told him that she didn't have anything against him and that she would reserve the skill book for him and that drew a smile on Elma's face. However, the witch took a smoke from her pipe and she told Elma that she wanted an extra of 5 million gold coins. Elma felt disheartened and he knew that he couldn't change her terms and he realized that he would have to save up a lot of money if he wanted to buy this skill book. So Elma left the Shattered Grimoire Hole and he was thinking about all the ways he could collect 55 million gold coins. He had only the previous raid to compare his earnings and with that in mind he would need around 60 of such raids to collect all that money. He thought how adventurers that were on the top of the rankings and all the shop owners had some twisted thoughts about money. The only classes that might be interested in the smoldering fang of madness skill book were heavy knights and berserkers and Elma was aware of the fact that rare skill books were extremely expensive and therefore he needed to make up a plan that would be the most efficient for him. The first thing that came to his mind was that he should collect rare items that were dropped in dungeons, but that plan had a hole, which was that heavy knights didn't have strong attacking stats and they rarely killed any monsters. The second plan was that Elma would farm smaller and less dangerous mobs to collect the money, but that would take forever. The third plan he came up with was that he could learn other skills by buying other skill books, but that wasn't so appealing because he didn't want to pointlessly spend skill points on skill trees that would literally become useless to him when he bought the Smoldering Fang of Madness. Those were all the things that came to his mind which he could do by himself and he knew he needed to consider other options. Considering the fact that Elmo became quite famous in the Adventurers Guild from the last raid, he thought that he might try and find some adventurers to group up with them. That seemed like a good option and Elma started thinking in that direction and while he was immersed in his thoughts, a group of adventurers was on their way towards the adventurers guild and they happened to pass right by Elma. They were talking about a rare item that they were lucky to acquire from their most recent raid and the item they were talking about was Bloodstained Sword. The value of that item was 2 million gold coins and that caught Elma's attention. One of them was particularly happy and her name was Lucy. L-U-C-E. -E. I don't know, man. These names are so difficult to pronounce. Anyways, we're gonna call her Lucy and she was a clown. What was so interesting about her was that she kept saying how it was because of her special skill that they found the rare item and it was dropped in the first place because of her skill. The rest of the party didn't say anything back to Lucy and Elma noticed that they were a party of three. A uh, swordsman, a bandit and Lucy the jester. The swordsman seemed to be the leader of the party and he doubted that the reason why the bloodstained sword was dropped because of her special skill and Lucy told them that it really was because of her and she promised that she would show her abilities true potential the next time they enter a dungeon. The leader of the party turned around and he told Lucy that she was the most useless member of their party and added how she probably won't get a penny from the reward of the rare item and Lucy said how she would be satisfied with only 100k gold coins. The swordsman told Lucy that her taunting some monsters wasn't enough and that they didn't really have much benefits from having her around and he once again told her that she was useless. That made Lucy angry and she decided to stand up for herself so she told the leader whose name was Klein that she was only able to take some aggro from the monsters and that she didn't have any attack skills because he told her which skills she should spend her skill points on and Lucy thought that Klein was being completely unfair because she only ever did what he told her to do in the first place. Those words agitated Klein very much and he walked closer to Lucy to tell her that she was being delusional. He told her that he was only giving 
giving her advice and that she shouldn't have listened to him if she knew better and that she was the one to blame in the end. Elma watched all of that from the side and he realized that they were fighting over skill points allocation and the reward shares. Our protagonist was aware of the fact that such fights were rather common in the magic world and they mainly arose from the fact that someone tried to spend their skill points on certain skills that later on end up being rather useless to other members in the party and that's probably what had happened with this party as well. But their discussion wasn't over and Klein took out a handful of gold coins which was equal to 100k and he threw them on the ground in front of Lucy. He told her to pick up the coins and that she was no longer a member of their party. He added how he had accepted her into his party when she didn't have any skills and he was disappointed that she was asking for a share. Klein asked the other party member, the bandit named Ressi, about her opinion and she shared his thoughts. Ressi said how she wasn't happy that she had to divide the prize money with Lucy and Lucy tried to explain that that wasn't her intention and that she only wanted to be acknowledged and she bowed her head down and begged Clyde and Ressi wait it's Reese not Ressi I'm dumb and Reese to forgive her however Klein told her that it was too late for her to be sorry and they didn't want anything else to do with her and they wished her luck in wherever she ended up being afterwards Klein and Reese turned around the corner and Lucy was left on the streets all by herself she's about to become a protagonist of a manga all by herself being abandoned by her party and stuff now Elma knew that most parties broke up because of financial troubles and he was sorry that Lucy's skill tree wasn't as useful to other party members. Elm explained how the leveling system was made so the adventurers had to think about which skills they wanted to upgrade and they had to hunt monsters that were around their level. The problem was if the adventurers allocated their skill points into some useless skills and because of that they experienced troubles and difficulties when fighting monsters of the same level. Elma thought to himself that Lucy being a jester she probably probably had spent her skill points into supporting skills and it was then that Elma remembered what Klein said about the bloodstained sword. Elma thought to himself that Lucy might have a skill that was really special and if that was the case he couldn't understand Klein's decision to kick her out of his party. Elma knew he needed to check that for himself and he stood up and ran towards Lucy who was still crying on the same spot. Lucy was shouting how she was being selfish and how she would never ask for more money but she felt someone grab her hand just then and when she turned around Elma shouted that she should join his party and the sight of Elma scared Lucy to death. As everything happened so quickly, Klein and Reese were just a couple of meters away from Elma and Lucy and Elma begged Lucy to join his party and he promised her that she wouldn't regret it if she accepted his invitation. Elma was so desperate to get Lucy to join his party that he even said that they would split the rewards 80 to 20, meaning that Lucy would get 80% of them and he would be satisfied with just 20%. Lucy asked Elma to calm down and she begged him to let go of her hand. Our protagonist apologized and he let go of Lucy's hand but Klein heard all that he said and he turned around to see who was interested in his ex-party member. Elma introduced himself and he explained how he saw that Lucy was kicked out and that he wanted her in his party and Klein asked Elma whether he was in his right state of mind when he made that decision and he told him that Lucy was so useless that she couldn't even level up properly on her own. Elma said how that wouldn't be a problem to him and Klein said that he would give Lucy over to him if he wanted to have her in his party so much. Elma said that he didn't need anyone's permission, especially his and that rubbed Clyde the wrong way. Clyde decided to walk up to Elma while Lucy was losing her mind in the middle. Clyde asked Elma what level he was and whether he had any other party members. And Elma replied that he was a solo adventurer and that he was an E-rank adventurer, 23rd level heavy knight. Klein told him that being level 23, he should know more than enough that Lucy, who was level 13, wasn't that useful, especially to a heavy knight. And Lucy told Elma that he shouldn't feel 
feel bad to reject her, but Elma proclaimed that he didn't care about her level. Then Reese joined in the discussion and she told Klein that it was a bit weird that a level 23 knight so badly tried to get Lucy to his party and she started questioning that her skill was really special. That was something Elma had feared and he thought to himself that he had been way too straightforward with his invitation, but that didn't seem to be a problem. Clyde was way too arrogant and ignorant to even think about what Jesse just said and he told her that it would be best if Elma took Lucy and they left without causing a big scene. Reese wasn't happy with Klein's decision, but the way Klein saw the situation was there was no way that a level 23 knight was a solo adventurer. He thought that Elma was either kicked out from a party just like Lucy, or the only other explanation he could come up with was that Elma enjoyed hitting on girls and he liked Lucy. Klein also told Reese that it would hurt their reputation if other adventurers found out that they kicked out Lucy for their own mistake of allocating her skill points wrongly, and Reese had to agree with him on that. That's why Klein sheeted back his sword and told Elma that he could take Lucy and that that wouldn't be a problem at all. Elma didn't say a thing. But he was annoyed with Klein because he was a slimy individual and Lucy bowed to Elma and told him that she would accept his offer and that she would rely on him to take good care of her. Elma was also happy to acquire his first ever party member and Klein congratulated them on forming their own party and he told Lucy that up until then she never had any money to buy herself a weapon and by kicking the gold coins on the ground, Klein told her that she should consider those 100k coins as a party gift. Lucy didn't know what to say and she thanked Klein, but Elma told her to leave the coins on the ground and he shouted out to Klein that he should be the one to pick those coins from the ground because he was the one who threw them in the first place. I mean bros, when I'm playing video games, no matter how much gold coins I have, if there are gold coins on the ground, if I have let's say 100k coins in my inventory and there's like 20 on the ground and I have to pick each one of them one by one, you bet I'm gonna do it. I'm just too greedy in video games. Just recently, I was playing Baldur's Gate 3 and I had like 24k gold and there's like maybe 150 gold coins lying on the ground but I would have to spend like 2 or 3 minutes to pick all of them up. Guess, guess what your bro did? Damn straight I picked all the gold coins up. Are you the same when playing video games? For some reason, I'm just way too greedy. Maybe this is like completionist mentality when I'm playing video games. I don't know. Are you the same? Tell me down in the comments below. Let's go back to the story. After he told this to Klein, Elma told Lucy to leave the money because he didn't want to feel indebted to people like Klein, even if it meant a single gold coin. Klein shouted back that both of them would end up being even more useless together because Elma was a heavy knight, but Elma didn't turn around anymore. Reese wanted to collect the money, she was acting like me, but Klein didn't let her because he wanted it all for himself, he's acting like me even more, so he ended up picking it after all. Elma took Lucy to a local tavern and Lucy thanked him for inviting her to his party. Lucy was honest and she told Elma that she really was weak, but Elma told her not to think about such things too much and that if she fought monsters that her skill tree had advantages against, she would be okay. However, Lucy had one more question she wanted to ask Elma and she wanted to know whether he invited her to his party because he fell in love with her and that caught Elma off guard. Lucy went on with her story and she said how that was the only explanation she could think of, but even though Elma was a great guy himself, she thought that they should start their relationship as just friends. Oh my god, no, bro. Don't get friend zoned without even trying to make her your girlfriend. No! Elma couldn't believe what he was hearing and to dismantle her doubts, he asked her about her skill tree and whether she had the great fortune skill unlocked. Elma explained that dungeons in the magic world were actually nightmares from a deity called Alzeros. Elma continued by saying how Elzaros created a couple of servants for himself, but after he had gone crazy, those servants he created had sealed him off. But as he had gone crazy, he couldn't control his powers and the nightmares he had been 
experiencing gave birth to monsters that opened up portals to the real world and those were the dungeons that Elma talked about and they were also known as dream holes. I mean finally some manga explains how these dungeons appear in the world. Now Lucy showed Elma her status menu and she told him that she had only one skill that was effective and that was the dice thrust skill and that skill had a catch as well. It only worked when Lucy rolled a 6 on her die. Lucy showed Elma her skill tree and she would have liked it more if she invested some of her skill points into other two skill trees she had, the fool's acrobatics and attack power up. Elma told Lucy that her skill tree was fine as it was and he added how he needed her abilities which surprised Lucy very much and she thought that Elma was expressing his feelings towards her and she thought that he should be more bold when saying stuff like that but Elma meant something completely else. He did repeat his statement boldly but what he said completely caught Lucy off guard. Elma said that they were about to go on an expedition on which they would earn around 30 million gold coins and Lucy's level was going to jump all the way to 30. With that being said, the two of them teleported inside of a dungeon that looked like a mansion in which level 50 monsters were known to appear, which only meant that the adventurer should be around level 50 as well. That was the recommendation on the dungeon's entrance. Elma said how he knew how those monsters behaved and they would be able to easily defeat them if Elma taunted them and if Lucy could kill them off with her knife and Elma told her that they would spend quite some time farming gold coins on the first floor. Elma had bought Lucy a knife called the Iron Piercer and its price was 55k gold coins. Lucy had never had anything expensive as her new weapon before in her life and because of that she was grateful to Elma and she was motivated and determined to make their dungeon farming a successful expedition. Lucy said that she would take good care of her new weapon and Elma Elma told her that he would take good care of her and that she needn't worry. With that being said, they came across their first monster, a level 20 patchwork bear. Lucy thought that the monster looked cute, but when she saw its level, she changed her opinion instantly. Elma told her that even if she somehow managed to get hit, the attack wouldn't kill her immediately, but she needed to take care as those attacks had a chance to trigger a critical strike, which would indeed end up killing her. But Elma also added that the monster's movement could be completely stopped if it was attacked while it was in the middle of its attack and Lucy was surprised with how much Elma knew about patchwork bears. Elma told Lucy that he would take the monster head on and she should try to kill it from behind and once their strategy was planned out the fight started. Elma started things off with the shadow stomp skill which he had learned after he defeated the mad head and that skill allowed him to restrict the monster's movement by stomping onto its shadow. Wow, that's actually pretty cool. He warned Lucy that even though this skill worked really well, she should still be careful as those monsters could always do something unpredictable. Like for example, stuff falling behind me. <laughs> Professional recap once again. Lucy listened to what Elma was saying, but she couldn't sense any danger from the monster whatsoever. And just as she said that, the monster started transforming. The monster's stomach had previously been stitched up, but now it displayed a large mouth with sharp fangs and its shadow changed as well. So the bear wasn't restricted anymore and it immediately started running at Elma. Elma prepared himself and without much effort, he was able to to pin the patchwork bear onto the ground. Lucy was surprised with Elma's skill and Elma was happy that he had had his shield of madness with him as it made everything a lot easier. He told Lucy to kill the monster off and Lucy got on its back and started slashing away. It took her a while but in the end she was finally able to kill the monster and Elma tried asking her how many levels had she earned but Lucy was shocked with something else. She was going through the monster's corpse and she was sad she couldn't find any drops. That made her think that Elma was going to kick her out of his party as well but Elma calmly told her that that monster in particular was just for leveling up and that they would encounter many more so there was a chance for good loot to be dropped still. And not long after, another patchwork bear arrived and they continued with the same strategy. 
after they killed off the second monster, Lucy was happy that the monster had dropped not one, but actually two items. The item in question was a bear shield, which market price was around 200k gold coins, and Lucy was really happy that her skill had worked, and Elmo was also surprised to see one item drop twice from the same monster, because he never remembered such things happening in the game. But when Elmo realized that Lucy's base luck stat was raised by 500% due to her beckon in Kitty skill, he realized that such things were indeed possible after all. But Elmo was still surprised Clayton didn't notice that before, but he explained that with the fact the whole magic world was filled with the monsters that gave good loot on its own. Lucy kept asking Elmo whether or not she was useful to him and Elmo said that he was really happy and he was grateful to her for deciding to join him. Lucy was happy to hear that and she told Elmo that she would acquire 10 bear shields if he liked them that much, but Elmo told her that that won't be necessary and he asked her to check her level. Lucy saw that her level was now 20 and she was surprised with how fast she was progressing and Elma proclaimed how now they would switch their focus onto another monster. The monster he was talking about was the golden frog. That monster was just a different kind of the Lana frogs that Elma defeated when he first became an adventurer and he thought about all the possible places where golden Lana spawned and he thought that the best one was inside the dungeon they were already farming in. Golden Lanas looked like normal frogs but their skin was golden like the name suggests, like a shiny Pokemon. However, that wasn't their best trait. They were special because they dropped very rare items and even though their levels were high, their attack stats were quite low so they were great for farming loads of experience points and valuable items. Because of all those things these monsters were dubbed loot boxes by the players of Magic World and they even said that hunting those monsters was the most fun thing anyone could do in the game. The reason why Elma chose that particular dungeon to try and farm golden lanas was that their spawn rates were the highest in the middle parts of that very dungeon. Lucy added how she heard about those monsters and she even heard some adventurers say that if you managed to kill one you would be set for the rest of your life. That's how valuable they were and Elma was surprised that Lucy had already known about golden lanas which made their job much easier. But Lucy told Elma that she heard another thing about them and that was that those monsters never showed any signs of taking damage and a lot of people ended up chasing the golden lanas only to end up surrounded by a large group of other monsters. And Lucy was certain that a lot of adventurers had gotten themselves killed that way and Elma had to take that in consideration as well before they proceeded to hunt for the golden frogs. There was one particular problem with Elma's plan and that was that golden lanas had high speed and defensive stat and to top it all off they were immune to debuffs and hearing that made Lucy desperate. Elma told Lucy that the weapon he got her wouldn't be effective against golden lanas and Lucy didn't think she could even catch up to one if they managed to find it somehow. But Elma confirmed her doubts and he told her that those frogs had 67 points in speed and 200 in defense which made Iron Piercer's 15% penetration bonus seem like nothing, like she's using a fork. Elma also said that golden lanas were two times faster than jesters and even three times faster than a heavy knight and their defense was so great that even if he managed to use his rampart return to its fullest capacity, he would only inflict around one damage to the monster. By the way, quick digression, a lot of you bros told me in the comments on the previous videos how to properly pronounce this word rampart return and thank you so much for that but there was one comment in particular that made me learn how to pronounce it the Best. He told me Rampart rhymes with fart. I'm gonna for I'm gonna never forget this now. <laughs> now Lucy started getting disheartened and she thought that they would never catch a golden lana like that, but Elma told her that she shouldn't worry and that every monster could be defeated if you had enough information about it, and Elma told her that he had a perfect plan. But Lucy was surprised with Elma's enthusiasm as she had never heard of such thing as a heavy knight having a special skill that could catch and kill a golden lana, but Elma was never talking about himself. He told Lucy that he was putting putting all of his trust into her, which left her completely speechless. Elma explained that she had 8 unused skill points from all the leveling and Elma told her that if she were to spend all of them on the fool's acrobatic skill tree, she should unlock 2 special skills that would be their best chance in hunting down a golden lana. Lucy wasn't really confident in her abilities, but she would listen to Elma nonetheless. 
However, Elma noticed a presence behind them and when he turned around, he was attacked by a monster called a toy box but Elma was able to block its attack with his shield and he threw it back. Elma told Lucy that the best thing they could do was to run but Lucy thought that they could kill the monster without any problems but Elma explained that they didn't need to as that would only bring about other monsters and that's not what they were after. Lucy wasn't really sure that focusing on Golden Lannis would be their best option because she thought that they could do some more leveling up but Elma explained that as they were right now their conditions were almost ideal for hunting down Golden Lannis and he thought that if they kept looking looking for them by Elma's calculations, they should be able to find two by the end of the day and that only said about the monster's rarity. Elma told Lucy that no matter how maxed out her great fortune skill was, that wasn't going to increase their chances of finding a golden Lena and if Lucy was ever to feel tired or anything like that, Elma told her to notify him about it. Lucy told him that she was determined and that she would listen to all of his orders and just when she finished saying that, she noticed something down the hall. They turned around and they could see something small jumping around and they could hear rabbit rabbit sound that frogs made. It was indeed a golden Lena and they were surprised to have him found one so fast. The monster was level 40 and it was indeed a golden Lena and Lucy started getting all fired up. Elma told her to calm down because they would need to be as cool headed as possible and he asked her if she had used the skill points like he had told her and Lucy said that she unlocked the skills he had been telling her about and Elma said that they could try and execute their strategy. Elma said that he would wait for the monster to come to him and the rest was up to Lucy. Nothing seemed to happen and Elma noticed that Lucy was preparing herself to go after the golden Lena. He encouraged her and told her that it wouldn't be a big deal if she failed. Lucy took a deep breath and she was finally ready so she started running down the hall. Now Golden Lannis had great detection skill and they could detect anyone in a radius of 4 meters and if anyone crossed into that radius, the frog started running. What made it even trickier was that the hallways in the dungeon were exactly 4 meters wide and that made it almost impossible to sneak up on a Golden Lana. However, that was only the width and the ceiling was a bit higher and one of the skills that Lucy unlocked was called acrobatic steps which made her jump very high and enabled her to walk on the ceiling for a short period of time which was perfect for their plan. When Lucy jumped in front of the golden Lana, the monster was so scared that its eyes almost popped out. It tried to run past Lucy but Lucy was ready to use the second skill she had unlocked which was called Doppel Illusion which made three totally identical copies of her. That was their plan to use those illusions and they would completely block off the hallway and the golden Lena was forced to run in the other direction towards Elma. What made that skill perfect was the fact that golden Lanas were completely immune to crowd control effects but they were also stupid monsters and they couldn't tell an illusion from an actual adventurer. The only other weakness that a golden Lena had was that it wasn't immune to Elma's shadow stomp. Everything was now on Elma and his ability to act accordingly. Now his job wasn't easy at all because the Golden Lana was 3 times faster than him and its shadow was at best around 50 centimeters large so Elma had to be extra careful not to screw things up and I'm sorry I don't know American made up metric system. <laughs> now he bought some holy magic stones which were able to release a healing light but they weren't used as much because they didn't heal a lot of health points. But the healing part wasn't the reason why Elma bought the stones he was more interested in the light aspect of it and Elma threw the stone into the air which cast a blinding light which ended up enlarging the golden Lana's shadow which made it easier for Elma to successfully land his shadow stomp and that's exactly what he did. He stomped on the frog's enlarged shadow and thus trapped it. The golden Lana was trapped and Lucy was really happy that Elma was able to execute his plan. Lucy knew that the hardest part of the job was done but she didn't know how Elma planned on killing the monster. And while the Golden Lana was trying to break away from Elma's shadow stomp, Elma explained to Lucy that the only thing that could kill the Golden Lana was a critical strike. Critical strikes were hard to hit, but they did 15 more damage with a bonus piercing effect of 50% of the enemy's defense. Lucy thought that that plan was great, and she cheered Elma on, thinking how it would be him that was going to crit the Golden Lana. However, 
Elma explained that even if he managed to land a critical strike, his attacks wouldn't do much damage, so that left them with the only other option they had and Elma told Lucy in the beginning that he needed her. Lucy was really surprised, but Elma continued to tell her how landing a critical strike depended on the user's skill and on luck as well, and even if that wasn't the case, Elma was too far away from the golden Lena to reach it, and if he moved, the monster would flee as soon as Elma's foot was off of its shadow. Now Lucy understood that, but she wasn't confident in her abilities as she had never landed a critical strike and she didn't think she could do it. But Elma reminded her that she had a special skill which was the first thing she showed him when they formed a party and that was her dice thrust skill. Lucy knew about it but she didn't feel too happy about her skill because Klein and Reese made fun of her in the past because of it. But Lucy thought about it for some time and she understood what Elma wanted to tell her. If she rolled a 6 with her die, she would be rewarded with a guaranteed critical hit and that was exactly what they needed in that situation and on top of that, she had countless tries as the frog was basically trapped forever as long as our protagonist's foot was on its shadow and it couldn't move at all. So if Lucy was to roll 6 with her dice thrust skill, her attacking power would rise all the way up to 195 which on itself still wasn't enough to kill the golden Lana but Lucy also had 15% piercing bonus from her iron piercer and a 50% piercing bonus from the critical strike as well which would be more than enough to kill the monster in one hit. Lucy still had some doubts but Elma told her that no skill was useless and that all of them were ideal for certain situations and her skill was perfect for this kind of job. Elma told Lucy not to think too much about what others thought of her, especially if those people were like Klein and Elma once again told Lucy that he really needed her strength and that there was no chance he could ever kill a golden Lana on his own. Lucy grabbed her iron piercer and she walked closer to the golden Lana. She was now determined to succeed because she felt like Elma truly believed in her. Lucy used her dice thrust and on her first attempt she rolled a 5 and it felt like the monster didn't feel her attack at all. However, on her second attempt, Lucy rolled a 6 with her skill and when she pierced the golden Lena, its golden skin started to break and with one last croak, the monster dropped dead on the floor. Lucy couldn't believe that she had actually done it and both of them leveled up. Lucy was now level 27 and Elma was level 30, but even though Golden Lanas gave large amounts of experience points, that wasn't what they were looking for. Now, their main features were their special drops, but their drop rate was only 50%. I mean, this isn't only if you've played other MMORPG games, but if it takes this much difficulty to kill the monster, 50% is quite low. <laughs> However, the monster had indeed dropped something and it was the Shining Lena's decorative sword which was priced around 17 million gold coins on the market and seeing that made Lucy and Elma both really really happy. Lucy was delighted that they had gotten a drop on their first try and that it was worth what she thought 1.7 million gold coins and Elma noticed that she wasn't really aware of the sword's actual price because she was too caught up in the moment. Elma told her to carefully count the digits and when Lucy took a better look she almost passed out when she realized it was actually 17 million instead of 1.7 and it took her some time to calm down and they even said to take a rest. Lucy was still under the impression of the sword's price and she thought that if people knew what they had in their inventory, everyone would try to kill them and she suggested that the two of them run away to a secluded cabin in the country and to spend their lives together. Oh I see, so now that Elma's worth 17 million, he's not in the friend zone anymore. Okay bros, that's a recipe for all of you who are stuck in the friend zone, how to get out. Only earn 17 million dollars and you're out of there. Now Elma told her that she was right about the fact that they would need to leave, but what Elma meant had nothing to do with Lucy's daydreams of the two of them running away and spending their entire lives hiding. What Elma meant was that they were about to go after another golden Lena before the sun set and Lucy couldn't believe what she was hearing. After three hours of roaming through the dungeon, they finally found 
found another golden Lena and their strategy was the same. However, this time it took quite a few strikes to land a critical one, but she did manage to do so in the end. The second golden Lena was finally killed and that one as well dropped another shining sword and Elmo was really happy with that. He tried to share his enthusiasm with Lucy, but she almost lost her consciousness. She couldn't stand upright normally because she realized that they had earned around 34 million gold coins in just a couple of hours and Elma had to catch her from collapsing on the ground. Lucy was really blown away with the fact that they managed to gather that much money and Elma reminded her that now they needed to think about which skill tree they needed to upgrade but Lucy still couldn't believe that she also raised her levels in such a short time. While they were walking towards the exit, Lucy stopped because she had heard something. Elma noticed that she stopped walking and when he asked her whether something was wrong, she told him that she had heard a baby's cry. Elma stopped to hear it for himself and he couldn't believe it. He knew that something called a wandering lord was coming their way. Every dungeon had something called a dream lord and those were boss monsters of each and every dungeon and normally dream lords would stay asleep in their rooms but sometimes for some unknown reason they could wake up and start roaming the dungeon and then they were called wandering lords. Lucy had heard of them and she knew that their level was 50 which was way higher than Elma's and hers and she was terrified of the fact that they might encounter it. Elma told her that everything was fine as long as they went in the opposite way of the way from which the cry was coming from and that was a very good and very simple plan but things wouldn't be that easy. Alongside the baby cry they heard someone screaming for help and they couldn't act like nothing happened. Two adventurers came walking towards them and they said how they thought that they were prepared to clear the dungeon but they got ahead of themselves and encountered a monster that was way stronger than the both of them. Elma knew the gravity of the situation and he knew that if they died they wouldn't simply respawn. It would be the end for them so he knew that they couldn't just leave them there to die. Elma shouted to Lucy to take care of the two adventurers and he would stay behind to hold off the monster. Lucy listened to his orders but she was worried that a wandering lord would be too much even for him but Elma assured her that he knew what monster was coming at him and he thought that if all he needed was to buy them time so they could escape he would certainly succeed. In the end, that's what heavy knights were best at. They were the best at drawing monsters attention towards them. And just as Elma finished with his speech, the monster that was after these two adventurers finally caught up with him. Elma knew the monster really well and it wielded a sword and its name was Tin Knight. Elma told Lucy that they should start going immediately as he knew that it would be easier if he didn't have to think about them when he fought the monster. The good news was that the Tin Knight wasn't the wandering lord they were talking about and its level was 40 and on top of all that it was missing half of his health points. Lucy thought that if they fought together they could defeat the monster but Elma told her that thinking about that was futile because that wasn't the wandering lord. Elma explained how the Tin Knight was just like a part of the stronger monster, something like its limb and that the main body was actually way stronger and on top of everything else it was going to arrive very soon. Just as Elma finished saying that, two more Teen Knights arrived and those two seemed to have full HP. Elma told Lucy that he would be right after them but Lucy couldn't leave him alone because she thought that he would die if he fought them all by himself and Elma knew he had to explain it to Lucy in the simplest way that existed. Elma told her that he couldn't focus on fighting the Teen Knights if he had to constantly pay attention to where she and the other two adventurers were. Lucy finally understood what Elma was saying and she apologized for being stubborn. Lucy wished Elma good luck and started running away towards the exit. Our protagonist knew that right now he was up against three level 40 monsters and if it was only them he could have asked Lucy to fight with him but Elma knew that another monster was coming and a wandering lord at that. Elma told Lucy that he would be right behind them but he knew that he was lying when he said that and that there wasn't a chance he a heavy knight would be able to run from a lord of dreams. It might have been a different situation if he was only up against the thin knights 
but the way things were, it seemed impossible. The Lord of Dreams finally showed up and Elma knew he would have to try and defeat it because that was his only option, he has no other options. That particular Lord of Dreams was called Embryo and it looked like a flying baby with a giant eye on the top of its head. For a level 50 monster, Elma thought that Embryo wasn't really that strong even if it was the boss of the dungeon. But there was another problem, the embryo had incredibly high defensive stat and the only weak spot it had was the giant eye on the top of its head but only long range attacks would work against it. But Elma wasn't going to give up as long as there was even the slightest chance he could win and he knew that every monster was killable if he knew about its weak spot. Elma used of his skill points on the vow of the heavy armor skill tree and he unlocked a skill called shield bash and with that he was ready to fight the thin knights. He immediately used his newly acquired skill and he bashed one of the Teen Knights and sent him flying straight into a wall. Elma knew that he could fight against them if he broke their formation and that's what his new skill enabled him. The other Teen Knights weren't going to stand around looking at Elma and they started attacking him as well but Elma used parry to deflect their attacks and he was able to disarm one of them. While he was busy fighting against the two Teen Knights, Embryo was looking for a chance to attack Elma but Elma was aware of the fact that it had two spells, Sylph Cutter and Thunderstorm, which it couldn't use without hitting the Teen Knights as well, so that's why it wasn't attacking our protagonist. Elma knew that he would be safe from Embryo's attacks as long as he was fighting the Teen Knights and he used his disarm skill once again around 50 seconds and it seemed that it lowered the Teen Knights attacking stats which meant that he had met the conditions for his Rampart return skill and Elma knew that he only needed to stand still for it to activate. The very instance the Teen Knight attacked him, it was killed and Elma knew that his job was about to become way more difficult actually. We with one Teen Knight defeated, Elma thought that he would now have to deal with the other two but there was something he forgot. Embryo used one of his skills called Repair and its magic revived the defeated Teen Knights, its limbs started to reattach to the Teen Knight's body and Elma realized that the Teen Knights would continue to come back to life as long as the Embryo was alive. However, the only time that the Embryos exposed its weakness was when it used its Repair skill on one of the Teen Knights. While the giant eye was still open, Elma quickly picked something from his inventory and threw it into the air. The magic stone shattered while it was in mid-air and it released a couple of needles which inflicted 11 damage to the embryo's eye. Elma realized that that was the only way he could damage Embryo at all and the thing he threw was one of the magic crystals he acquired from patchwork bears they fought when they first entered the dungeon. Elma quickly jumped back and he knew he had to immediately start fighting the Teen Knights in order to hide from Embryo's spells. Bro, this boss fight is actually really, really interestingly and well done. Back to story, Elma thought to himself that as long as he was focused and dialed in, he shouldn't be hit by one of Embryo's skills. The Teen Knights attacked Elma and he used the Shield of Madness to block and he tried to use his Shield Bash like before, but even though he managed to bash one of the Teen Knights, the other two were already on him and Elma almost died to their attacks. In the very last moment, he somehow managed to block one attack and bury the other. Elma striked the last Teen Knight with a critical strike and he jumped back to a safer spot. He looked at the entire situation and he realized that the Teen Knights were actually learning his moves. Elma thought that that might be possible in the real world even though he had never experienced something like that in the game. But our protagonist never thought that he would have such a hard time defeating the Embryo. On top of that, the Embryo was healing back its HP over time and was now sitting at 33 health points and Elma realized that he would need to throw three more magic crystals to kill it off. However, something completely unexpected happened. The embryo opened its giant eye and used one of its skills. Elma couldn't believe that the embryo used slife cutters without thinking about the safety of Teen Knights and even though something like that shouldn't have happened, Elma realized that he shouldn't rely on the knowledge he had about those monsters as they were clearly different than the ones from the game. One of the Teen Knights had been sliced in half and Elma realized that he wouldn't be able to dodge the skills so he decided to stand behind his shield of madness. The impact was so strong that it sent Elma flying straight into a wall and he was completely disoriented, his heartbeat was racing and he couldn't even feel his legs. Elma was stunned and while he was laying there on the floor, the other two Teen Knights quickly surrounded him. 
Our protagonist thought that that was it for him and that he was going to die. He blamed it on his low luck stats and wondered whether he had made a mistake when he sent Lucy off with those two adventurers. And when he finally realized that he had made that grave mistake, one of the teen knights had swung its sword at him. Just when it was about to decapitate Elma, he was pulled to the side by someone. When Elma turned around, he saw Lucy dragged his body from harm's way and he was never happier to see someone. Lucy immediately used her doppel illusion skill to buy them some time and Elma asked her why she came back. Lucy explained that she never heard him coming back to reunite with them, so she took the wounded adventurers to a safe spot and she ran back to see how Elma was doing. Elma tried to persuade her to go back but Lucy told Elma that the same way he was stubborn, she was going to be stubborn just like him and she was going to stay and fight alongside with him. She told Elma how he rescued her before and how he risked his own life to protect her and because he told her that he relied on her strength, she couldn't just run away and leave him behind to die. Lucy said that if she did something like that, she would immediately quit being an adventurer and Elma was surprised with her determination. Our protagonist tried to explain how the Teen Knights had learned the way his shield bash worked and now they knew how to counter it and they didn't have long range attacks to attack the embryo head on. Lucy wasn't going to let Elma give up because he was the one that encouraged her when she felt useless. That's why she told Elma to count on her once more and Elma realized that Lucy had changed quite a bit from when he had met her. Elma got up and told Lucy that he believed in her and they were determined to give it their all to try and defeat the embryo and if they died there at least they would die knowing that they gave it their all. Elma and Lucy prepared themselves as even the Teen Knight that got sliced in half was already repaired and ready to fight them. One of the Teen Knights was rushing towards them and Elma ran out to counter its attack with his shield bash. Elma sent a Teen Knight flying but the other two were already on him, only this time Elma was ready for their attack. He successfully parried off the attack and he told Lucy that that was the time she should attack and Lucy acted accordingly and she stabbed the Teen Knight with her iron piercer. The Teen Knight was blown away from the impact of her attack and Lucy was happy that she was able to kill one of them. But Embryo once again used its magic to repair and revive the dead Teen Knights and all of them were standing once again with full HP which really shocked Lucy as this was novelty to her. Elma explained that if they focused entirely on Teen Knights it would just be a matter of time before they were out of energy and then they would be easy prey for them and instead they should focus on the Embryo and try to kill it as soon as possible while they were still able to fight. Lucy asked Elma whether he had a specific plan plan that would ensure their victory and Elma could only think of one thing and that mostly depended on Lucy and her luck. She needed to roll a 6 on her dice thrust because Elma thought that if she was able to pierce through the golden Lana's defense, which was around 200 points, she should be able to do significant damage to the embryo whose defensive stats were 88 points. Lucy didn't realize at first that she was able to reach the embryo because it was floating in mid-air, but she remembered that she unlocked the acrobatic step skills, however Elma told her that if she were to use that skill, the embryo would just cut her in half with its self cutter. Instead of that, Elma had a better idea, and that was that he was going to run through the Teen Knights, and he would then use his shield bash to catapult Lucy straight towards the embryo. That was their best shot and even with that their chances depended on luck and if they fail to execute that plan on the first try the outcome might be lethal for both of them. Lucy repeated after Elma to see whether she understood everything correctly and she promised that she would roll a 6 because that was their only way to defeat Embryo. I mean of course you're gonna roll a 6. It's all up to your skills to roll a 6, no luck at all. <laughs> Elma told her that he was counting on her but what he meant was that he was counting on her luck stat basically and her special skill to increase it significantly. They started running towards the embryo to close the distance between them and Elma even killed one of the Teen Knights with an unexpected critical strike and when they closed the distance enough, Elma shouted to Lucy to jump onto his shield, which Lucy immediately did. As soon as her feet were planted on the shield of madness, Elma used his shield bash skill to propel her into the air towards the embryo's only weakness, its eye basically. Elma thought how this plan went perfectly well up until that point and there was nothing else he could do more than to pray that Lucy rolls a 6 with her skill. But their chances weren't that great because when they fought against the second golden Lena, it took Lucy 7 tries 
tries to roll a six, but they couldn't allow themselves to lose hope, and Elmas thought that with everything taken into account, the probabilities should stack on top of each other, and Lucy should be able to roll a six on the first try. I mean, I wish this is how it works, but in real life, it doesn't work like this. Anyways, while Lucy was flying towards the embryo, even the monster was a bit surprised, and Elma observed everything from the floor. While he was praying for a six, Lucy couldn't do anything to up her luck stats in that moment, and when the wheel stopped spinning, they were devastated to see that Lucy had rolled a 4. Because of that, her attack ended up missing the target completely, and the embryo's face turned from a concerned one to a mischievous one. The monster started laughing really hard, and the sound of the laugh was so ominous which worried Elma pretty much. It was more than obvious that their plan had failed, and Lucy was falling from a great height. Elma was very concerned about the outcome, and he realized that he shouldn't have gambled their lives on a small chance of Lucy rolling a 6 with her dice thrust. He didn't see a way out, but he gripped his sword more tightly as he knew that if they gave up, they are as good as dead. Elma looked at thin knights that were already on him, and he thought to himself that he would have to keep their focus on him so Lucy could safely land, but it seemed that Lucy had other ideas. Elma heard a step, and when he turned around, he was completely surprised. Lucy used her acrobatic steps, and she jumped from the side wall to the ceiling behind the embryo, and she was ready to use dice thrust once again. Only this time she was more determined than ever in her life to roll a 6, but it doesn't matter. But that's exactly what happened. The wheel stopped spinning, and it was indeed a 6, which gave her a big attacking boost, and her attack was a critical strike, which ended up piercing through the embryo skull, and its giant eye popped out and exploded from the impact. Lucy really managed to kill that embryo with one hit, and even the thin knights that surrounded Elma immediately died. Died. Lucy gracefully landed on her knees and her level had gone up all the way to 31 and Elma's level was increased to 41. Elma couldn't believe his eyes and just when he thought that everything was lost, Lucy took the matter in her own hands and even though her luck had failed her the first time, she didn't give up and she immediately tried again and she was rewarded with a great victory over such a strong monster. Lucy couldn't believe it herself and while she was regaining her composure, Elma brought her her clown hat and told her that he would have died if she hadn't come back and he thanked her for saving his life and killing the embryo. Lucy was really happy with that, and on top of that, she was jumping from happiness due to the fact that she felt a lot more comfortable in her own skin, as she had gained so much confidence during their dungeon exploration. Lucy thought that everything she was able to achieve was thanks to her class and the special skills she had, but Elma told her that she was wrong to think like that. He told her that she was the one to take credit for her success, and he explained why that was so. He told her that when he first arrived in to that world, he looked at people's classes and levels and that determined his meaning of them, but he soon realized how that was wrong. If that was the case, Elma would be the same as his father or even as Klein who treated Lucy badly. Elma knew now that people are different because of who they are and the values they hold dear and seeing how Lucy had risked her life to come back to help him fight off the monsters and how she quickly adapted to the change of the plans, he understood that he couldn't possibly have found a better ally than Lucy. Lucy took all the compliments, but she thought that Elma was over-exaggerating a little bit. Both of them had gotten a title called Unexpected Result, which was only unlocked when a party of Max 2 members killed a Dream Lord, while their levels were at least 70% below the recommended level. The bonus that the title gave to them was a 15% increase in attack and agility stats when they were up against monsters of higher levels than them. On top of that, they found two more items, two tin swords whose market value was around 2 million and 400k gold coins. Elma couldn't believe that Lucy's luck stat affected even the tin knights and she was able to find two rare items just like that. Elma was curious to see what the embryo dropped, and he remembered that in the game it was a bow that had a special wind enchantment, and he asked Lucy whether she had seen anything like that. Lucy wasn't really sure, and when they looked around, they couldn't see anything like that. And after the monster finally disintegrated, Elma noticed something, and when he went to see what it was, he was blown away with what he was seeing in front of him. It was a skill book on intermediate wind magic, and it was worth 
20 million gold coins on the market. Elma immediately covered it with his cloak and Lucy didn't understand why he was doing such a thing. Elma explained that skill books were so valuable that they were even banned from trading and if anyone was to acquire one or to find out that they had one which was rare as they found one right now, people would definitely try to kill them and snatch the book from them. Elma thought that it would be best if they sold the skill book to the old witch. When Elma finally finished with his story about skill books and their value, the whole mansion started to shake and Lucy was terrified because she didn't know what was happening. However, Elma calmly explained that the dungeon, also known as the Dream Hole, was disappearing because the Dream Lord that ruled over it, the embryo, was killed. Lucy didn't know about that and that day she learned a ton of new stuff. When the dungeon completely disappeared, they would be teleported back to the place where they entered the dungeon in the first place. While the dungeon was disintegrating, Elma made some calculations in his head and he told Lucy that they had earned roughly around 65 million gold coins from their first expedition and when Lucy heard that, she literally fainted and Elma regretted saying anything because he had to take care of her now. Meanwhile, Klein and Reese were rolling back into town and Klein was pissed off with the fact that their expedition had gone terribly bad and they didn't even get the guaranteed drops that they expected, not even healing shrooms which were pretty common. Klein thought that their luck was pretty bad but Reese was still under the impression that they had a good drops thanks to Lucy's great fortune skill but Klein refused to believe in that and said how that was just a coincidence. Klein said that he wouldn't have kicked her out if she hadn't mentioned anything about her share, but Reese thought that if they were to see her again, that Klein should try and make her come back to their party. But Klein turned around and menacingly said that even someone like him had a sense of pride and he couldn't possibly ask Lucy to come back after he told all those things to her and he wasn't going to beg anyone even if his own life depended on it. They made their way to the Adventurer's Guild and Klein said that they still had enough time to find a substitute for Lucy because they still had some money left from the Bloodstained Sword and the substitute they talked about should be someone like Lucy that followed every other order Klein could think of. That was their plan, but when they entered the guild, they saw a huge crowd and Klein thought that someone might have defeated a very strong monster or something like that and he overheard some adventurers commenting on how an E rank and an F rank adventurers were able to defeat the dream lord of a dungeon that was recommended for level 50 adventurers and when Klein took a glimpse of the reception, he couldn't believe his eyes when he saw Lucy and Elma standing proudly in front of it. Elma explained to the receptionist that they weren't clearing the dungeon at all and that all they wanted was to farm some money and items and if they didn't believe them they had witnesses, the two adventurers that they saved from the wandering lord embryo. The receptionist told them that she understood what they were saying but because of the fact that the town put up a reward for adventurers that defeated the angel's toy box dungeon, the guild would have to launch an investigation to confirm what they were saying. Elma knew how these things were pretty common near towns and villages and if the dungeons weren't cleared for too long, monsters started coming out and all sorts of bad things could happen then. The recommended dungeon levels depended on the dungeon's location and there was even a map that explained all that and Elma explained how that greatly depended on the mana of such places. However, there were countless theories about that but no one could say anything with certainty as there was basically no proof. Normally high level adventurers farmed in dangerous dungeons because that way they could ensure that their rewards were good but as there were no such adventurers in the town of Rondelm, the mayor of the town had to put up a reward to prevent accidents and disasters from happening. Elma didn't even know about that reward and he asked the receptionist what the reward was and she boldly said that the reward was 10 million gold coins. When Klein heard that he couldn't come to terms with his decision of kicking Lucy out of his party and he understood that he made a grave mistake. I mean thank god. Are you telling me this is a party that kicked out one of their party members and because of that got weaker? But he actually realized that they got weaker. Wow, this is definitely a new 
the approach to Mangas. Now, Klein also heard from other adventurers that they had gotten some pretty good drops as well, and Klein knew that that was true because Elma and Lucy didn't seem to be even slightly affected when the receptionist said that the reward was 10 million gold coins. However, the receptionist had something else to tell Elma and Lucy, and that was that due to their amazing feat, the guild rules said that they were to be promoted all the way to rank D. Lucy even skipped one rank completely, and when Clyde and Reese heard that, Reese pushed Clyde to try and persuade Lucy to come back to their party. So he shouted out her name and immediately went down on his knees and begged Lucy to come back, and he said how sorry he was and that he was now a different man. Oh, how the turns have tabled! Now he was ready to split the money from the bloodstained sword in three equal parts, but Elma and Lucy simply walked past him without saying a word to Clyde. Giga chance. Clyde was desperate and he was shocked that they weren't even going to listen to what he had to say and Reese was also surprised to see how much Lucy has changed in such a short time. Lucy and Elma exited the guild and they went straight to a local tavern to get something to eat. Lucy was really happy that they got promoted to D-rank adventurers and she was delighted with the additional 10 million gold coins they got. Elma was immersed in his thoughts, and now that he was a D rank adventurer, his skill points were capped at 45, which could give him some room for improvements, but he couldn't stop thinking about the smoldering fang of madness as well. He was thinking of other ways to make money when Lucy called out to him and asked him whether he had any problems. Elma realized that he wasn't alone, and so he apologized to Lucy and told her that they should be celebrating, and Lucy agreed with him. Lucy grabbed the menu, and she couldn't wait to see what the Alchemist King's stove had to offer, and Elma told her that they could order whatever their hearts desired, and Lucy never experienced such luxury before. It was her dream to come to that tavern with her party members and order what she wanted without thinking about money, and she was delighted that that was turning into a reality. She remembered how she fantasized about all that with Clyde and Reese by her side, but now that was a thing of the past and Elma left. Lucy opened the menu and she saw a particular dish that caught her attention, but it was well over what she thought it would cost and she told Elma that they should look at meals that weren't going over 4k gold coins. Even though the king crab pie that Lucy wanted was 8k gold coins, Elma told the waiter that they were going to take one and he ordered some other food as well and Lucy almost lost her mind. She wasn't used to spending that much money on food, but Elma knew that they had more than enough. Elma also wanted to talk to Lucy about how they were going to split up the rewards and the first thing he asked her about was the intermediate skill book that the embryo dropped. Elma asked Lucy whether she would like to use it to learn wind magic and Lucy couldn't decide and she asked Elma whether or not he had any thoughts of using the book himself. Elma said that he already thought about his skill tree and that the wind magic wasn't one of the things he needed, so Lucy said that she wouldn't use the skill book as well and Elma was a bit surprised with her decision as wind magic would guarantee that she could always find a good party. But Lucy explained that she wanted to stay with him and she would like it if their goals were matching. She was grateful to Elma for showing her how much she could actually do and she discovered that potential within herself and she wanted to see just how much she could grow. To top everything off, Lucy added how she didn't want them to split and having said that, that only meant that they were going to sell that skill book and Elma was really happy about that. And Lucy noticed that and she thought that Elma had some money issues, but Elma didn't say a thing about that. He continued by saying how their total earnings were 57 million gold coins and with what they agreed on that they would split 80-20, Lucy was about to receive 46 million gold coins and the remaining 11 million would end up in Elma's pocket. Lucy was so surprised by what Elma just said that she jumped off from her chair. Elma thought that Lucy didn't like how they were splitting up the money and that she wasn't satisfied with 80% but that wasn't the case. I mean, of course it wasn't the case. Lucy told him that she couldn't possibly accept those terms and Elma told her that that split was really common amongst adventurers and in parties. Lucy wasn't going to give in and she told Elma that she could never repay him for helping her raise her levels and that 
that was only one thing he did for her, her confidence was also boosted and she thought that the 80-20 split wasn't fair to Elma. And after Elma and Lucy had a discussion about the split and they hadn't made an agreement, they made their way towards the now called broken magic library, the shop that was ran by that old witch. Elma opened the door and the witch was surprised to see him come back so fast and on top of that, a cute little kawaii girl was alongside him. The witch immediately realized that she was his party member, but Elma came there only to ask her whether or not she still had a skill book he was interested in. The witch told him that he was lacking trust and that her business worked on trust after all. Lucy took a couple of looks around the shop and she realized that the old witch had something that Elma wanted. The witch turned to Lucy and mentioned how she seemed like an earnest kid and she asked Elma whether he wanted to use the smoldering fang of madness on Lucy and Elma told her that the skill book was for him, that he wasn't so cruel to use it on others. The witch took a couple of puffs from her pipe and she said that even the fact that there was someone interested in such a skill was interesting on its own and Lucy didn't understand a thing the two of them were talking about. Elma told the old witch that they had some items that they wanted her to assess and the witch said that she thought that Elma was more intelligent than trying to sell her the items from his expeditions. Elma took his inventory bag and started pulling out all the swords they had looted and the old witch seemed quite surprised to see two golden lana swords. She added how she would have treated Elma differently if she knew that he had such items in his possession and Elma said that he wasn't going to bargain with her. Elma claimed that he wanted a total of 30 million gold coins for those two swords and for the two thin knight swords and he said that if the witch tried to lower the price they would immediately leave and look for another shop to sell their items. The witch told him that it would be almost impossible for him to get 30 million gold coins for those items from legal stores and Elma should agree on a lower price of 25 million gold coins. Elma knew that the witch was right, but he wasn't satisfied with the way she bargained and Lucy also added that the witch was right and the other stores would probably offer even less. Elma told Lucy to be careful around the witch and that she was so cunning that she could persuade people into things they didn't like. Elma was aware of the situation they were in, but he didn't want to sell his items for too little as well. Elma told the witch that he could wait with the swords and that they could live off of some magic stones and he took the swords back into his inventory. But the witch could sense that Elma had something else he wanted to ask her and she was right. So Elma took out the skill book and showed it to the witch. The witch was shocked to see that Elma had came across such a rare item in such a short time. Because it wasn't just a rare skill book, it was a skill book from a lord of dreams and the witch added that if Elma wanted to sell it for a fair price, she would gladly buy it off of him. The witch added that Elma and Lucy could become the next hero party and Elma realized that she was interested in the skill book and he wanted to get as much money for it as possible. The witch knew that the market price was around 20 million gold coins, but she said that if she was to buy the skill book from Elma, her life would immediately be endangered. She added how the guild would probably offer him 7 million gold coins, but because Elma had left her with a good impression, she was willing to throw in some extra millions and she was willing to buy the skill book from Elma for 14 million gold coins. Elma thought to himself that she would immediately display the skill book for sale as soon as she bought it and he tried to make a better deal by saying how anyone would offer him more than that and he asked for 22 million gold coins. The witch got angry and she said that Elma was too greedy and Elma said the same to her and that she wasn't giving fair deals to her customers. While they were fighting over the price of the dream lord's skill book, Lucy wondered about the price of the skill book that Elma wanted to buy. She asked the witch and she told her that Elma wanted the skill book that was worth 55 million gold coins and Elma said how that was a completely new price and that it originally cost 30 million. Lucy thought about it and even though she never imagined that the smoldering fang of madness would cost that much, she came up with an idea. 
She asked the witch if she could accept all the items they had for the smoldering fang of madness and after the witch gave it some thought, she realized that she could agree with that because the skill book that Elma wanted wasn't really that popular and she could sell the items that Lucy was offering to her without much trouble, which was a good thing for her. On the other hand, Elma thought that Lucy's proposal was a good one because they would still have some money from the reward and the magic stones they looted as well. The witch told Lucy that she needed to stay out of other people's businesses, but she agreed to her proposal and Lucy was overflowing with joy. However, Elma had something to say about that deal as well and he wasn't happy with the fact that he wouldn't be able to give Lucy her share of the money if they ended up taking the book. Lucy said that she didn't need anything more and she wanted to get the book as a gift for Elma and Elma tried to explain that even if they did so well on their first expedition, no one could guarantee that they would do like that on their next time and he asked Lucy what would happen if they went their separate ways. Lucy got a bit annoyed with his arguments and she asked him if he was trying to get rid of her and Elma only then realized that it sounded like that kinda. <laughs> Lucy told Elma that she really had nothing against him taking the skill book he so really wanted as they were going to stay together for a long 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 time and Lucy turned to the old witch and said that they had made a deal. The witch told Lucy that she had done a great job and they high-fived each other and Elma couldn't understand how they were able to get along so fast. While Elma and Lucy were at the old witch's shop, the girl from the beginning of the story, Maris, seemed to be torturing some prisoners. The prisoners were tied to the wall and they couldn't move, but Maris proceeded to kill them without any compassion. Even though butlers tried to tell her that she had already killed them, Maris was still slicing up their bodies and her level had gone up while she was doing so. She had heard that Elma was doing well and even though he was kicked out from the royal mansion, and disowned by his father, Marys knew that Elma wasn't going to simply give up and when she raised her head, her face was covered in blood and she looked like a psychopath. In the office of Elma's father, he was going crazy about the rumor that Elma was doing so good in the town of Rondelm and one of his closest butlers tried to explain that they didn't have concrete proof but they had heard from multiple sources that someone that fit Elma's description was really producing exponential results. His father thought to himself that Elma had to use the Edwin family name to make some connections in the guild and he blamed his success on that false thought he had. What made him even more angrier was the thought that Elm was damaging the reputation of his household even further and he wanted to remind him how they weren't treating him as family ever since his baptism. I mean, my bro is aware of it completely. He was left for good on the streets because you didn't like the class he got. Anyways, the butler tried to reason with his lord by saying how Elma was a man of virtue and that he would never do such a thing and he asked Isis, Elma's father, to give him time to see whether or not those rumors were true. Isis ordered his butler to tell the guild to expel Elma immediately if the rumors ended up as truthful and to inform Elma that if he did something like that ever again that he would be killed. Now they heard a knock on the door and it was Marys who knocked on the door and she came in and greeted Isis, whom she still called housemaster. Isis welcomed her inside and told her that she didn't have to call him like that and that she should just call him father as he had accepted her as his rightful heir and the next head of the Edwin household. Marys explained how she had overheard their conversation and she thought that the butler Thomas was trying to protect Elma. Mary said that kicking him out from the guild wouldn't do much because he could become a bandit which would end up hurting the Edwin household even more and Isis thought that she had a good point there but he couldn't understand what exactly is that she wanted. Now, Marys told Isis that the two of them should go and meet with Elma to see what what he was really up to. Now back in the town of Rondelm, Elma and Lucy were walking down the city streets and Elma couldn't believe that he was in possession of the smoldering fang of madness and Lucy told him that he shouldn't think too much about it because he also bought the 
iron piercer for her. Elma explained that he bought her the weapon only because he knew that they would need it in the dungeon and he knew that it was an investment that would bring them a lot of money and that made Lucy question his skill book and whether or not it would do the same. And Elma assured her that it would and he took out the book to inspect it once again. It had a pretty vivid description about adventurers that possessed that skill tree and Elma asked Lucy if it would be okay if he used it right then and there and Lucy couldn't wait to see Elma learn that skill tree but she still had some doubts about that skill tree because that description kinda worried her a little bit. Elma explained that it was one of the strongest skill trees that existed and when he used enough skill points to upgrade it, it would be a complete game changer. He explained that the smoldering fangs of madness allowed the user to fight with his life on the line and when it was paired with the vow of the heavy armor, it became completely OP. Elma didn't want to waste no more time, so he placed his hand over the skill book and to acquire the skill tree, he needed to get rid of the defense up skill tree he already possessed and just like that, Elma had acquired the skill tree that he wanted so much. He was so happy and he showed his status menu to Lucy and Lucy started joking with Elma about how he told her not to show her skill trees to other people, but she was really glad that Elma was happy. Elma explained that he would first upgrade his vow of the heavy armor and only after he was satisfied with that skill he would shift his focus on the smoldering fang of madness. Elma and Lucy went to the adventurer's guild to check the quest board and Elma explained how they should probably start thinking about improving their equipment because their levels have increased. Lucy thought that they could do that without spending so much money if they relied on the drops from dungeons and Elma didn't think that that was possible. But when he gave it some thought, there actually might be a possibility that it actually could be possible and Lucy was happy to have come up with such an idea. While they were in the middle of their conversation, the door opened and when Elma turned around, he saw his father and Marys walk into the guild. The guildmaster welcomed them and Isis told everyone to clear the room as he had some important matters to discuss. The guildmaster invited him to a special meeting room, but Isis shouted how he didn't want to repeat himself and told him to clear the entire room. Elma told Lucy that they should go as well because he could smell trouble brewing and coming their way and Lucy listened to him but she turned around to see Isis, the head of the Edwin family. She never saw him before but his attitude was giving Lucy the chills. Isis noticed they were heading out and he told them to stop which made Lucy even more terrified and what's making me terrified of murdering my dog is him barking in the background so much. I'm scared I might hurt him. I'm joking. I'm not. I love him so much, but sometimes it gets annoying. Anyways, Lucy started making excuses by saying how she was just a jester that constantly made jokes, but Elma told her to calm down. While turning to meet his father's gaze, Elma explained how Lord Isis wanted to speak with him and the entire atmosphere had changed. The atmosphere was completely different than just a moment ago, the air became more dense and apart from the other people in the room, Lucy didn't know what was happening. Elma finally broke the silence and he asked his father what he wanted from him and Isis was offended by the way Elma spoke to him and Lucy also tried to tell Elma that he should watch the way he spoke to Lord Isis. Mary Snow noticed her and she immediately went over to Lucy to ask her about her relationship with Elma and as Lucy didn't know what was going on, she asked Maris whether she somehow knew Elma as well. Elma interfered and told Lucy to exit the room as the situation and head was purely his own problem and he didn't want it to affect her and Lucy didn't want to leave his side as she sensed a great danger. Elma tried to explain everything, but his father shouted at Lucy and told her how she, who was just a normal adventurer, didn't have any rights but to listen to his orders and he repeated that she needs to leave the room. However, Maris understood that she was somehow connected to Elma and she persuaded Isis to let her stay because she might have some information that maybe would be important. Isis noticed that the guild leader entered the room and he told him that they had an agreement that they were going to handle Elma and the guild leader was a bit confused 
confused. He had thought that Isaiah came to recruit Elma and Lucy into his special private army because they were based adventurers and he continued saying how Elma was brave and courageous and he would probably end up becoming one of the best adventurers in, in history. But Isis already had his mind set and he told the guild leader to stop acting like a fool and to admit that he already knew the reason why he wanted to speak with Elma. The guild leader was completely baffled as he didn't have a clue about what Isis was talking about and Isis finally said that Elma was a member of the Advent family. The guild leader was shocked after hearing that statement and Isis told him to immediately run an investigation into all members of the guild to see whether there was anyone that was helping Elma hide his identity and rise his ranks and the guild leader immediately listened to Isis' orders because he was afraid of him. Lucy was also shocked and she realized before Elma even told her that he was Isis' son. Isis turned around to Elma and reminded him of his promise that he would kill him if he used the Edwin family name after he was disowned. Elma finally calmed down as he now knew what Isis wanted from him and Elma calmly explained that he hadn't done such a thing and Lucy confirmed that as well. Isis was so angry that he came closer to Elma and pulled him by a strap on his chest and before things escalated, Maris interfered. She calmed Isis down by saying how they only came to the guild to run an investigation and that there was no need to make rash decisions. Isis wanted to see where she was going with this and Maris turned to Elma and asked him if he had just leveled up to level 40 and if he had that was great. Elma understood what she wanted to say with that and Maris continued by saying how she just hit level 45 and had completed her life shifting skill tree and she wanted to spar with Elma to see how they stood against each other. Even though Isis thought that sparring would be meaningless because in his opinion a sword saint would always beat a heavy knight, Elma did accept her challenge but on one condition. Elma told Isis if he showed them that he was strong, he wanted the Edwin family to stay out from his life and out of his life till the end of times. Isis was angered by that as well and Marys was happy to have some action coming her way. Immediately after, Lucy and Isis backed off to the sides and Marys and Elma took their battling stances. Isis reminded Marys how she shouldn't kill Elma and Lucy tried to explain to Elma how that wasn't the best of ideas. Elma realized that they they hadn't sparred like that ever since they were little kids, but the look on Maris' face showed no signs of nostalgia and Elma realized that she was lusting for blood right now. Maris went on the attack and she was swinging her sword at an incredible speed and Lucy couldn't even decipher what was happening, she could only hear the clanging of swords. Emma was able to block all of her attacks and when he saw an opening he used his huge sword to swing at her but because Maris was so fast she was able to evade his attack and she jumped back onto the receptionist table. Maris proclaimed how she was happy for having some fun and with a psychotic look on her face she said that that would be the last time the two of them ever sparred. Maris thought that she could warm up a little bit only by using her right arm while they fought and she jumped off of the reception desk and went straight at Elma who raised his shield of madness and was waiting for her attack. Maris unleashed a barrage of attacks but none of them seemed to pass through Elma's shield. However, Maris's continuous attacks pushed Elma back a little bit and she was taunting him with all sorts of questions and Lucy was also worried because that was the first time she had seen anyone make Elma go back a little. Elma suffered quite a substantial amount of damage and even though he started off with 100 health points, they were now standing at 61 and Isis hated the fact that Elma was so stubborn because it was clear that the fight had been child's play for Maris until that point. Elma had realized that he had lost a lot of health points and he knew he had to do something. He nudged his shield a bit higher and Maris realized that Elma was about to swing his sword at her but she was certain that she would be able to dodge it like she had all this time. But something was different now and Maris' feet were glued to the ground and it seemed that Elma had used his shadow stomp without her noticing it and that resulted in Elma landing a good hit on Maris which knocked her down on the ground. Lucy was cheering Elma on and Isis thought to himself how a sword saint could never lose to a heavy knight and that Maris just wasn't focused enough. Elma was aware of the difference in power between the two of them but he was glad he had gotten a hit that should have done some damage. 
but Elma also knew that that was the first and the last time that that trick worked because Merix could expect it in the future. The only reason Elma was able to actually close the distance after using Shadow Stomp was because of the title he and Lucy had gotten after they had defeated the Embryo, which gave them a 15% boost in attacking and agility stats when fighting higher level opponents. But Marys quickly got up and she was now paying attention to both her and Elma's steps and she started attacking Elma once again. Elma blocked every attack of hers and he knocked her back once again, but this time Marys didn't fall. She was happy that Elma was strong and that their fight was still lasting and she added how she was worried that everything would be over in the blink of an eye and she was happy she was wrong. Elma knew that something bad was coming his way and he could sense it as Mary started taking a completely different attacking stance and her aura changed as well. Mary said that because Elma was able to land a good hit on her, she was going to take that chance to show everyone one special skill of sword saints called Vagra Barrage. And with that being said, Mary simply vanished and Lucy couldn't believe her eyes. The very next moment, Mary showed up on the other side of the room and she was already flying at Elma with her sword pointed at him. Elma didn't have enough time to put his shield of madness in front of him and he somehow blocked the initial attack with his sword, but as Mary was going in for another one already, Elma was able to fetch his shield from his back and he used it to protect himself from her attack. Isis and Lucy watched every everything carefully and while Lucy was on her toes, Isis stood calmly. Elma realized that he had barely managed to survive Marys' special skill and he thought that it was all finished but Marys had a huge grin on her face and she was sending another attack as well, only this time she was slicing from the bottom up like an uppercut with a sword and even though Elma managed to place his shield of madness in front of him to block it, his blood was spilled and Lucy shouted out his name because she saw that he was wounded. The the fight was about to get even more serious and Lucy commented how Elma was really struggling against Maris which made Maris really happy. Elma was obviously wounded and there was blood coming out of his mouth but he was still standing on his feet. Neris realized that she couldn't really break Elma's defenses that easily, but from the look on Elma's face, she knew that she had caused him much pain and inflicted a lot of damage. While Elma was trying to catch his breath, Neris wondered whether she should just attack him and kill him once and for all. Isis said nothing, but Lucy cried out how Elma had already reached his limit and she begged Maris to stop. But after they all said what they had to say, Elma coughed up some blood and he decided to finally speak out. He told Maris that he had a total of three objectives while their fight lasted and even though Maris didn't say anything back, she was clearly interested in what Elma had to say. So our protagonist said that his first objective was to see Maris' skill in person with his own two eyes and the second one was closely connected to the first one as he also wanted to see whether that skill had an opening he could use to attack her, however his third objective seemed a bit odd at first. Elma said that his third objective was that he initially let Mary land a couple of hits so his health points would drop below 40%. Elma was now sitting at 38 health points and Mary was angry at him because she thought that what he said was nothing but garbage bluffs. Mary showed Elma her special magic sword Mizugarasu and said how she was satisfied with the difference between the sword's ability stats and Elma's current level, but Elma said that he had taken everything into account and that his calculations were perfect. What Elma had in his mind was that he had finally reached all the conditions he needed to use the smoldering fang of madness and he started having flashbacks of how Lucy made a bargain with the old witch to acquire the skill book for him and with one swipe of his finger Elma added a couple of skill points to that special skill tree. He wasn't going to give up because Lucy had believed in him and she was actually the one that motivated him now. Elma knew that she was scared to death to talk back to Isis and yet for his sake she did that as well. Elma had used up 5 skill points on the smoldering fang of madness and that unlocked a special skill called half dead savage dragon and with that he was going to make sure that he won the fight against Maris. Maris thought that he was only spouting gibberish and bluffing but Elma was dead honest. He only had one condition to meet to use his special skill and that was to bring his health points below 20%. However that was usually very risky because even one blow could mean the death of him and he could die with 
without ever activating his skill. But now comes the part where being a heavy knight makes Elma OP. Heavy knight had a unique skill that would help them minimize the risk of dying before activating the half dead savage dragon skill and that skill was called life shield and Elma used it just then. Elma's whole body started to glow but his health points had dropped to 18. What Life Shield actually did was that it gave the user a full body shield that would last as much minutes as health points sacrificed by the user. Isis knew about that skill and he didn't think it would help Elma that much and Isis saw that as a desperate move. However, the reason why Elma used Life Shield wasn't because he was relying solely on that skill but to bring his health points down below 20% which he had achieved now. Elma was certain that he would end up finishing the whole thing in a matter of seconds. So he gripped his sword even more tightly and his body started emitting electricity which scared Maris for the first time since the beginning of the fight. Elma had finally used his half dead savage dragon skill and he proclaimed that he was going to show everyone why the heavy knight class was actually the strongest one. Maris realized that Elma had activated some type of skill but she laughed it off thinking how that couldn't possibly make a difference in the fight. But Elma immediately jumped at her and with a speed that even exceeded Maris's, their swords clashed and Maris was shocked, seeing that made her think that she was fighting a sword saint instead of a heavy knight. The reason why Elma was so fast was indeed his special skill, which raised his attacking and agility stats by 100% and with the added 15% from the title they acquired, he was now sitting at base 115% buff in attack and speed and with that Elma had now gotten the statistical upper hand in their fight. They started exchanging blows and Maris was laughing all the way because she enjoyed the adrenaline she was experiencing and she was happy that Elma didn't give up because the way it was now was far more entertaining for her. Maris asked Elma whether he had heard of the tale of the wax winged angel and even though Elma knew the story he chose to remain silent. Maris proceeded to tell the story of how an angel without wings was born and because of that she was cast down to earth from heaven. The angel couldn't stop itself from dreaming of its return to heaven so it made itself some wings of wax and started flying towards the sun. However, the story ended with the waxed wings melting down which caused the angel to fall and ultimately die. I mean, this is literally Icarus mythos but okay, I'll give him, I'll give him a pass this time. Now, the whole purpose behind Maris telling the story was to make a connection between the angel from the story and Elma and she was saying how Elma was going to die just like that angel. Maris was deluded by her envy towards Elma and she said how the things she loved the most was to see people struggle and even despite all of their efforts they still ended up failing. It was obvious that Maris was a psychopath and she enjoyed to see people suffer. I mean, just report her, GG20 report her, she's so toxic. She attacked Elma, but Elma used Perry to deflect her blow. He was completely convinced that he was going to win and he felt sorry to break it to Maris that he wasn't going to share the same fate with the angel from the story. Maris still thought that she had the upper hand in the fight and she said how Elma's Perry was just an inferior version of one of her skill and while she was saying that, her sword started overflowing with water that covered the whole blade. Ichi no kata, minamo no giri. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, it's cringe, I know, but it reminded me of Demon Slayer and I love that anime, especially their attacks. Now anyways, back to the story. The name of her skill was Flowing Water, but even though Maris thought that she had the upper hand, Elma found a way to trick her by delaying his attack a little bit, which completely caught her off guard. She was furious with the fact that she felt like she was being pressured by Elma and that she was now defending instead of attacking. Our protagonist told her how she couldn't even overpower him while her overall stats were much higher than his and now that Elma had the power of the stats on his side, there was no chance for him to lose to her. Now Maris thought that she should resort to her special skill once more, Vagra Barrage, and that's exactly what she did. She started slicing away at Elma, but Elma parried one blow, then another one, and when Maris failed to land her third strike, she felt completely exhausted and Elma found himself behind her. Maris let out a desperate cry, but Elma told her that her special skill had a huge opening. That angered Maris even more, and when she attacked Elma once again, he deflected her sword and it seemed that the impact was too much for her to handle that she had to let go of the sword that was sent flying into the air, bounced off of the guild ceiling and finally struck the ground. 
Elma explained that Vagra Barrage was a great skill that increased all stats, but the skill was as strong as its user was and it seemed that Maris was only relied on her talent and that she hadn't been put in much work. Elma explained that if she had stopped at her third strike, she would still have energy to continue, but Maris couldn't take it to be lectured by Elma and she attacked him with her bare hands. That was the most desperate move she could do, but Elma was ready for the sucker punches as well and he prepared his shield of madness. When Maris punched Elma's shield, Elma used his shield bash to send her flying across the room and Maris ended up hitting the wall at the end of the room. And with that, the fight was over and Elma was the obvious winner. I mean, I would like it if he killed her actually, but it's too much, I get it. Now, Maris was lying unconscious, Isis was speechless, and Lucy ran to hug Elma to celebrate his victory. Elma was surprised by her reaction, but Lucy explained that she was more happy due to the fact that Elma was alive and well, and she told him how scared and concerned she was when she first saw how Maris fought. Elma patted her on the head and he said that she was the one to take all of the credit for his victory because after all she was the one that made the deal with the old wish to acquire the smoldering fang of madness for him. They turned to Isis and Lucy said how Maris was lying there and they could see how desperate and shocked Isis looked. He couldn't believe that a heavy knight class like Elma would ever be able to defeat a sword saint like Maris and he started questioning everything now. When Isis knelt down to see whether Maris would be alright. Elma addressed him as Count Isis and asked him whether that fight was enough for him to acknowledge his power and strength. Elma and Lucy stood over while Isis was kneeling next to Maris who was unconscious and as much as it pained Isis to say it out loud, he proclaimed that he was now aware that the guilt had nothing to do with Elma's success and that he could see how he was able to defeat the Dream Lord on his own. Isis picked up Maris and her sword and without saying another thing, he left. Elma looked at his father's back while he was leaving and he remembered how he used to tell him while he was a kid that they as nobles should never have any connection with the common people and that they should not even show any compassion towards them. Elma being a child only listened to what his father was saying and he also added how that needed to be like that if they wanted to keep their nobility status and dignity and only if they were keeping a distance between them and the commoners would they be able to protect both the land and its people. Elma remembered how he didn't understand his father when he was a child and he thought to himself how he never respected him in the true sense of the word. Our protagonist described his father as an emotionless tyrant who only cared about himself and the way people thought of him. But those words he had heard his father say when he was a child made a huge impact on Elma because they sort of paved his way or ignited his desire to serve the people and protect them. While Isis was walking towards the exit door, Elma called out to him and addressed him as father that time and bowing down, Elma thanked him for bringing him up and raising him. Oh, it was an emotional moment, but Isis, as proud as he was, didn't even flinch, not to mention turning around. He just continued walking and Lucy called out to him and asked him to apologize to Elma. Elma tried to tell Lucy that it was fine and that he didn't have to do such things because Lucy wasn't going to keep silent. She told Isis that Elma calmly endured all of his shouts and insults and now when he knew he had to apologize because he was wrong, he was just just leaving without saying a word to his son. Lucy turned to Elma to tell him that even though they cleared their misunderstanding, Elma was the once again the one that was going to end up lonely and without a family. Isis reached for the door handle and he shouted out to Lucy to take care of Elma. That was the only thing he said and then he left, but both Elma and Lucy were surprised by his words. That night was going to be Elma's last night in the capital of Rondelm and the very next day he and Lucy left the inn and got on a carriage that was leaving Rondelm. Elma asked Lucy whether she was comfortable enough to leave Rondelm behind and accompany him on his journey and Lucy said that she had to do it because Isis told her so, no matter how she felt, she was going to take good care of Elma. I mean, that's a good 
built-in excuse. But after all, she was feeling a bit down because Isis didn't apologize to Elma in the end. Elma understood that he needed to pay attention to his image and the way people perceived him and Elma was glad that his father showed any compassion whatsoever and he knew that Isis had to do it in his own way. But Elma didn't want to keep talking about that topic and he told Lucy that by saying that he was in her care, that was Isis' way to acknowledge her as a great adventurer and that made Lucy smile. The carriage finally stopped and they got off and it seemed that they had reached their destination. They arrived at Lacornia the so-called town of adventurers. Elma had never been there and even though he had heard countless stories about it, nothing could prepare him for seeing the ginormous town in person. Both of them were blown away by the town's size. Elma wouldn't even call it a town. In his opinion, it was much more resembling a city than a town. The reason why Lacornia was dubbed the sacred land of all adventurers was that Lacornia was a place that was swarming with high-level dungeons and they were appearing rather often. Those dungeons were the reason why every adventurer was visiting Lacornia because they wanted to make a name for themselves by clearing some of those dungeons. It was a dream of every adventurer that sought fame and power. Hearing that there were so many dangerous dungeons around Lacornia made Lucy ask Elma whether the city always managed to clear them and Elma thought that that was probably the case. He told Lucy that they weren't beginners anymore and that's why he would love it if they started grinding and farming even more than they used to but before they could do anything they would need to upgrade their equipment because it was in a really bad condition. Elma planned to immediately go into a dungeon as soon as they finished visiting the guild in that city and Lucy wanted to confirm that because she felt like she needed to allocate her unused skill points but she didn't really know what to do and she asked Elma to help her out. She reached out her hand with her status menu opened and Elma once again told her not to show her skill trees to other people. Lucy thought that it should be fine if it was Elma whom she showed it to and Elma looked at her status menu and he explained that jesters usually had four different builds an all-arounder build, a magician build, a speed one and a crit one. Elma continued by saying how Lucy shouldn't upgrade her great fortune skill tree if she wanted to have a good all-around build which would even be good for magic but Lucy immediately corrected Elma and told him that she wanted to be one of the best and that she would love to go for the strongest out of those four he had mentioned. After hearing her wishes, Elma told her that she should go for a crit build and she should start by allocating 15 of her 18 unused skill points into her great fortune skill tree and Lucy did it immediately without a moment of hesitation. She was delighted to see that her beckoning kitty skill evolved into the angel of happiness skill. That made her really happy and she felt more motivated than ever. The goal that she had in mind was to become the best grit build jester in the entire world and Elma told her that if she was even going to try to do that they should acquire a special skill book called the Shirigami's Assassin. Elma thought that it was going to be even more expensive than the smaller in Fang of Madness which was priced at around 50 million gold coins and Lucy was overwhelmed by that so much that she even questioned going for another build. Elma told her that they would probably have enough time to gather as much money as they would need because they were still far away from acquiring it and whenever there was mention of large sums of money Lucy felt a bit sick for some reason. Elma and Lucy made their way to the Adventurers Guild in the city of Lacornia to gather valuable information and to see where they could go to grind and farm. They learned what they needed and they made their way to a dungeon that appeared in the forest near Lacornia. Elma thought that that dungeon was the best place to farm some good equipment with Lucy's great fortune skill and they entered the dungeon with the aim of acquiring black steel equipment. When they entered the dungeon it was much different than the last one because the last this one was all nice and luxurious, huge hallways of a beautiful mansion and the one they were in was a mine now. Lucy mentioned how they were once again completely under the recommended adventurer's level and Elma told her that they would be fine and that those were just numbers. He explained that the monsters they were going to hunt were slimes that were of much lower level than the one that was assigned at the entrance to the dungeon. On top of that, those slimes had a high chance of dropping black steel equipment which was really popular among lots of intermediate adventurers because they weren't hard to handle and their value was high. Elma told Lucy that black steel equipment would be crucial for their success and Lucy was amazed with the fact that 
Elman knew so much about the world. He always knew what they were after and what was good and what wasn't and the topic also didn't matter because he knew all about classes and all about dungeons. Elma said how that wasn't a big deal because he was forced to study all of that when he was a kid and Lucy apologized for mentioning something that might evoke some unpleasant memories. Our protagonist told her that she shouldn't be sorry because she was one of the reasons he could cut all ties with the Edwin family in the most painless way but there was something Elma couldn't tell Lucy and that was that the knowledge he had wasn't from his childhood studies and that it came from his memories from his previous life. Elma knew how crazy that sounded and not even he himself knew everything about it. Lucy went on to comment how people in Elma's family weren't actually emotional and she thought that if Elma had so much knowledge about the world then he could simply get himself a job as a guild counselor but she quickly understood that if that were to happen the two of them would part ways and that fact terrified her now. Lucy asked Elma to stay with her and Elma replied how he loved being an adventurer far more than having an office job and that way he was able to calm her down. With that being said, they came across their first slime monster and its level was 45 which made Lucy a little bit stiff and she said that the slime was the same level as Mary's and even if that was the case, Elma explained that the levels of people were different than levels of monsters. After all, monsters weren't as smart as humans and especially slimes, they could only execute simple movements which made it almost a joke to compare them to sword saint adventurers. Elma started running towards the slime to meet it before it accelerated to its full speed and he was going to stop it with his shield. The slime started to roll as well and even though it wasn't at full speed, the impact was still a strong one that it sent Elma flying. Elma didn't lose his composure and he noticed that the slime had stopped under a lamplight and he quickly dashed to use his shadow stomp to restrict the slime's movements. Elma explained that as long as they kept a safe distance and moved well, the two skills that the slimes had, accelerate and body strike, would never harm them which meant that they could practically go about the whole dungeon without taking any damage. Elma also used his disarm skill to drop the slime's attacking power just in case and Lucy was quick to act as well. With her acrobatic steps, she quickly jumped behind the slime and started carving it up with her iron piercer. The slime somehow managed to escape Elma's shadow stomp, but as it didn't have room to accelerate, its body strike was much less powerful and Elma didn't even feel the impact at all. It was evident that the slime was losing its power and Lucy was able to finish it without a problem. The slime let out a cry before shattering into smaller pieces. Oh no, slime, don't cry! <laughs> the monster died and Elma's level rose to 43 and he told Lucy that if they could be that efficient, they could clear the dungeon in no time. Lucy went to see whether or not the slime dropped anything and among the earth magic crystals, Lucy found a black steel knife whose market value was 4.3 million gold coins. Even though Elma knew that Lucy would increase their dropping chances, he never imagined that they would find a black steel knife so quickly and Elma told Lucy that they practically found the only piece of equipment she used and Lucy made a comment about how she would need to take good care of that knife because it was really valuable and expensive. Lucy asked Elma whether his plan was to only go after slimes and he said that it was and if everything was according to his plan they could easily kill at least 10 slimes without a problem and Lucy was a bit intimidated by that number. Our protagonist explained that they were able to kill the last one without taking any damage and he also said that the slimes were nothing compared to the Teen Knights and the embryo they already defeated. Elma explained that he wanted to farm at least the same amount of money that would be equal to two golden lana swords which was 34 million gold. Lucy asked him if there was a special reason for that and Elma simply replied that they would need lots of money if they were to become stronger. Lucy understood that they needed to become stronger but she didn't really think that farming smiles was the right way to go but Elma told her that he wasn't afraid of smiles but there was actually something that Elma was worried about but just as he was going to tell Lucy what that something was, their conversation was interrupted by a big group of smiles, four of them to be exact. Lucy was going crazy but Elma stayed calm. He knew that they don't usually attack in groups, but he also knew that they must not retreat as that would give the monsters the advantage because of their acceleration skill. Elma told Lucy that they needed to go to the monsters and not the other way around. And after all, 
That was something that Elma had been wanting all along. That was the perfect scenario for someone whose sole goal was to farm experience and equipment. Elma explained that they needed to unleash a quick attack so they could end up fighting a smaller number of opponents because the longer the fight lasted, the more difficult it would be for Elma and Lucy. There was one monster that was a little bit different than the others and was standing in the back and Elma noticed it immediately. Instead of a smiling face, it was gloomy and the monster was called Gloom as well and Elma was really happy that they had stumbled upon it as it was even rarer than the smiles. He realized that Lucy's great fortune skill tree was not only responsible for better item drops but it also affected the spawn rates of rare monsters and he was really happy so he thanked Lucy but Lucy ended up understanding that like it was her fault that they were being attacked by a group of monsters. Elma tried to explain that even though that was right he didn't mean it like that and he was actually happy that that was the case. But as they talked about that, the monsters started rolling towards them and they had to come up with a quick strategy. Now, Elmo told Lucy that he would taunt the monsters and that she should try to attack the Gloom monster that was in the back because it seemed that Gloom was the leader of the smiles. Lucy understood her task and she waited for her chance. One smile and the Gloom were after Elma and Elma used Perry to deflect the smile and as he noticed that the Gloom was rolling towards him, he quickly told Lucy to jump in the air before he grabbed his shield of madness. Elma took a defensive stance and as soon as the Gloom made impact with his shield, he used shield bash to send the monster flying directly towards Lucy that has been waiting on the ceiling. Lucy was ready and she jumped to meet the Gloom with an attack and with dice thrust rolling a 6, she was able to kill the monster with a single critical strike. The Gloom shattered into smaller rocks and stones and it was crumbling and Elma Elma tried to pay attention in order not to get hit by the debris. Their levels had gone up once again but there was no time to celebrate as two smiles were already rolling towards Elma and because they were coming from the back, Lucy warned him to watch out for their attack. But Elma was completely calm and he knew that the gloom was their mastermind and the mastermind behind their attacks and as he crouched down, he used his parry skill to propel the two monsters into attacking each other head on. He continued how smiles were completely stupid without their leader and the impact of the strike made both of the monsters fall onto the ground unconscious which enabled Elma and Lucy to finish them off without any effort. Elma turned around as there was another smile still alive and when the monster noticed that it was alone it started running away but Elma wasn't going to let that happen and he immediately used his shadow Tom to stop it from moving. Lucy immediately attacked it and she killed that one with one strike as well and she was feeling a lot more comfortable now that she was wielding a black steel knife. Elma was really happy with how that fight went because he thought that he would even have to use his special skill but that would end up as an overkill and Lucy was amazed with the way Elma fought and that motivated her to try and keep up with him as much as she could. The drops that they had gotten from the smiles were the following. A black steel hammer, a black steel ingot and a black steel sword which were all around the market price of 4 million gold. Elma took the sword for himself and he was really happy that they achieved their biggest wish and Lucy was really happy that they had matching weapons. Now, <laughs> women! Elma was now interested in what the gloom had dropped because it was a rare monster and the drop should be rarer as well. And when Elma picked up the drop, Lucy couldn't recognize it but it looked like a magic stone to her. Elma told her that even though it resembled a magic stone, the drop he was holding in his hands was a rune. Runes were special stones that could increase the stats of certain equipment and only a skilled blacksmith was able to successfully transmutate the rune. The rune that the gloom had dropped was called the rune of destruction and its market value was around 20 million gold coins because its effect was really strong. The rune increased a weapon's attacking stats by 30%. Elma was really happy and Lucy couldn't believe that such a small marble was that valuable. Elma was really surprised to come across a rune so early and Lucy told him to safely stash it for now and not to lose it. They checked the total value of all of their drops they had found and it came to around 41 and a half million gold and Lucy had to grab hold of something because the number was too high. Elma wanted to continue even though they had gotten the weapons that were essential for their levels and they even leveled up quite a bit. 
but Elma knew that black steel equipment was only the bare minimum and that everyone had access to it and on top of that he wanted to farm more gold because there was a chance that they might come across the Shinigami's assassin skill book that they needed for Lucy's crit build. With that being said they walked further into the mine without knowing what was waiting for them and while they were walking further down the mine Lucy was joyfully whistling a tune and when they crossed one bridge Elma told her to stop which kinda surprised her but she soon understood why Elma told her to stop whistling as another sound could be heard now and this one was more ominous and Lucy thought that it could maybe be a giant smile but Elma told her that such a monster didn't exist but he also knew that it wasn't a dream lord as well. There were many reasons why that was true ever since the dungeon appeared near the town of Lacornia no one had ever saw the dungeon boss and no bounties were ever issued for the clearance of the dungeon. That also meant that the dungeon wasn't swarming with adventurers that wanted to earn themselves some fame and quick money and on top of everything that sound was completely different than the sound of a dungeon boss. Elma had thought about every possibility and he came to a conclusion that the sound could be coming from a mithril golem and after the sound had repeated itself once again there was no doubt about it elma could recognize the sounds of its footsteps lucy had never heard of a mithril golem before and elma told her that they were extremely lucky as it was a super rare monster he explained that it was much much rarer than the gloom and if killed the monster would drop mithril which was an extremely rare material out of which weapons could be forged and lucy became really interested in this material but Elma's face suddenly became more serious than ever and he told Lucy that that monster was way stronger than anything they had ever encountered before even Elma who was a heavy knight that specialized in defense wouldn't be able to defend against the mithril golems attacks and that monster was known for being able to kill really strong adventurers and that was the part that Elma feared the most he knew that if they were to die that was it there was no respawn button in the real world world. He was really worried and he knew that the rewards would be great but he knew as well that the risk was too high too. Elma crouched down to think and he thought to himself how they would most certainly die if they were to come across a mithril golem while they fought another monster and Elma thought that it would be much smarter to retreat. But he couldn't make a decision because he was really intrigued by the mithril because weapons made from it were the strongest of best quality. Lucy called out to Elma and she said that by seeing him worry too much and think made her realize that mithril was really valuable and that they should go. She said that even though she was really scared she wanted to overcome her fears because she was an adventurer after all. Elma was surprised by Lucy's words and when he turned around Lucy explained that she knew that whenever Elma thought about something a lot he wanted that something no matter the risk. On top of all that Lucy also realized that it was her great fortune skill that probably spawned the mithril golem and that's why she would feel really bad if they left it for someone else. Normally monsters spawned around the same level as the adventurers in the dungeon but the mithril golem was probably the only monster that broke that rule. Elma was slowly getting up and he told Lucy that if she was okay with that decision they would go after and try to defeat the mithril golem and Elma had already thought of how they would approach the fight. He told Lucy that they needed to find a place that would give them an advantage and Lucy was really surprised with that idea. They started exploring the mine and Elma was constantly making some noise with his sword to get the monster's attention so they would follow him. The sound was becoming louder and louder and Elma was satisfied that his strategy was working but Lucy wasn't really sure that they were in the right place as it was a bit too hard to work normally. But Elma told her that they had already done a similar thing with the golden Lena and that the cave that they were currently in had ideal conditions for fighting the mithril golem. Everything about the cave they were in from its height and width and even the ground it was all perfectly placed for them because the monster shouldn't be able to easily move in such a terrain. Elma knew the exact stats of mithril golem and he told Lucy that it was level 55 and that its attacking stats was 78 with 66 points in defense and as if that wasn't enough the monster also had you <laughs> 
automatic health regeneration. Hearing all that made Lucy lose her mind. Our protagonist said that it would be pointless if they tried to use a bunch of smaller attacks on the monster and that they would have to count on Lucy's dice thrust skill for a critical strike. Elma knew that it would be really hard to find an opening to attack the monster but that also meant that the monster wouldn't be able to attack them because of the specifications of the cave. The monster finally appeared and it was ginormous with a whopping 117 health points and the other stats were just like Elma mentioned. After seeing the monster, Elma's determination and will grew even stronger and he has decided that they would strip every single piece of mithril it had. When the mithril golem saw Elma and Lucy, it let out a deafening roar and Elma knew that the fight started as soon as the monster had laid its eyes on them. Elma started running towards the monster and he told Lucy that he would distract it and Lucy understood that her task was to attack when Elma found an opening for her. Elma was in the attacking distance of the monster and his first idea was to try and parry its attack but midway through Elma realized that that wouldn't really be possible and he ended up taking the punch with his shield of madness. However, the strike was so strong that Elma barely managed to stay conscious as he was sent flying through the cave. Elma somehow succeeded into landing on his feet and he knew that the mithril golem had a great sense of presence and he had never felt more intimidated in his whole life. Elma wanted to use this arm to lower the monster's attacking stats but he just didn't have the time to do so and he realized that their task wasn't going to be an easy one. But our protagonist noticed that Lucy used her acrobatic steps to go around and behind the monster's back and he thought to himself how he managed managed to achieve his goal. Lucy was also really happy that the distraction plan worked out and she went in for the attack. Just when Lucy was about to hit the mithril golem with her new knife, the monster turned its head around and Lucy was almost crushed to small bits by its large hand. Lucy slipped and she fell onto the ground because she was afraid and while the mithril golem was looking at Lucy, Elma started closing the distance between him and the monster and he reminded Lucy that the cave didn't allow the monster to fight them with its full potential. However, the mithril golem noticed that Elma was running at him and with its other hand it tried to smother him, but this time Elma was able to use his parry skill to deflect the monster's hand towards the wall, where it completely got stuck from the impact. Elma thought to himself that if the monster tried attacking him now, his attack wouldn't be as strong as it normally would, so he tried to provide Voki to attack him now. Elma took his shield of madness and started running at the huge monster. The mithril golem was forced to use his other hand to attack and Elma rushed at its attack with his shield bash skill already prepared. Elma knew that there was no possibility that he would ever push the mithril golem back but what he wanted was to use his shield bash skill to send himself flying backwards, something like an emergency evacuation plan. But that was Elma's plan altogether and he wanted to make the monster stick both of his hands into the ground so that it couldn't move freely as it wanted and that's exactly what Elma was able to do. Lucy realized that and she immediately used dice thrust, rolled a 6 and inflicted a critical strike on the monster which let out a loud cry. The monster had lost more than half of its HP and while he tried to catch Lucy with his now freed hands, Lucy was able to use her acrobatic steps skill to quickly and safely run away. Lucy knew she had done a good job and she was really happy about it. Even Elma congratulated her and reminded her that only one more blow would killed the mithril golem. Suffering a critical strike wasn't exactly what the mithril golem wanted and that made him even angrier now. It swung its large hand towards Lucy who was practically paralyzed with fear but Elma had a plan for that as well. Elma was quick to react and by using his shadow stomp skill he managed to stop the monster but that was only for a brief moment. The monster seemed to start moving forward despite its movements being restricted but it seemed that it was too big and strong for Elma to stop it with just a stomp. Elma realized that if he hadn't done anything that Lucy would end up dead so he stuck his sword into the shadow as well and he held back as much as he could. And just barely, Elma somehow managed to make the monster stop but that came with another downside. 
the monster's attention was now shifted back to Elma who wasn't very far away and Elma knew that he would have to break his shadow stomp to defend himself. The monster turned his whole body back towards Elma and attacked him with his right arm and Elma was somehow able to deflect his attack to the side with his shield and the mithril golem slipped and fell to the ground. That was a perfect chance for Lucy and Elma told her to attack quickly. Lucy focused as much as she could and she used her dice thrust but when she finally attacked the monster the number she rolled was a 3 and she didn't manage to hit a critical strike. The monster felt a slight pain and while he was turning around his arm made contact with Lucy and sent her flying across the cave. Lucy didn't seem to be hurt but she was sad that she hadn't rolled a 6. Elma knew that Lucy's special skill worked solely on the principles of luck and chance and there was nothing they could do to change it. But now the hardest thing was coming, the mithril golem would never fall into such a trap once again and it would almost be impossible to defeat the monster if it started to regenerate its HP with its automatic recovery. Elma knew that their only condition for victory was Lucy rolling a 6 with her dice thrust skill and landing another critical strike and until that happened Elma had to do everything that was in his power to make them stay alive. Even though Elma's HP was below 50%, he used his life shield skill to try and fight the mithril golem head on to attract its attention. And when the monster noticed him, it turned around to attack him, but Elma once again used his shadow stomp to slow down its movements and it was impossible to stop it because its attack was heading towards Elma now. Elma was happy with the fact that he managed to slow down its speed and thus reduce the impact of the attack that was coming and when the monster hit his shield, Elma had already prepared his shield bash and the impact served as evacuation once again. And while the mithril golem was busy with looking at Elma that was sliding across the cave, Elma shouted out to Lucy that she had an opening for the attack and Lucy wasted no more time and she went at the monster but she ended up rolling a 4 with her dice thrust and the critical strike was nowhere to be seen. Lucy was disheartened to see that her skill had failed her twice in a row but Elma encouraged her and told her not to stop trying until she rolled a 6. Elma planted his feet into the ground and he managed to stop his sliding and he continued with his attack and started running back at the monster. The monster met him with a strong punch but Elma was able to use parry to deflect. However, even though he did succeed at deflecting one of the arms, there was another one coming as well but Elma's hand was completely numb and he had lost all feeling due to the gigantic strength of the mithril golem. Elma somehow managed to take out his shield of madness and place it in front of him in the very last moment but the punch was so strong that he was sent straight into the cave wall. Elma was obviously in a lot of pain but the biggest problem was the fact that he couldn't move and the mithril golem wasn't shifting his focus from him. The monster walked close to Elma with the aim of finishing him once and for all and Elma thought that that would be the end of him as there was no possibility of dodging the next attack. Elma closed his eyes but Lucy finally rolled the 6 and she landed a critical hit onto the mithril golem and the only thing she could do was hope that it was enough to kill it. The monster felt a sharp pain and after a brief moment it collapsed and fell dead on the ground. Elma and Lucy leveled up and Elma congratulated Lucy on killing the monster. Lucy went to check how Elma was doing and she felt sorry for missing twice in a row but Elma wasn't going to let her wallow after a great victory and he told her that two sixes out of four tries was still very very lucky. Lucy felt happier after Elma's last comment and she helped him up. She looked around and she found a huge magic stone that the mithril golem dropped and Lucy thought to herself that it was so big that it would cost around 2 million gold entirely on its own. But while Lucy was thinking about even stronger monsters and the adventurers that were hunting them for gold, Elma was trying to lift something from the rubbles. It took him quite a bit but he finally managed to lift a huge mithril ingot. The thing was so big that Elma had to hold it with both hands and it had a cute little symbol on it which made Elma a little bit confused because the monster itself was everything but cute. But Elma saw the price and he said that the price as well couldn't be cute at all as the market value of a mithril ingot was 
25 million gold coins. When Lucy heard that, she lost her mind and she asked Elma whether that dungeon was in any way special because they found item after item and all were extremely valuable. Elma laughed and said that after defeating monsters as rare as the mithril golem is, it was inevitable that they would be compensated with something as valuable as the mithril ingot and that was the only reason why Elma wanted to risk everything. Which wasn't really the smartest move but now they're fine so I guess it was okay. Elma explained that weapons made out of mithril were the best they could possibly hope for for their levels and even though it would be perfectly okay to sell the ingot, Elma thought that it would be best if they found a blacksmith that could forge them a weapon from it. Lucy was really high hyped about that and Elma knew that they could only get one piece of equipment and it could be either a knife, a sword, armor or a shield. After giving it some thought, Elma decided that it would probably be the best to get a knife for Lucy because that increases their chance of killing monsters more easily and on top of that, Elma felt like he was indebted to Lucy because she was the one that decided to get his smoldering fang of madness. Elma looked at all the items they had farmed up until that point and their total value was around 68 and a half million gold coins and Elma was really happy that they managed to break their record from the Angel's Toy Box dungeon. He thought to himself that it maybe wouldn't be as hard as he initially thought to get a hold of the special skill book for Lucy's crit build. Elmo told Lucy that they could go back to the city of Lacornia and it was only when they started to walk that they realized how deep they had actually gone. Lucy was scared that they would be attacked by some other monsters and Elmo told her that it should be okay as they had defeated the strongest monster after the Dream Lord in the entire centipede pit which was the name of the current dungeon. Elma said that the mithril golem was possibly even stronger than the dream lord and now that they had defeated it and after their levels have gone up, Elma thought that it would be fair to say that they could actually defeat the dream lord as well. They walked for a little while and Elma told Lucy that there was actually a way to go back to the very entrance of the dungeon without having to walk and Lucy was surprised because she didn't know that but Elma reminded her that she knew what he was talking about and that the only way to do so was to defeat the dream lord. Lucy was both shocked and scared because she wasn't really confident as Elma was and Elma explained that the dream lord of that dungeon had low movement speed and if they knew its attacking patterns they could defeat it without too much effort. On top of that Elma said how he thought that the mithril golem would be a much greater problem than it actually was and he thought that they were still in good shape to try and fight the Dream Lord. Our protagonist also said that they had three health potions as well, but he didn't think that they should use them just yet. Elma said that he would want them to return to Lacornia if he was forced to activate his half dead savage dragon skill when they fought the Mithril Golem, but as that wasn't the case, Elma didn't really see a reason why they wouldn't try to defeat the Dream Lord as well. Lucy became more and more intrigued while she listened to what Elma was saying and she asked him to describe the dream lord of that dungeon and Elma said that it was obvious that it was a centipede just like the dungeon name suggested. The real name of the dream lord was Rock Centipede basically Pokemon Onyx and Lucy seemed to be a bit intimidated by the name because she started imagining all sorts of things and Elma told her that they should come back later to try and defeat it. However, Lucy promised Elma that she would keep up with him as much as she could and she shook her head to get rid of all the scary thoughts and she told Elma that she won't be intimidated by an insect that was just larger than usual. I mean, I would argue that regular insect and the larger insect the same type of insect larger one is 10 times more scary when you see all the little legs and stuff like that. Now, they walked over to the entrance to the Dream Lord's room and before they went in, there was something they needed to do and that was to spend their unused skill points. Lucy took out her status menu and she decided that she was going to allocate her skill points into the Fool's Acrobatic Skill Tree and Elma told her that that was a good idea because she would unlock a skill that was a crucial part of every Jester's arsenal 
regardless of their build. And just as Elma said, Lucy was very happy to see she unlocked a skill called Stun Barrage. Elma told her that she should be able to understand how the skill worked just by reading the description, but that she should try it out nonetheless. Elma gave her some advice on how to control herself while she used the skill and Lucy crouched down and she was ready to try it out for the first time. Lucy tried it a couple of times but she thought that there was an opening right when her skill was nearing its end and Elma told her that she just needed to get used to it and that she would later know when it would be best to use such a skill. Elma also added that the rock centipede had a weakness which allowed adventurers to attack it without being hit back and if they could exploit that they should be able to defeat it without a problem. Elma was certain that there wasn't even the slightest chance that they were going to lose because of their levels and their knowledge of the Dream Lord, but there was something behind those doors that they weren't aware of. The Rock Centipede was a Dream Lord that had a lot of health points and great stats all around. It was capable of attacking both at close range and from distance, and its body was huge which benefited a dungeon boss. Before they entered the boss's room, Lucy commented how that was the deepest she had ever gone inside a dungeon and Elma explained that the embryo was actually a wandering lord and therefore they didn't have to go as deep. Elma warned Lucy to stay alert all the time because the fact that they could easily defeat the monster, it was still a dream lord and they could never know what might happen. With that being said, Elma opened the huge doors and when they entered, Lucy was blown away with how beautiful everything looked. It was like a cave with a huge lake inside with shiny stalactites and stalagmites all around. I mean, I know these words on my language. I know they're said the same on English. I mean, like spelling the way you pronounce it. It's almost identical, but I don't know the pronunciation. This is like my attempt to pronounce it correctly, but I have no idea. So please tell me down in the comments below what's the correct pronunciation. Now, Elma noticed the Dream Lord on the ceiling and he told Lucy that there was no time to admire the beauty of the place and just as he said that the rock centipede jumped from the ceiling into the lake and splashed water all around. The monster was now at full display and it was level 60 with crazy 156 health points. Elma laughed and told Lucy to try and bring it down as fast as they could so they could go back to Lacornia. The monster started running towards them and Lucy was a little bit disgusted by all of its legs and limbs. Elma was waiting for the right moment and just when the monster was about to smash him, he moved to the side and the rock centipede ended up hitting a rock head on. Elma commented how such a blow would be fatal and he told Lucy to hop onto his shield so he could propel her with his shield bash. That's exactly what they did and Lucy was sent flying all the way on top of the Dream Lord because that was its biggest weakness. It couldn't attack you and its attacking stats were greatly reduced. The Rock Centipede became restless and Elma thought how that would buy them enough time to kill it now. Before the monster could do anything to get rid of Lucy from its back, Lucy had already used her Stun Barrage skill and she started spinning and slicing away at the monster's back. The monster was in a lot of pain and it started throwing rocks towards Elma and while he was hiding behind his shield, he shouted to Lucy to use her skill once again. Lucy listened to what Elma had just said and with another stun barrage, she killed the rock centipede and their levels had gone up once again. Lucy commented that the mithril golem was much harder to defeat or maybe it was easy to defeat the rock centipede because Elma knew its weakness. Our protagonist told Lucy to climb down from the dead monster but she told Elma how its body was scorching hot and Elma didn't know the reason behind that. He couldn't remember a thing happening in the game when the monster's bodies were disappearing but it could be due to the rock centipede size. But Elma finally understood what was happening and he shouted out to Lucy to climb down as quickly as she possibly could because the monster wasn't dead yet. Lucy couldn't really hear him from all the smoke and the sounds that the supposedly dead Dream Lord was emitting and she ended up hurt when the heat finally erupted and she was sent flying. Elma caught her but he was completely shocked with what just happened as that wasn't possible in the game. What actually happened was that the rock centipede, a Dream Lord, had evolved right 
right in front of their eyes. We see Elma holding Lucy in his hands and he apologized to her for persuading her to fight the Dream Lord. When Lucy opened her eyes, she couldn't believe what she was seeing in front of her and that's her first time witnessing a monster evolution with her own very eyes. Elma knew about evolutions quite a bit and he knew that only some monsters were able to evolve in the first place. On top of that, those monsters needed to meet certain conditions for their evolutions and those conditions varied from monster to monster. Elma knew about the condition that a rock centipede needed and they were the following. It needed to eat quite a substantial amount of magic stones and adventurous corpses and only when it was killed it would evolve. There was nothing strange with that as that was normal for almost every gym lord. However, those requirements were very hard for the monster to meet as it needed to consume a lot of adventurers and to be able to do that, the dream lord needed to exit his boss room and become a wandering lord. Elma knew that that wasn't the case and that the centipede pit had spawned just a couple of days ago and if there was a large number of deaths, the guild would put that on the notice board for sure. It seemed that the rules were different in the real world than the ones that Elma remembered from the game, but he thought that only viable explanation was that someone fulfilled all of those conditions deliberately for some reason, but even that theory had some holes, like why would anybody do that in the first place, and Elma doubted that anyone knew about these conditions to begin with. But what worried him the most was the fact that he and Lucy now had to fight an evolved dream lord and it was all his fault. Elma apologized for not being able to anticipate that and Lucy told him that they would be fine if they used the same strategy from moments ago. But Elma told her that that strategy wouldn't work now as the Dream Lord stats had gone through the roof and that they could only try using dice thrust to roll sixes and even that would take too long if they weren't lucky which meant that the risk of losing their lives was greater than ever. The Rock Centipede had evolved into a death armed monster whose level was 75 with a whopping 270 24 health points, which was almost double from its previous form. The monster let out a loud shriek, and while Lucy was scared to death, Elma shouted to her to move as that shriek always came before it attacked. And just as Elma said that, the monster went for the attack and Elma was able to push Lucy to safety in the nick of time. The monster crashed into the stones, but what would make it unconscious before now had no effect and Elma realized that it would be pointless to try and run as the monster would definitely catch up to them and finish them off. Elma's face showed clear signs of worry and anxiety too and he told Lucy that they might have only one small chance to defeat the monster and he asked her whether or not she was willing to try it out. They talked for some time and even though we don't know the content of their conversation for now, it seemed that they had reached an agreement but Lucy was still worried and she asked Elma whether everything would be okay. Our protagonist just stood there silently without saying a thing because he knew that to take down such a monster he would need to perform a special attack of the heavy knight class called the balance breaker and the look on Elma's face told everything about that task's difficulty. Elma had taken everything about the monster into account and he knew that their only chance of ever defeating the evolved dream lord was for him to reproduce the strongest weapon of the heavy knight class which wasn't an easy task at all. Lucy saw how worried Elma was and even though she was more scared than he was she gripped her fists and she told Elma that she was going to do everything that was in her power to help him and even though Elma was scared as well, he managed to smile and thank Lucy for her help. Elma explained that because their levels were lower than that of the dungeon boss by a lot, they would only have a single chance to try and execute that attack successfully. But while they talked, the monster started channeling a long range attack and Elma quickly told Lucy to take cover behind the rock. They barely managed to hide when the monster fired off sharp rock arrows at them, which substantially damaged the rock they were hiding behind. Lucy was scared but she asked Elma what she could do to help him and Elma said that he was going to propel her behind the monster with his shield bash and what she needed to do was to attack the monster's tail when she saw an opening. Elma believed that she could manage to do it and Lucy was determined to succeed even once. The monster was looking at two rocks and it knew that Elma and Lucy were hiding behind one of them and it was getting ready to headbutt one of them and the monster hesitated a bit because it needed to make a decision. The very next moment, with blinding speed, it charged into one of the rocks but... Luckily, Elma and Lucy had changed their positions and when the monster lifted its head from the rubble, it could only see Lucy sitting on top of Elma's shield of madness, ready to be sent through the air. 
Elma used his shield bash and Lucy was fired off like a bullet. The monster noticed her and immediately started to go after her, but Elma reacted quickly as well and he threw a magic stone in the air which ended up bursting in mid-air, sending a barrage of needles at the dream lord to make the monster focus at him. Their plan to get Lucy behind the monster worked, but Elma knew that now he had to fight perfectly to buy Lucy enough time and to give her an opening. The monster attacked him and Elma managed to dodge the attack and only then did he realize that his health points were below 20% and that he could activate his half dead savage dragon skill. That was his only trump card and Elma knew that if he were to make the slightest of errors he would end up straight up dying there. Elma was now face to face with death arm boss and even though he knew that his special skill doubled his agility stats, when the dream lord attacked him he managed to dodge the attack but Elma realized that the dream lord was still way way faster than he was. As the dream lord started chasing Elma, he had no other option but to run now. The monster nearly caught up to him when Elma found a smaller gap in the cave where he could barely fit and he went for it. And in the nick of time Elma managed to slide through and the death arm crashed into the cave walls as he tried to push through them. Elma barely escaped but the dream lord was persistent and with its incredible power it destroyed the wall and went through using its extraordinary force. Elma knew he had to continue running away in search of such gaps and he was lucky to find another one that would slow the monster down even by a little bit. That brief moment was enough for Elma to catch a breath he so desperately needed to be able to dodge the next attack that came right after. The monster was clearly raging with anger and there was no sign he was going to stop until it killed Elma. But Elma had his own reasons to keep fighting and he took the magic stone that exploded into a bright flash and threw it at the monster. When the dream lord recovered from the flash it turned around and started channeling its spell once again. Elma knew that its death needles were flying at extreme speeds and his life shield would be useless against them even if he got hit by only one of them. Even if it was just a tiny scratch that alone would be lethal. And just when the monster was about to fire its special skill Elma ran towards it as that was the only gap he had to try to avoid certain death. When he came close enough he jumped into the air and used his shield bash to propel himself behind the monster and the dream lord ended up firing off its special skill into empty space. Elma had managed to land on some high ground but the monster quickly realized its attack had missed its target and it quickly turned its focus back to Elma. Elma was a bit worried that the monster might have been too fast that time and that he was about to be hit but Lucy followed the entire situation and she found an opening when the monster turned towards Elma. Its tail was exposed and luckily Lucy had rolled a 6 with her dice thrust and she managed to land a critical strike on the dream lord. She was really happy about that but her face didn't show that at all because it was a life or death situation and the monster felt a sharp pain and it let out a deafening cry because of that. Elma was really satisfied with the way Lucy was performing and he knew that the tail was the only place that the death armed could take damage from as its whole body was completely covered in thick armor which was its greatest defense. As their positions were the complete opposite from the start of the fight, Elma was now having the high ground and Lucy was down on the same level as the monster, Elma thought that they were in a perfect position to try and take down the death armed. Both Elma and Lucy were completely dialed in and they haven't given up yet. However, 100 feet of the death arm started moving simultaneously and the monster shifted its head back towards Lucy which scared her to death. The monster probably figured out that it was her who attacked it and even though Lucy was happy she succeeded, she didn't know what to do now because she was about to get attacked. Elma quickly shouted out that she should try to run as fast as she could around the huge boulder that was right next to her. Lucy Lucy immediately started running and without turning back to take a look she could hear the monster coming after her. Elma knew how fast the monster was but Lucy had been lucky because she stood right at the end of its tail and she had the advantage because of the boulder. While Lucy was running around the boulder Elma used that time to hop from one boulder to the next one in search for a perfect spot from where he could finally find the death arm's weakness. But Lucy was shouting like crazy she was nearing her body's limit and she asked Elma for another piece of advice advice because she didn't know what to do now. Elma realized that the boulder was just as big as the monster was long and that gave him an idea. 
He saw that Lucy was just behind the monster's tail and immediately after Lucy, the monster was rushing at full speed. Elma quickly yelled out that Lucy should try to jump onto the monster's tail and try to use it as a base from which she could jump even higher into the air. Lucy understood what Elma told her and that's exactly what she did. The monster's focus was solely on Lucy as it tried to split her in half with its sharp teeth the monster ended up biting off its own tail because Lucy managed to jump in the very last moment. As everything happened in an instant, it took the monster a second or two to realize it had bitten off its own tail. When the monster realized what just happened, that's when the pain started to kick in and the monster let out such a cry that it ended up stunning itself. Lucy was even too scared to see what happened, but somehow she mustered up the courage to peep out and she was completely shocked to see that she managed to do what Elma asked of her. Elma was very happy with the outcome and he realized that everything was up to him now and his face went completely serious. Elma spent 10 skill points onto his smoldering fang of madness skill tree to unlock a skill called Relentless Vigor. What that skill did was that it turned the user's defensive stats to zero and converted all of them into attacking stats. The only downsides were that the user needed to be at least at 50% of his health points and while the skill was active it consumed mana points all the while. Elma explained that because the defensive stats of other classes were really low, no one ever thought much about that skill and it was considered a skill with extraordinary risks and minimum rewards. But the skill was perfect for a heavy knight that specialized in defense and what was even more special was that the effect of that skill was calculated before the half dead savage dragon skill. That meant that the effects stacked up on top of each other and the stats would be doubled only when the defensive stats were turned into attacking ones. And with those two skills and Elma's new equipment combined, his attacking power was 277 points and I must admit that he looked really giga chat. Even Lucy was completely shocked to her core. While the Dream Lord was still waiting, Elma was determined to end the fight with one powerful blow. Elma's body buzzing with electricity and Lucy has never seen him like that. Elma jumped off from his high ground and because his mana points were rapidly decreasing, he knew that he wouldn't be able to keep using his relentless vigor for much longer. Elma was grateful to Lucy because she had led him to where they were and while he was flying towards the death armed, Elma thought to himself how none of its extraordinary stats mattered anymore. But while Elma was mid-air, the monster recovered from being stunned and Lucy was worried about Elma because the death armed immediately started channeling its death needle skill. Because it was stunned for quite a while and because he didn't have much time, the monster was able to produce only one needle, but even though it was a single needle, it was going straight towards Elma. Lucy shouted out because she thought that it was definitely going to hit him, but Elma was calm and composed and he waited for the very last moment to move his head towards his left hand side. Elma had calculated that perfectly and he dodged the needle with utmost grace and by grabbing his black steel sword with both of his hands Elma struck the monster with full force. His sword went through the death armed thick armor like it was butter and while the monster was going through its final moments its body started glowing and emitting light. The whole cave became bright for a brief moment and the next thing Elma and Lucy knew was that the monster's head had been split from its giant body which meant that that they had managed to defeat it. It was just like Elma said and it really took him one strike to defeat the strongest monster they had faced up until this moment. Elma realized his relentless vigor effect and killing the death armed earned them 4057 experience points which raised Elma's level all the way from 54 to 62. He was really happy with their victory and he joked how he would never gamble with their lives and that he knew that they were definitely going to win and Lucy was still baffled with the fact that Elma cut the monster's head off with a single blow. I mean bro, as usual in mangas, main characters are crazy OP and I like it, it's really fun to watch him defeat everybody with no problem, but reading a manga like this one every now and then where your main character isn't crazy OP but he has to struggle and find a way to defeat monsters, I like it, it's kinda refreshing. Now back to the story. As the death arm's body started to disintegrate, Lucy ran towards Elma to congratulate him on his amazing feat. Lucy seemed really happy and even though Elma knew that the whole thing was over and that they were victorious, he was still sorry that he 
failed to take the possibility of the Dream Lord evolving into consideration and that led them to being in grave danger. Lucy tried to explain that he shouldn't apologize because they have won and Elma thanked Lucy and said that she was just as worthy of praise as he was. Lucy was really happy and she even imitated Elma's amazing strike with her little knife and Elma explained that even though his relentless vigor skill is powerful, he was able only to use it that one time because the monster has been stunned and Lucy was the one responsible for that. Elma also remembered that he would have died if his life shield skill hadn't been active as well when the monster fired off that one death needle. What ended up happening after Elma took down the monster was that he earned a title called the Nightmare Killer and Lucy checked her status and she had it too. Elma explained that that was a really special title and that almost no one had it because what they just managed to do was almost impossible. The title is given out to adventurers that managed to defeat an evolved dream lord and the effect that the title had for its users was a 7% increase in attack stats while the user fought against dream masters. Elma also explained that it was almost impossible to get one because no one in their right mind would battle against a dream lord if they knew that it had met all the conditions for it to evolve and they had the bad luck of being the ones to see that that was the case with the rock centipede but in the end that title was their reward. But Elma also added that they should quickly collect the magic stones and that they should prepare themselves to be teleported back to the dungeon's entrance. While Elma was searching for the magic stones in the cave's lake, it seemed that Lucy had found something much more valuable. She shouted out to Elma who was a bit confused as why Lucy was so excited and then Lucy showed him that the dream lord had dropped an item. What Lucy held in her hands was the death arms knife which was estimated at a around 28 million gold coins. On top of it being valuable, the knife gave the user a big boost in attack stats and it even had a slight chance to poison the enemies. Elmo was completely shocked with another drop and even though he knew that Lucy's luck skill upped their chances for rare drops, Elma thought that they were really really lucky. He also explained that the special poison effect that the knife had was also affected by the user's luck stats and that was a perfect weapon for Lucy because if the effect triggered when she used her stun barrage, that would up their chances of victory by a significant amount. Elma thought to himself that he wouldn't need to go to a blacksmith if he had gotten a similar weapon and Lucy was completely baffled with the weapon's price and she even wanted to get rid of it because she had never held anything more valuable than that and Elma had to stop her from doing so. Elma knew that she was only shocked because of the knife's value and when they picked up all of the other magic stones that were dropped by the Dream Lord, they were teleported back to the dungeon's entrance and from there it was an easy journey back to the city of Lacornia. When they arrived, everyone looked at the two of them not because everyone knew that they had cleared the centipede pit dungeon, no 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 one was aware of that just yet. The reason why everyone stared at them was the fact that Lucy was acting really sus because she couldn't calm herself down after she realized how much money they had earned and Elma didn't know how to calm her down either. Their first and most important stop was the Adventurer's Guild at Lacornia. Elma went straight to the reception and he said that apart from wanting to exchange their magic stones for gold, they also wanted to have a conversation with the Guildmaster because something bad had happened. The reason why Elma wanted to see the Guildmaster was the fact that they had just fought and defeated an evolved Dream Lord and Elma knew that the Guild had to know about that if there were a lot of dead adventurers in the past couple of days and they needed to report that to the public public to see and Elma was determined to point out their mistake to the entire guild. Elma and Lucy show their ID cards and the receptionist wasn't really too amazed with the fact that they were a party of D-rank heavy knight and D-rank jester. The receptionist started talking to them in a humiliating tone and Lucy got angry on the spot but the receptionist lady just continued with her story of how the city of Lacornia had the reputation of producing exceptionally strong adventurers for quite some time. Lucy was still frowning and Elma told her that it would probably be better if he handled the talking part. Elma knew that 
their request to see the guildmaster was a bit outrageous and he apologized for that, but he asked the receptionist to just listen to what they had to say. Elmo said that the situation wasn't simple and that it would probably pass unnoticed if he was the one to publicly announce it instead of the guild doing that. The receptionist still looked down on them and she even called them countryside adventurers and she said how she wasn't really happy with the idea of letting them see the guildmaster. She added that it wasn't rare that the adventurers in their guild earned millions of gold worth in just one reward. And the last thing that the receptionist told them was that the guildmaster was too busy to make time to talk to two of them. Elmo was disappointed with her response, but he was expecting something like that nonetheless, and he reached out into his inventory and took out the magic stones from their last expedition and kindly asked the receptionist to inspect them and pay them their rewards. After the receptionist finished with the inspection of the magic stones, she was completely baffled at the fact that they were worth somewhere around 10 million gold. She didn't know what to do and she asked them to wait a moment while she checked with the higher ups. Elma and Lucy were taken to another room and they saw the receptionist talk to another guild staff member about their earned reward. Even though the reward had been a large sum, what ended up shocking the man the most was the fact that they were both D-rank adventurers. Elma was content with the fact that they managed to get themselves an appointment with the guild master and he didn't really care how they achieved that. The fact that the meeting was set was enough for him. So he thought to himself that they would be subject to some procedures as it was almost impossible for D-rank adventurers to earn that big of a reward, but that didn't happen and they had even gotten an appointment with the guildmaster that was a lady. The receptionist took Elma and Lucy to the guildmaster's room and before entering, she knocked on the door twice and informed a woman called Harlane that she had brought the two adventurers. Harlane told the receptionist that there wouldn't be a problem and that she could open the door to let them inside and before they entered, the receptionist apologized to Elma and Lucy for misunderstanding. Elma and Lucy had been admitted inside and once they entered the room, they saw a beautiful woman holding a folding fan in her right hand. The guildmaster Harlane was a bit surprised to see a party consisting of a heavy knight and a jester as that wasn't a sight that could be seen that often. Harlane asked the receptionist about them and when the receptionist said that they were d rank adventurers from Rondelm, Harlan's facial expression completely changed for the worse. The receptionist quickly tried to explain how they had just defeated the level 60 rock centipede, which wasn't something that the rank adventurers usually did, and that's why they seemed a bit special. That piece of information intrigued Harleen and as she folded her fan, she sat behind her desk and told Elma that she was going to listen to what they had to say. Elma was satisfied with the fact that they would get a chance to share their concerns, but Elma was feeling a bit uncomfortable because Harleen was a woman with extraordinary observation skills and he felt completely naked in front of her, like she knew all of his secrets. Harleen said that defeating a dream lord was sometimes even hard for C-rank adventurers and the fact that they had managed to do that only meant that they wanted to go up in the ranking. Harleen said that Elma and Lucy were either rushing to fame or to their deaths and she asked Elma why he was so confident in the heavy knight class and in his world knowledge. Elma's anxiety was building up because Harleen could see right through them and Elma initially thought that that's what it took to be a guild master in a city such as Lacornia. But there was something that kept telling him that there was more to her than meets the eyes. Harleen also commented on how Elma behaved and how elegant he looked which led her to ask Elma whether he was a noble or whether or not the Lord of Rondel had a son that was around his age. Even though Elma was panicking inside, looking at him no one could tell, but just a quick glimpse at Lucy and everything would be crystal clear and with that being said, Elma knew that there was no point in lying as Harleen would see right through them. Elma introduced himself and Lucy and said how they lived through a strange occurrence in the centipede pit and that they came to report about that. Both of them bowed down as to express thanks for Harleen for choosing to listen to what they had to say and she replied replied with introducing herself even though she wanted to ask Elma some other questions. Harleen also added that she was a distant cousin of the famous Marquise Harold's family and Elma thought to himself that her being a noble explained a lot of things. It seemed that in the city of Lacornia, the royal family had appointed one of their family members so they could be well connected. Harleen congratulated them on clearing
clearing the dungeon and she commented how a lot of adventurers stayed away from it because of the rock centipede being the dream lord. Lucy mentioned how that was only the monster's primary form and as soon as Harleen heard that, her behavior changed and Elma knew that Lucy should have kept quiet about that. Elma was a bit worried about telling Harleen too much about the world because there was a chance that she might even know things from his previous life and the thing that scared Elma the most was the fact that Harleen was only a part of the branch family and Elma thought to himself that someone from her family might have completed all of the conditions for the rock centipede's evolution. Elma thought how that was very probable because the nobles wanted to find out how the world functioned and having a family member as the guild master made them manipulate the adventurers and change the real information. Harleen was very sharp and she wasn't giving Elma enough time to think as she wanted to see what Elma wanted to talk about and after that Elma started suspecting that maybe she was the person that was responsible for the Dream Lord's evolution. Harleen started taunting them by asking them if they had made their story up just so they could share a moment with her and she told Elma how she wasn't someone they could easily trick. And while Elma was racking his brain by thinking about what she meant by that, he was completely unable to understand her true motives. Because Elma was suspecting that Harleen had her fingers in the whole thing, he decided to just tell Harleen what happened without expressing any concerns they had and he ended up telling her how they ended up fighting against an evolved rock centipede and Harleen didn't really seem that much affected having heard that. Elma also explained that that wasn't the only thing odd they saw but it was the most concerning one because the centipede pit dungeon wasn't active for a long time and that's what he wanted to tell her in the first place. When Elma tried to explain the evolution of the Dream Lord, Harleen interrupted him by a loud shout. She couldn't believe that such a thing happened because that dungeon had appeared just half a month ago and Elma started suspecting that Harleen was acting. But she continued to shout in a very concerned way and she wanted to confirm their statements because she wanted to have a valid report. But the way Harleen was acting made Elma doubt his suspicion but he still had that option at the back of his mind because she was still a member of the Harold Wed household. Elma told her how what he had just said was the truth and Harleen was now angry at her receptionist Matilda for not informing her of such a thing before but in Matilda's defense that was her first time hearing that information as well. But Matilda not knowing how big of a threat an evolved dream lord could be asked Harleen whether or not that was such a huge problem which ended up sending Harleen into another crazy shouting spree. She explained that it was a ginormous problem because a level 60 monster became a lot stronger and had gained around 20 levels in an instant and on top of that the monster was a dream lord and that in itself was a reason for concern. While Harleen went on to shout at her receptionist about the whole thing, Elma wondered whether she was really acting this whole thing up. Harleen picked up her cup of tea but she dropped it which caught Matilda by surprise. Harleen then turned towards Elma and she said how she was glad that they were able to get out and she wanted to ask them whether there were any other survivors and how many people have died and whether the Dream Lord became a Wandering Lord as well. Elma and Lucy stood there rather confused and Elma explained that they had already defeated the monster on their own and even though Elma mentioned that in the beginning, it seemed that Harleen didn't catch that information and she was once again blown away and left completely speechless. While Harleen was racking her head about how that could be possible for a party of two D-rank adventurers who had mediocre equipment and one of the worst classes, Elma thought to himself how there was no chance that Harleen had anything to do with meeting the monster's evolution conditions. Harleen asked Matilda about the magic stone and Matilda explained how she was the one to inspect it and to stash it in the guild's warehouse. Harleen was so lost and confused that she was reaching for the cup she had just spilled and Matilda had to remind her about what happened just a couple of seconds ago. Harleen took a moment to compose herself and told Matilda to fetch it for her and with it she meant the magic stone but Matilda asked her whether she thought about the tea which angered Harleen once again. Lucy told Elma how they were scared of the meeting with the guildmaster but it seemed that there was no need for that and Harleen said that if the monster was defeated there was no need for special measures. Harleen said how they were an interesting party but she was still surprised with the fact that such a thing had happened in the centipede pit. 
Ella finally asked Harlene if she maybe knew what could have possibly caused the monster to evolve and Harlene said that she did have some suspicions but that she wasn't certified to talk about them. But there was one thing that she was going to tell them and that was how there had been an unusual large number of strange monsters in the Great Forbidden Forest lately. Elma knew about that because that area was left unsupervised for a long time and that's the reason why monsters were appearing outside dream holes but Elma asked Harlene whether a similar thing happened happened around the cornea. Harleen complimented Elma on his quick wits but said that she couldn't say anything more on that matter. She only added that she was going to take the matter very seriously and she thanked them for their report. Elma and Lucy bowed down and Elma thought to himself that something didn't add up and that a dream lord's evolution must have been designed by someone. Harleen was getting impatient and just then Matilda walked in the room carrying both the magic stone and the tea and Harleen once again lost her composure because she never asked for another cup of tea. Elma was happy that they had been able to talk to the guildmaster, however that conversation didn't bear any fruit as they haven't learned anything new about the evolution of the dream lord. Elma was about to say that they were leaving when Harleen stopped them and by saying how she believed their story, she wanted to say how she thought that they were really strong and because of that she wanted to promote Elma and Lucy to be rank adventurers which surprised both Elma and Lucy and Matilda the receptionist as well. The receptionist asked Harleen whether that would be an okay thing to do and Harleen explained that even if it wasn't okay there could be no one that could stop her because she was appointed as a guild master of Lacornia by the head of the royal family. Elma was really grateful but he thought there was a catch with what Harleen had just said and that's that's why he asked her if she wanted something in return from them. Harleen explained that he was being silly and that she did that because it was her job to reward great adventurers like them as long as they kept working as adventurers. Harleen said how that was a great thing both for the guild at Lacornia and the whole country and Lucy was really amazed by those words. Harleen said that there was only one more thing she wanted to ask them and that was to offer them a job at the guild because they were looking for more B rank adventurers and Elma explained that even though they were really grateful for their promotions, they just couldn't accept working for anyone and they remained normal adventurers. Elma and Lucy left the guild and as they were walking through the city streets, Elma said that they should look for a blacksmith to see what they could do with the mithril ink that they've gotten. But Lucy was a bit concerned about the fact that Elma was telling her to keep the special drop from the death armored. Elma explained that in addition to the knife being a really great item with great attacking stats, he also added that it would be a great fit for Lucy because of the chance to poison their enemies which would really up their chances of defeating them in the future. But even though that was all true, Lucy couldn't stop thinking about how much delicious food they could eat if they were to sell it because the knife was priced at 28 million gold coins at the market and Lucy reminded Elma that she was talking about delicious food plus the desserts, Elma said that they could find a restaurant to eat but before anything he wanted to discuss something with her. Elma asked Lucy if it was okay with her if they used both the mithril ingot and the black steel ingot for Elma's weapon and armor and Lucy said that she didn't mind one bit. Even though forging equipment from such materials wasn't going to be neither easy nor cheap, Elma and Lucy were happy with the fact that their equipment was starting to look a lot more like high-end endgame equipment. Elma explained that it would be best if they found a blacksmith with a high level because they had the most experience but he wasn't really sure that they would be able to find one in the city of Lacornia because it was the city of adventurers after all. He also explained that for a blacksmith to be able to process such ingots that were dropped in dungeons, the blacksmith would need a special skill tree and there wasn't a lot of them that were capable of doing that and that made such blacksmiths even more valuable. With that said, Elma and Lucy went through the whole city but they weren't able to find any blacksmiths that were over the level 40 and on top of that they found out that the noble families hired all of the best blacksmiths for their personal needs. After almost a full day of wandering the streets, Elma and Lucy stumbled across one blacksmith but because the man was really hard to negotiate with, Elma didn't actually end up making a deal with him and they left his forge. He explained how that blacksmith had a weird personality trait and that was when he was cranky or angry, he couldn't 
accept any job, no matter how much money he was being offered. Their search for a good blacksmith had led them to the countryside, and they came across an old and damaged shed. Assuming by the looks of it, Elma didn't think that they would have any luck in there as well, but Lucy went to knock on the door nonetheless. She slid the door a bit and carefully said how they were looking for a good blacksmith named Mr. Berga and she was interrupted by an old man that started shouting at her because he thought that she was someone else that had been bothering him for a long time. When Mr. Berga raised his head from the job he was doing and saw Elma and Lucy, he apologized for shouting and explained why he was upset. The old man had quite a peculiar style, he worked only in his underwear and the only other garment or apparel he had on him were his gloves and his boots. I mean this kind of reminds me of Walter White when he started cooking <laughs> for the first First time. Now Elma thought to himself how he should approach the old man with extra care and that's why he tried saying how he was sorry that a person of his caliber had to deal with a lot of strange adventurers that had even stranger tasks for him and that riled up the man even more. Mr. Berger was now shouting at Elma for flattering him without meaning it and Elma realized that he would be a bit hard to make a deal with. Mr. Berger explained that he was someone who took commissions from adventurers but there were two things he would never accept and and those were young adventurers that were too proud of themselves and thought they were high and mighty. And the other thing were people who tried to say nice things to him without standing behind their words. Mr. Berga looked at Elma and he jokingly said that he had at least one of those two things he mentioned. And Elma was a bit confused because he was shouted at for trying to be a bit more polite than he would usually be. Lucy asked Berga whether there was a certain adventurer that was bugging him. And Berga explained that there was a mage warrior that was rude to him and that wanted him to make a sword. The adventurer even said how money wasn't the problem, but when Berga thought about that, he shouted even more and said how he wouldn't live in such an old shed if he cared about money at all. Hearing that made Elma think how they would never strike a deal with Berga because he was a stubborn old man and when they said that they were leaving, Berga said that they seemed clever enough not to let old men talk for too long and he told them to follow him. Elba wasn't really that interested and he asked if Lucy wanted to go with him and Lucy said how he probably only wanted someone to talk to. But Berga said that he could perfectly hear what they were talking about and said that the choice was theirs. After all, they decided to follow Berga and they were a bit impressed with the way his hidden forge looked like. Berga started saying how a lot of adventurers nowadays were relying on the quality of their equipment instead of on their abilities and skills and even if the equipment was made by someone like him, that was the wrong way to go about things. While Berger talked, Elmo wasn't sensing an end to his story and he wondered for how much longer they would have to listen to him speak. Berger realized that Elma and Lucy excelled in defense and agility and that their classes were difficult to level up. So he said how they might have made some improvements to their weapons because those could be bought, but Berger said that that shouldn't be a reason for them to lose sight of their goals and try to reach great success at high risks. Elma knew that Berga was only giving them a warning by saying all that, but Elma said that they came there with a job offer and they wanted to present it to Berga. Berga thought to himself how he wouldn't change his mind, but Elma took out the mithril ingot and placed it in front of Berga by saying how he wanted a sword to be made out of that ingot. Upon seeing it, Berga became a bit confused and after closely inspecting the ingot, he realized that it was indeed mithril. Berga thought to himself how he couldn't back away from such a task as he was a blacksmith after all, but that would also be against his beliefs of working for unworthy adventurers and he decided that he couldn't accept the job as it was. Elma wanted to show Berga that they weren't just all talk and he explained how they managed to defeat the mithril golem on their own and how they were b rank adventurers. Berga thought to himself that if they managed to do such an amazing feat with their current equipment that there might be something special about them and he told them that they barely passed his test with the accent on barely, barely passed the test. <laughs> Lucy and Elma were delighted by the old man's words and Lucy reminded Elma how they could even give him the special rune of destruction so Berga could infuse it into the sword and when Berga saw how rare the items they had were, he thought to himself how he had a big project in front of him. Now, he commented how it was good that Elma decided to change his poor equipment 
in that they finally managed to make a deal. Berger was going to forge a mithril sword with an embedded rune and black steel armor for a total of 4 million gold. As that would take a couple of hours to complete, Elma and Lucy went through Lacorna's famous sites and even when they were enjoying the time they had, they were focused on gathering all sorts of informations. And after some time, they came back to Berger's forge and they found that his door was open. When they came nearer, they could hear that Berger was being shouted at because he wasn't going to sell Elma's sword. Elma and Lucy realized that they might have a problem and they quickly entered Berga's shed and they were ready for a fight. But when they entered, they could hear the person talking but they couldn't see him and Elma thought that it was a special skill and the mage warrior made fun of both Elma and Berga because he thought that Elma was a weak adventurer and that after all, Berga accepted the job as even he needed money after all. It turned out that the reason why Elma couldn't see the mage warrior wasn't due to a special skill but rather because the mage warrior was a childlike girl and she was angry because she thought that Elma was making fun of her height. Elma realized that she must have been over 15 because she had clearly gone through the divine blessing ceremony and the girl said that she was 17 years old. Why are they always on the age limit of me going to jail and me being a perfect upstanding normal citizen? The girl clearly pissed off, asked Elma and Lucy if they had never heard of a spellblade called Black Flame Blade. Elma did hear that name while they were collecting information throughout Lacornia, and it seemed that that spellblade was one of very few A-rank adventurers. The little girl finally introduced herself as the number one disciple of Black Flame Blade and that her name was Hildy, but her introduction didn't amaze Elma that much. The girl thought to herself that it was good that Elma was there because she thought that Elma would agree on selling his mithril sword, but Elma kindly declined. Hildy tried saying how she would pay him 30 million gold, which she thought would be enough for someone like Elma, but Elma kindly explained that he didn't care about the money and he wasn't going to sell his mithril sword to anyone. That angered Hildy and she even drew her sword at Elma, who had to quickly dodge her strike. Lucy was scared and Hildy really wanted that sword, that she was willing to draw blood for it and Lucy asked her if maybe she was normal or maybe insane. <laughs> Even though Hildy was acting like she was holding back her power, Elma told her that attacking people by surprise didn't show any skill whatsoever. That angered Hildy even more and she challenged Elma to a duel if he was willing to bet his mithril sword. Elma wanted to know what was in it for him and Hildy said that if he won he could keep the sword and that she would even pay him the full market price of the sword as well. Berga tried to warn Elma that he shouldn't accept the challenge as spell swords excelled in one-on-one -on -one duels but Elma was fine with her conditions and he accepted her challenge. Lucy was really shocked to hear that and she tried to explain to Elma how even she was aware that spell swords couldn't be beaten in one-on-one -on -one fights. Elma said that Hildy pissed him off quite a bit and he wanted to make her pay and Hildy said that she would bring an official from the guild so everything was completely legitimate. And when Hildy went to fetch someone from the guild that would observe the whole thing, Elma, Lucy and Berga went outside to wait for them. Elma used his life shield skill and Berga didn't understand why he would use it outside of battle and Elma confused him even more by saying that the reason was health points management. Lucy realized that Elma was going to rely on his half-dead savage dragon skill and Elma explained that it would be pointless if he used relentless vigor because increasing his attacking stats by that much would be an overkill and because a spell sword could attack him from distance with magic attacks so making his defensive stats zero also wasn't a really good idea. That was one of the reasons why spell swords were great fighters but they could also use their weapons really well. Berger reminded Elma that he still could back off but Elma hated the way Hildy behaved so he wanted to make her pay and for the first time Lucy was afraid of the way Elma's face looked like. With that being said Hildy came back fuming with anger and she brought Matilda the receptionist with her and after everyone was present the battle was about to start. Elma was aware of the fact that for a heavy night fighting a spell sword was the worst possible situation they could be in because spell swords could use both long and mid range attacks and they were good in close combat as well. But Elma thought to himself that if he could somehow endanger the one predisposition Hildy had, that he could win the fight then. 
So he had something he wanted to ask Matilda before the fight started and Matilda asked him what it was. Ella wanted to know what would happen if one of the participants in the challenge gets injured as that was a probable outcome in a fight like that. Matilda explained that the guild knew that very well and they thought that adventurers had to be aware of the risks when they propose or accept such challenges and that if Elma was scared he could still cancel the whole thing but Elma said that he wasn't afraid or anything. He just wanted to make sure that he wouldn't be punished if he were to injure or maybe even possibly kill Hildy. Hildy didn't let herself be affected by what she thought was a provocation from Elma's side and with that all being said the fight was started by Matilda. Hildy immediately went after Elma, but Elma scared her off by using his life shield to lower his health points and by casting half dead savage dragon immediately after. Hildy never saw such a skill and Elma gripped his sword a bit more tightly and used his relentless figure as well. Lucy was shocked that Elma used it even though he said how it would be too dangerous and Hildy was thinking both about Elma's skill and Lucy's reaction. But she reached out her hand and started channeling her own skills and she wanted to fight the whole battle from distance. However, Elma had thoughts of his own as well and he raised his sword which scared Hildy because she could sense immense power coming from Elma. The very next moment, Elma unleashed a devastating attack that was still controlled as the attack stopped right before killing Hildy and both Hildy and everyone else were completely shocked by what they saw. Hildy backed away because that attack scared her but Elma calmly walked towards her which scared her even more. Elma was dead serious and Hildy sensed that his power was out of her league and that made her even drop her own weapon. However, it didn't seem that Elma was going to stop and Hildy started shouting how she was giving up and admitted defeat. That was the predisposition Elma talked about. The spell sword was a safe class as long as they could keep distance and they tried to keep their safety by attacking with long range attacks. Elma knew that if he could somehow endanger Hildy's safety that she would give up and that ended up being true after all. Everyone was still stunned by what they had seen and Elma asked Matilda if she could declare the winner of the fight and while Hildy was still on the ground Matilda declared Elma as the winner. Hildy was fuming with rage because Elma didn't stop when she asked him to and Matilda felt responsible to say that she observed the whole fight and that Hildy didn't have a valid argument to start another fight or want a rematch and that if she didn't comply with agreed conditions, the guild would take appropriate measures against her. Hildy knew that perfectly well and she only asked Elma if he would lower the bet to 20 million gold from the initial 30 million but Elma wasn't even thinking of doing something like that. Berga had also something important to say and he showed the mithril sword to Elma and said that its price wasn't 30 million gold and that everyone should take a look at it for themselves. When Hildy saw the real price of the sword she went crazy. The real market value of the mithril sword was 51 and a half million gold and she didn't want to pay that much so she went down on her knees to give Elma to, to beg Elma to beg Elma to settle on 40 million gold. Elma felt zero compassion towards her and Lucy said how she started to feel her pain. Now after two days when Elma and Lucy went to visit the guild, Matilda told them that Hildy had paid the 50 million gold she owed them and Elma was surprised with how fast the whole thing went. Matilda then explained that when the guild was involved into something, they had their own ways to make adventurers pay. When Elma and Lucy started leaving the guild, Hildy caught up to them and she shouted that she would get her money back from them and in her hands she was holding some beginner's equipment and Elma realized that she had to sell her weapon and as they didn't want to deal with her once again, they tried not to pay any attention to her but Hildy just wouldn't let them get away. Someone behind Elma and Lucy asked Hildy if Elma was the heavy knight to whom she had lost her money and Hildy said that Elma was indeed the one and that he tricked her. The person that Hildy was talking to was a lady whom she called Master and she looked really graceful. I'm not gonna lie, Elma could also feel a difference in the atmosphere and he thought to himself that she could really be the Black Flame Blade. The lady said her name was Kalos and that she was an A-rank adventurer and after Hildy told her what happened, a wish to meet Elma was born inside of her and Kalos wanted to know whether or not Elma really tricked her. Elma realized that Kalos was the real deal and she held up to her reputation and Elma knew that he couldn't battle her and live to tell the tale so he decided to say everything as it happened. After Kalos listened to what Elma said, 
she struck Hildy on the head and she told Elma that she knew that it was probably due to a duel or something similar. Kellos felt the urge to be harsh with Hildy, but she managed to stop herself as not to hurt her feelings. Kellos apologized to Elma and Elma said that he could have easily declined her challenge, but he wanted to earn some quick buck. Kellos explained that when she started out as an adventurer, she was all on her own and that helped her to learn how to judge people and, in her opinion, Elma was a good person and Elma felt a bit uncomfortable after hearing that. Kellos told Elma that even if he thought of giving Hildy her money back, that he should keep it as Hildy would never learn from her mistakes until she suffered a bit. But that wasn't the only reason why Kellos wanted to meet with Elma and because the other matter was a bit delicate, Kalos asked Elma and Lucy to join them for lunch. They walked to a nearby tavern and when they got their food, Kalos explained how a lot of strange monsters made all sorts of problems around the cornea. All sorts of disasters were present, monsters would escape dungeons that just appeared, a lot of monsters started evolving more often, which was highly unusual, and Kalos doubted that all of that was a coincidence, so she went through a couple of dungeons to do her research. Elma asked Kalos if she had been to the centipede pit, and Kalos explained that she went inside, but that she wasn't able to clear the dungeon like they have because of a something called the dungeon pool. A dungeon pool was the most feared disaster in whole world, and that's when an unbelievable Unbelievable number of monsters gather at one place for some reason. Things like that happen rarely, but Elma confirmed his doubts that something or someone must have been triggering these events. Elma also knew for a fact that these problems would only increase in the future and that there would be less and less space for humans to live in. Lucy thought that Elma was exaggerating things way too much, but Kalo said that she shared his opinion and that Elma was right. With that being said, Kalos went straight to business and she finally said why she wanted to meet them. The main reason was that she wanted to invite Elma and Lucy to raid a quest in a dungeon called the Cemetery of Sorrows, which Kalos also failed to clear by herself. Lucy asked Elma about his opinion and even Elma was a bit hesitant to accept because the situation wasn't really usual. He thought about everything and he knew that Hildi wouldn't be making problems because she respected her master and on top of that because of all those problems happening, Elma thought that the only person who could do something to stop them was himself because he was the only only one that had memories of the place from playing the game in his previous life. And with that being said, Elma accepted Kalos' invitation and Hildy was also hyped up to be able to fight alongside her master once again, but Kalos joked with her by saying that she could rest if she wanted. Everyone prepared themselves for the raid and with a huge party, they came in front of the entrance to the Cemetery of Sorrows. Everyone looked dead serious and they all understood the gravity of the situation. Elma was really surprised with the number of high-level adventurers that Kalos was able to gather on such a short notice and Elma knew that there were two factors that helped her do that. The first one being the guild of a large city like Lacornia and the second one was the fact that everyone respected her because she was an A-rank adventurer. Hildy asked Kalos whether they really needed all those adventurers as she thought that they would be okay with just a couple of healers and Kalos explained that it was quite possible that things might have gotten worse in the meantime and she just wanted to make sure to up their chances for success. Other adventurers noticed that Hildy was wielding a scythe and they started asking each other if she had also acquired the necessary skill tree for that weapon. Lucy also asked Elma why Kalos would take Hildy as her disciple as there were many others she could choose and Hildy got angry at her after hearing that. Kalos interrupted them and she explained that she hadn't really thought Hildy a lot of stuff and said that the spell sword class was really strong on its own but even though that may be the case, the spell swords more often than not got into disputes with other party members because they relied heavily on their attacking capabilities. Kalos explained that if she were to leave Hildy on her own, it was quite probable that she would end up doing something rather crazy. Elma also remembered that spell swords behaved like that in the game as well, but Kalos continued with her story. She knew that Hildy was impatient and she admitted that she was impatient when she first started out as well, but if one remained like that the whole time, it might be the case that they failed to see the bigger picture after a while. Kalos explained that she suffered a lot when she was younger and she wished to have had some 
someone who could show her the way and that was the main reason she allowed Hildy to stay alongside her. That story made Hildy really happy and everyone was content and Elma joked that it would be ideal if Hildy learned even one thing, she was being thought. The party had walked into the Cemetery of Sorrows and Lucy told Elma that by looking at Kalos the way she was now, she could never imagine her being as violent as Hildy and Elma said that she probably said that not to make Hildy feel bad. Kalos warned everyone to stop and she proclaimed that the enemies were coming their way. Just as she said that, a ginormous pack of mad wolves that were level 52 started running at them at full speed and they weren't the only monsters there. Kalos told everyone to ready themselves as the fight had just started. Everyone started fighting off the mad wolves and after a while, Elma noticed that Lucy was attacked by one of them, but Lucy was able to slice it up and on her first try she ended up poisoning the monster. In the magic world, whenever somebody got poisoned, their movement dropped by 10% and as Lucy got ready to finish the monster, someone had already shot it down with an arrow to the head. Lucy turned around to see who it was and it was one of their party members wielding a bow. Elma shouted out that they should slowly work their way through the monsters and the fight lasted for quite a while but in the end they ended up defeating all of the monsters and Elma thought to himself how that was a really hard battle straight from the beginning even though they hadn't even entered the dungeon. That was only its entrance but there was one thing Elma was happy about and that was the fact that he was fully equipped thanks to Mr. Berga and no one dared to call him a beginner heavy knight anymore. They walked further into the cemetery of sorrows and Elma asked Lucy if she was happy with her new weapon and whether she was alright because he saw her get a bit of damage from the previous fight. Lucy explained that she only got carried away by the whole situation and that she was right but she also wondered whether she should drink a health potion. Just as she said that someone behind her used a healing skill and Lucy turned around to express gratitude and the little girl that casted the magic introduced herself. Her name was Maybell and she was called to the party because she was a priest class and excelled in healing. She was a C-rank adventurer and looked forward to working with her seniors. Elma felt really happy with the way Mabel behaved herself and Elma said that they had just recently got it promoted and he added that he was a heavy knight and that Lucy was a jester. Elma was really glad that they had a priest on the team and the guy that shot down the poisoned mad wolf with his arrow said how they shouldn't spend mana potions so carelessly. Elma got really irritated by that comment and he told him that the only way to fight such a large group of monsters was to attack them head on and even if the man knew anything better he should try not to spoil everyone's mood. The archer said that Elma wasn't aware of the fact that that was going to be a long long raid and that their expedition wasn't just clearing but also investigating this dungeon. The archer also called Elma a newbie and told him not to rush like a madman always. Elma knew a lot of people that were just like that archer and they were the people who only wanted to take advantage of a situation and intimidate everyone so they could have some benefit. A lot of hunter class players and adventurers behaved like that and Elma didn't like the way the hunter looked down on him. The hunter went to the dead monster and said that the rule of thumb was that whoever landed the killing blow gets to take the loot. Lucy mentioned that the drops heavily depended on her as well and Elma didn't like that my dog started barking in the background. No, Elma didn't like that guy from the start. He resembled the client guy from the beginning of the story. Elma told Mabel that she shouldn't pay much attention to him as well but Mabel seemed to have known how to deal with such adventurers and she said that if she were to cut back Back on healing him a bit, he would quickly change his opinion and behavior. Mabel added how she really wanted to get along with Elma and Lucy and they continued their way to the dungeon's entrance. They finally came to a destroyed church that had the dream hole in front of it and Elma knew that they had arrived. Kalos explained that they would split into five groups so they could gather as much information as possible and that they would regroup in the center. That dungeon was special because it was always randomly generated and the paths seemed divided according to the info the guild had. Kalos explained that as soon as they gathered enough information, they would go after the dream lord and that the rewards would be evenly split amongst everyone and that everyone would also get a bonus from the guild. It seemed that Elma and Lucy got paired with Kel, the hunter class adventurer from before, and Mabel the priest. Mabel was really happy and Kelt acted like he did a couple of moments ago, so be the same douchebag. Mabel suggested that they make Kelt the leader of their group 
but Mabel wasn't as foolish to blindly follow his orders and she cunningly said how she would try to save as much mana potions as she could. Lucy was surprised with Mabel's words and Elma knew that they had to keep Kelt in check somehow. They entered the dungeon and inside it seemed like a church in ruins with caskets and statues all around. Lucy was already afraid of the whole place and she said that my dog isn't stopping barking. I mean you saw the dog reveal yesterday. If you didn't, if you want to see how it looks like, you can go to one of my previous videos. You will not miss it. The thumbnail is literally my dog. But if you see, this is going to be the last time you see him because I'm going to eat him right now <laughs> anyways back to the story lucy said that she could never find anything sus as everything she could see looked sus to her elma said that they should pay attention even to little details on the statues and that if they were careful enough they could find a clue mabel added that their main point was to defeat as many monsters as they could and that they shouldn't rely focus on investigating as they weren't scholars and lucy liked that idea while they walked through the church's hallways, Kel told Elma to walk a bit more further in front of them so he could take all the incoming damage. Elma hated the way Kel behaved, but he didn't say anything because his argument to defend Mabel, who was their healer, was solid. And not too long after, they had come across their first monster in that dungeon. The first monsters they came across in the Cemetery of Sorrows were Mummy Lanas, four of them to be exact. Lucy recognized that they were frogs and she asked Elma whether they shared any of the characteristics with the golden Lanas they defeated earlier, but Elma replied how these were much more dangerous. And with that being said, the level 55 Lanas started attacking them. One of them jumped past Elma and was going towards their backline where Mabel and Kelt were and Elma used Shadow Stomp to stop it before reaching them, but while he was busy with that one, another one attacked Elma. He noticed that attack as well, and while he was still maintaining his Shadow Stomp, he turned around like a Giga Chad with the other foot and used Seal Bash to send the frog flying. Elma immediately called out to Lucy, and Lucy already knew what she needed to do, and she stabbed the frog that Elma sent across the hallway. Kelt was surprised with how well Elma fought, and because there were four frogs in total, Maple said that she would use one of her attacks but Kel told her to preserve her mana points and he ran past her to meet the frogs. Mabel tried warning him that hunters worked best from afar and if he closed the distance between himself and the enemy he could get into some big trouble. However Kel didn't listen to her and he continued moving forward before firing one arrow straight into Alana's face. However Elma saw that and he shouted that the undead type monsters couldn't be knocked back and Elma added how he couldn't protect Kel if he was so close to the monster. But Kelt wasn't surprised at all that the frog wasn't knocked back and he was actually ready. He took out his pocket knife and stabbed the frog, wounding it once again and he even kicked it before falling back to his original position. Kelt ordered Lucy to finish the Lana he attacked and Lucy killed it with her stun barrage skill and she earned herself 639 experience points. Kelt felt bad about that because he wanted to take down at least 3 of them and Elma realized that he was so selfish that he wanted to take all the drops and XP by himself and that it wasn't a surprise that he was a B-rank adventurer in a world where selfishness was actually applauded. But as Kelt was focused on the Lana that Lucy finished off, another one was behind him and it seemed it was channeling a skill and when Kelt noticed it, it was already too late. The monster used its poisonous fluid cannon and the attack ended up hitting Kelt on the shoulder. He immediately shouted at Mabel to heal him but she said that she couldn't do it at the moment which made Kelt angry. Mabel explained that poison heal took much longer to cast and she said how she needed to take care of healing Lucy first because she might die but Kelt was so selfish that he insisted that he be healed first. Mabel then used his arguments against him and said that she would lose a lot of mana points if she decided to heal him first and that wouldn't be good for their expedition. Kelt tried to win Mabel over to his side by saying how he would take all the blame if anything bad happened and Elma realized that Kelt was trying to persuade Mabel to abandon her role as the group's healer and basically to only heal him. But Mabel wasn't giving in and she explained that it was her role as a healer to decide who needed to be healed and in which order and she was the one to take responsibility for that. She said that she would heal everyone but she was the one to decide when and where and Ella was happy to see that she could stand up for herself and as Lucy was commenting how kind Mabel was, Elma remembered how mean she was when she said that she was going to make Kel suffer a bit. Elma and Lucy finished off the other three mummy Lanas and earned 
themselves quite a bit of experience points and Kelt was angry that they took them all down. Mabel was taunting him without him being aware and when Kelt turned around, Mabel acted like she didn't do a thing. Mabel ran towards Elma and Lucy to see how they were holding up and they were all right and when Elma said that he would rather drink a potion than to make her use her mana points, Lucy called Elma to collect the magic stones from the Lannas. Lucy also noticed an item among the magic stones and Kelt was surprised by the drop rate of the items. The item in question was a zombie mushroom whose price was around 40k gold coins and Lucy felt a bit grossed out by the item and Elma explained that it was probably used in alchemy. Kelt decided to speak out once again and he told Mabel that he had underestimated her and that he was aware of her plot against him. Kelt told her that she wouldn't like to be enemies with someone like him and Elma was waiting to see where Kelt was going with that. But Mabel had enough of him and she bursted out with a raging speech. She explained that she was the one responsible for keeping everyone alive and with that being said, healers had a lot of responsibilities during a raid which was as big as theirs and because of that even the guild decided to give them a special reward. This special reward is cool, we don't have enough healers so we're gonna give you an incentive to become a healer. Mabel explained how all of their lives were at risk and because she wasn't questioning the way Kelt was doing his things, she asked him to respect hers. Mabel was almost on the verge of tears and Kel told her that she shouldn't cry and that he wouldn't bother her anymore. Kel shouted at Elma and Lucy to get going and before anything else, Elma tried to calm Mabel down by saying how such situations were common and that she shouldn't take it by heart that much. But when Mabel raised her head from her hands, she was smiling and she told Elma and Lucy that it was a rule for healers not to show their true emotions and she signaled them not to say anything to Kelt and Elma realized that she was much tougher than what they thought of her. They walked further into the dungeon and as Kelt was looking at the map that the guild had provided them with, he was a bit angry with how confusing everything was. I get this feeling every time I start playing a new game, everything is giga confusing but as soon as you play for at least 2 hours, everything is giga clear. Now Elma was aware of the fact that a lot of monsters had already escaped the dungeon and that the long path that they were taking wasn't as necessary as the guild thought. The map had a path that they should follow but nothing made sense because they could simply bypass a lot of those areas. Kelt also thought that the map was a bit stupid and he told everyone to take the shortest route to the meeting point. Elma opposed his suggestion as that would mean that they were abandoning the mission and Kelt said how choosing a safe route wasn't a bad thing because it would ensure to stay alive. Mabel also said that they could maybe agree upon a course of action that would still follow the mission with leaving out some areas unexplored and Elma agreed that certain points on the map looked kinda sus and he decided to leave decision making to Kelt and Kelt told him that he should have behaved like that from the very start. They continued their expedition and as Kelt was giving them orders on where to turn, Elma noticed that he was changing his orders and that they have been going around in circles for quite a while and Kelt shouted out how it wasn't his fault that the map was so awfully drawn. Elma tried to ask Kelt if they could go back onto the original path and Kelt took that as an insult and he shouted that they were turning left and that that was going to be their course of action. There was nothing they could do without starting a fight with Kelt so they ended up listening to him and after they turned left they came across a huge room that looked rather scary. The walls were decorated with shelves full of skulls and everything felt eerie. Lucy was completely afraid and Elma was also anxious even though he remembers such rooms from the game and they were rather common. However, Elma was afraid that they might run into some other monsters and he said that it would be better if they turned back before anything bad happened. He realized that it wasn't solely Kelt's fault for getting lost because the map the guild gave them was drawn after some testimonies of other adventurers and it was normal that they had different memories. Nothing seemed to happen except Colt losing his mind because of the map and he finally decided that they would turn back to the original path Elma suggested before they even ended up in that scary room. Elma thought to himself that even if they went back to their original path, they were also bound to come across some other problems as well but even if that ended up happening, Elma hoped that nothing bad would happen. But while Kelt was 
blabbering about the guild's map and how bad it was, he started exiting the room while the others stayed back and Elma told him that it would be best if he stayed behind like they did before and Kel started yelling at Elma for being slow. Lucy was joking with Elma with some comments about Kel being selfish as he was from the beginning but it seemed that Kel caught something with his ear. He told everyone to keep silent for a moment and he informed them that a monster was coming towards them. Everyone immediately took their fighting stances and true enough, a scary silhouette could be seen at the door. The monster stepped into the room and it looked giga scary, a jacked body without a head and with additional arms with swords in each one. Kel seemed ready to take on whatever monster came, but when he saw this monster in front of him, he was as intimidated as Lucy was. So the monster was a level 67 three-armed Grim Reaper and it was also a patchwork undead type monster and Nelma explained that that monster always appeared in the Cemetery of Sorrows. He explained how that monster normally roamed the dungeon in search of adventurers and the fact that the monster stumbled upon them despite the fact that 20 adventurers entered the dungeon in total and Elma only blamed it on the fact that they were unlucky. He knew that patchwork monsters were extremely slow and the best way to fight it was to not fight it at all and to simply run away from it but that wasn't possible because the only exit was the entrance where the monster stood. On top of that that Elma and Mabel were slow due to the qualities of their classes and with everything said there was nothing to do right now but to fight the monster and kill it. Elma shouted at Kelt to quickly go and stand behind him but Kelt wasn't budging because he had other ideas. He said that the only reason why they were in such a situation was the fact that Elma was slow in the first place and with that being said Elma realized what Kelt was thinking. Kelt crouched down and in two steps ran past the monster and it was evident to everyone else now. My bro was fleeing! He shouted out that it was the best course of action if at least someone survived and he urged Lucy and Mabel to try and escape if they could. But what Kel didn't know was that another three-armed Grim Reaper was there as well and when he saw it, he understood that fleeing wouldn't be possible and that for some reason his pants got kinda soiled to put it mildly. <laughs> Kelt ended up standing in between two monsters and as he was frozen with fear, one of the monsters ended up slicing him across the belly and Kelt felt on the floor in sharp pain and with blood gushing out of his stomach. Lucy was surprised and Abel knew that the matter had just gotten way more serious and Elma realized that there were two monsters probably due to the monster pool that they came to inspect. And all the while Kelt was on the ground in excruciating pain. Elma asked Lucy if she could distract the reaper that was targeting Kelt and he asked Mabel to try and heal him as soon as she could. Mabel said that such a thing would be impossible with another reaper on the way and on top of that, if he was to be healed, Mabel said that he would simply run away once again and that because of that, they should just ignore him like he ignored them when he tried to escape. Elma told her that even though he was a selfish bastard, he hadn't still done a crime that he needed to be punished for and that they needed all the help they could get. He explained that he couldn't guarantee that Kelt would fight on their side if he was healed but they just needed to try because he was certain that they would be able to fight off and kill the two monsters. Elma took command of their group and Mabel didn't really mind that but she didn't understand how Elma thought they would be able to save Kelt as another Grim Reaper was on them and Lucy shouted out Elma's name as she ran towards him. Elma knew what they were about to do and he prepared his shield to use shield bash to propel Lucy all the way to the back. Lucy flew straight past one of the three armed Grim Reapers and just when Kelt was about to be killed, Lucy managed to slice the monster first to draw its attention to herself. The monster, having three hands and being extra sensitive, immediately attacked Lucy but she managed to jump away from the monster by using her acrobatic steps. Kelt couldn't believe that they were trying to save him after everything and Lucy explained how it was Elma's kindness that was keeping him alive. Lucy explained that Elma never cared about whether he was friends with someone or not. If somebody needed help, he was certainly going to help because he was simply like that and he couldn't help himself. But Lucy warned Kelt that she wasn't as kind as Elma and that she would throw her poisonous knife at Kelt if he tried running away once again. Kelt was in a lot of pain but he was also completely shocked by and afraid of the fact that they needed to fight not one but two Grim Reapers. Kel thought to himself how they would never be able to win and Mabel agreed with him because she thought that the monsters were way stronger than them. However, Elma explained that he would fight one of them alone and that Mabel should run to help Kelt and Lucy fight the other one. 
Mabel wasn't really sure that Elma could manage to do that, but Elma said that that was his main role as a heavy knight, and even though Mabel tried protesting once again, Elma shouted at her to shut her mouth and just go. He explained that it was a much bigger problem to let Lucy fight the Grim Reaper on her own, with another responsibility of covering Kelp, and Mabel finally listened to him. Mabel said that they were going to hurry up and kill the other monster so they could return back to help Elma, and with that being said, she ran past the Grim Reaper. However, the monster turned around and tried going after her, but thanks to Elma's shadow stomp, he was able to stop the monster and make it stumble and fall onto the ground. So Elma stood over the monster now while proclaiming that he was going to be the one to bring it down. He attacked the monster with his mithril sword, but the monster had three swords to defend himself with, and that's exactly exactly what it did. The monster blocked with one of its swords and Elma started counting them up and that was the first one. The second one was an attack which Elma barely managed to dodge and lastly came the third sword with a powerful swing that Elma blocked with his sword. But that wasn't everything, even though the monster had three arms and three swords, it had another attack that it was already channeling and it seemed that Elma was ready for that one as well. Out of the monster's chest it fired a skill called the Death Sword which felt like a real sword and Elma gripped his mithril sword even more tightly and he somehow ended up parrying the skill and keeping himself alive. Elma knew that such a skill was so powerful and quick because it was used in close combat. Elma explained that every three armed Grim Reaper had those four attacks despite not having four arms and Elma didn't really like the fact that they had to fight such monsters on their own. He quickly shouted out to Lucy to give her a piece of advice. He told her that she should try and always stay on the monster's left side and not to stay in one place for more than a mere second. Elma said that she should let Mabel and Kelt handle the attack in part of the plan as soon as Kelt was healed and that she should just keep running and dodging. And that is exactly what Lucy did and when it looked like she was being cornered with nowhere to run away, she used her acrobatic steps to climb the wall and jump behind the monster and she even performed a backflip while she was hovering in the air about the monster. Lucy told Elma that she would give it her best to listen to his orders. She kept running until Kelt finally came around and decided to help them even though he was paralyzed with fear and he fired off some arrows into the back of one of the Grim Reapers and Mabel used one of her skills called Ice Attack as well. Elma knew that the way they were fighting wasn't really efficient and that they would take quite a while until they defeated the other Grim Reaper but he thought that he could somehow manage on his own even though he had it much harder than them because three armed Grim Reapers were much more dangerous in close combat. Elma was giving it his all while defending from a continuous barrage of attacks from the monster and and when he finally landed his berry skill in a perfect manner, Elma saw an opening and he quickly realized it with a strike across the monster's rib cage. But even though Elma's attack had wounded the monster, Elma wasn't really safe from danger and as the monster fired off its death sword skill, Elma just barely managed to defend with his shield of madness. However, the monster didn't stop there and it fired off another death sword at Elma and that attack knocked down even him. With his shield knocked out from his hands, Elma fell onto the ground and his shield fell away from him and Lucy was clearly shocked and worried at the same time because that was the first time she saw Elma fly through the air like that. But the monster stood tall and was getting ready for more action. Elma was sliding across the room almost all the way to the room's wall and after he stopped sliding, he managed to get up on his knees. The monster would be looking at him that whole time if it had a head, which it didn't, but it was certainly going after our protagonist. The monster started running and Lucy couldn't do anything to help Elma, but it seemed that he had activated his half-dead savage dragon because his body was covered in electricity, and that ended up being true as Elma met the monster's attack with fierce determination and a sharp look in his eyes. Elma thought to himself how he finally reached all the conditions he needed to defeat the three armed Grim Reaper. Lucy stood on the room's wall with the help of her acrobatic steps and she wasn't taking her eyes off of Elma. While Elma's sword and all the swords from the monsters were still in a clinch, Elma knocked one of them when he sliced away with his mithril sword. 
Elmo was most certain that he was going to win and he wanted to get that fight over with. He started exchanging blows with the monster and somehow Elma managed to hit it twice in a row without much difficulty and just when he was about to strike it from above, the monster used its free hand to stop the attack. However, that didn't really surprise our protagonist that much as he was prepared for it when he knocked out the monster's sword and he knew that an attack was coming. He quickly dodged and retreated just for a bit. Elma took the small chance to grip his sword even tightly and he pounced towards the monster's right arm but the monster successfully defended with two of his swords. Elma explained how there were two conditions to be met in order for him to defeat the monster and the first one was to manage his health points so he could activate his special skill and the other one was also a matter of strategy. The monster broke away Elma's attack and it started channeling its death sword skill but Elma didn't even move or try to defend. Instead he smiled smiled and explained that the other condition was to slowly inflict damage onto the monster so it would use its death sword three times which would use up all of his mana points in a way that it wouldn't be able to cast another death sword skill because one of them cost 18 mana points and the monster had a total of 66. So with that being said, Elma knocked out the remaining two swords from the monster's hands and with the monster's body completely exposed, Elma gave it a finishing blow and ended up killing the monster and raising his level by two and was now standing at level 66. So now it's one monster down and one more to go. Now Lucy was taunting the monster while Kelt and Mabel were giving it their best to try and inflict even little damage to the three armed Grim Reaper that they were fighting against. They didn't have a clue about Elma as they were completely invested in their fight and even though the monster's back were filled with Kelt's arrows and with visible signs of frostbite from Mabel's skills, the monster still kept going with full force after Lucy. Lucy was doing her best to dodge the monster's attacks but she was clearly losing her stamina and Mabel asked Kelt if he ever thought of replacing her because she didn't look like she could do that for much longer. Kelt was angry at Mabel for giving such a comment and he said that Hunter worked better from afar and Mabel reminded him that if things continued like that that they were most certainly doomed and fated to die. Elma was coming to help them and he overheard Kelt saying how he would try using his fleeing skill once again if their situation became desperate. Elma realized that Lucy was on the brink of exhaustion but he was happy that no one had died. Elma carefully calculated the situation and he saw that they managed to chip away the monster's health below 50% and it had enough mana only for one more death sword attack. Our protagonist thought that if he were to join the fight immediately while his special skill was active that they should be able to bring the monster down very quickly and easily. Lucy was really exhausted from all the running and as the monster got ready to attack her once again she didn't have the strength to move and Elma realized that he wouldn't be able to make it in time to defend her. Lucy took her tiny knife to try and defend from the attack but the attack was so strong that it sent her flying straight into the wall. Kelt and Mabel realized that she couldn't possibly dodge the attack that was coming and the monster approached Lucy and started channeling its final death sword attack. Elma realized that there was no chance that he would make it in time to protect Lucy and he shouted at her to run but Lucy was in so much pain that she couldn't move an inch. Kelt looked down in the ground and it was obvious that he was struggling to make a decision but as there wasn't much time to think he just decided to act instead. In the very next moment Kelt used his fleeing hair skill and he quickly jumped but it seemed that he wasn't fleeing this time. He said that he wasn't ungrateful and with that being said it seemed that he couldn't forget the way Lucy saved him so he ended up using his skill to close the distance and push Lucy out of the harm's way. He said that even though he was laughing at Lucy for saving him, he couldn't just look at her die because of that and he told her that she should look after herself much more in the future if she wanted to race through the ranks as an adventurer. What ended up happening was that Kelt was struck with the monster's last death sword right across his stomach and a huge fountain of blood started coming out of it. There was no chance that anyone would survive such a devastated attack, especially not Kelt. Lucy was shouting his name but it seemed rather pointless. However, Elma thought that Kelt had done a great job by saving Lucy and Elma finally closed the distance between him and the monster and with one powerful strike Elma killed the second three armed Grim Reaper as well. 
Mabel quickly rushed to check whether or not Kelt was alive, but it seemed that he was neither moving nor breathing. Oh my god, is he actually gonna die? Mabel started crying, and Lucy was also devastated because she blamed herself for being too reckless and impatient, which resulted in Kelt's death. The two of them were kneeling beside his dead body and Elma didn't look concerned even the slightest. Mabel started shouting at Elma by asking him how he could remain so calm when one of them died and Elma simply replied that Kelt was still alive and that he actually didn't understand why they were crying so much. Just when Elma finished saying that, Kelt started coughing up and coming around as he said that he had only lost his consciousness for a brief moment. Mabel was crying and Kelt told her to stop it, thinking both at her crying and at his bleeding wound across his stomach. Come on girl, just stop it bleeding already. Ellen knew all along that Kelt was a high level adventurer and the fact that they were only a group of four people only proved that he was strong. On top of all of that, Elma knew that hunters had a special skill called fake death, which was a passive skill that activated on its own when the user had very low health points and they suffered a blow that would normally kill them. The skill enabled the user to go into a death-like state which would give them enough time to run when the monster shifted its focus onto something or someone else. With that being said, the group seemed to have strengthened the bond between them now. Elma explained how the hunter class had some difficulties of its own. Whenever an enemy was about to be killed, a hunter could always choose whether or not he would be the one to land the killing blow or whether he or she would allow the other adventurers to do so. In any case, there was a problem. If the hunter allowed others to take the kills all the time, they would only be taking advantage of the hunters and in another scenario, the hunter could easily become despised by the rest of the party members if he kill stealed all the kills. Elma thought that Kelt thought that he would end up being resented from the very beginning and that's why he acted so selfishly from the start, but he ended up paying back his debt to Lucy and Lucy bowed down to him and thanked him for saving her life. Lucy knew that she would have died if it wasn't for Kelt and Kelt said how he couldn't live his life knowing that he was indebted to someone like Lucy. After Mabel finished healing him, Kelt stood up and said that he would go for the killing blows and that he wouldn't apologize for that because that was just the way he did things and if someone didn't like that, they should try and find another party for themselves and Ella was a bit disappointed to hear that even though he didn't have high hopes about Kelt. But Kelt continued by saying, how he apologized for trying to run away and leave them all behind in a fight that was winnable from the very beginning. That was actually the main reason the fight took so long and because of that Lucy's life was at risk. Mabel turned to Elma to ask him whether he was really a normal adventurer because he managed to defeat one of the three armed Grim Reapers all by himself and Elma explained that he knew how to fight against patchwork monsters and, on top of that, his mithril sword and special skills helped him out quite a lot. I'm losing my voice for some reason, my throat is going sore, I think. Anyways, back to the story. Mabel wondered whether Elma was stronger than Kelt all the time and Kelt got angry with her for that comment. He told everyone that he wasn't going to act differently just because of the last fight and Elma didn't pay much attention to him as he was more interested in the item that was dropped by the monster. It was a longsword called the Berserker which price was around 14 million gold and Elma crouched down to pick it up. Kelt couldn't believe that they had gotten another drop again and he finally asked whether Lucy had a skill that increased their drop chances. Elma took the longsword and he offered it to Kelt as a thank you gift for choosing to protect Lucy and Kelt acted like he wasn't interested in taking the sword. Elma went on to explain that he was only able to kill the second monster because the three of them distracted the monster for long enough but Kelt said how he didn't need a thank you gift because he was only repaying his debt to Lucy. Elma explained how he wasn't trying to make Kelt feel bad or to insult him, but Kelt told him that they should get moving and once again he took the lead. Elma asked him if he was really going to do such a thing once again, because Elma wouldn't be able to defend him like that and Kelt got angry once again and he said that no matter what happened, he was going to lead the way 
because he had the most experience. They continued walking further into the dungeon and Kelt was really leading the way and he saw a couple of monsters ahead. However, the path had separate turns and Kelt said that they should go right if they wanted to avoid another fight. Elma asked him what would have happened if the monsters noticed him because he was too far in front of them and Kelt explained how he had three special skills that allowed him to move without being noticed and the names speak for themselves of these skills, enhanced hearing, sixth sense and soft steps. Mabel said how it would have been much easier for them if Kelt had told everyone about his skills from the beginning, but Kelt said how he couldn't have done that because he would have been made a vanguard. Elma knew that every class had special skills which they kept hidden from others and that only meant that they had some weaknesses that no one knew as well. Kelt told them about his skills because he never thought that Elma was as strong as he was and Kelt was surprised with the fact that he managed to take down that patchwork monster all by himself. Elma explained that it wasn't really easy and Kelt said that he was jealous of his courage and bravery as well and before Kelt could say anything else, Lucy ran and hugged Elma tightly and said how she wasn't going to let Kelt take him away, which obviously surprised him. And I said this in one of the other manga recaps I've done on the channel a couple of days ago, no matter how OP our protagonist gets because of all the skill he gets, they will never get a skill to read a girl or even to read signs that girl is kinda into you, so they're gonna be completely oblivious to all of that. Now while Lucy was hugging Elma, it seemed that Kelt had picked up something and he told everyone that his sick sense had activated. Kelt explained that it only activated when there was a strong monster or a rare drop nearby and this time Thank God it wasn't the monster, it was actually the rare drop. We see Kelt explaining that he sensed a rare item and everyone got interested in that all of a sudden and they stopped to think about it altogether. Kelt said how he couldn't sense any monsters on their path to the item and that they should go and see what it was and Mabel said that they should maybe try to regroup with the others before anything else. Kelt decided to leave the final decision to Elma as he thought that Elma was stronger than he was and Elma boldly told Kelt to lead them to the rare item. Kelt Kelt was surprised by Elma's decision because he thought that Elma would always opt for the safer option and Elma explained that the item could be all sorts of things and if that was the case that the item belonged to an adventurer that might have died before. Elma would love to retrieve it then. There was something else that Elma wanted to say but he stopped himself before saying it because it would be pointless to point out something that was obvious. With that being said, the party followed Kelt to where the item was and they took the right turn just as Kelt said at the beginning and after walking for a little while, they climbed down some stairs and Kelt proclaimed how the item must be nearby. Everyone looked around themselves to try and find a drop of some kind and it seemed that Kelt was the first one to notice a gem that somehow seemed embedded into the dungeon floor. Kelt went to pick it up and Lucy was there with him inspecting the item's value. Kelt had never seen something like that before but he never thought that a gem like that would be a rare item but when Elma noticed what Kelt held in his hands he got completely shocked. Elma immediately shouted out to Kelt to throw the item and Kelt couldn't understand why the sudden rush. But Elma didn't say anything else, he just knocked the gem out of Kelt's hands and before it could reach the ground, Elma unsheathed his sword and broke the gem by splitting it into two pieces with a powerful attack. Lucy and Mabel were baffled by what Elma had done and Kelt was angry because that item was very valuable. Elma thought to himself how he had done the right thing as he thought that that particular item was what caused all sorts of problems in a lot of dungeons. The item's name was the Morning Trapez Hedron and its market value was around 25 million gold. The item's description said that it was created with necromancy by imbuing dark mana and monster souls and it was very hard to store the item because it had to be covered all the time because it could be a cause for all sorts of disasters if there was no cover over it. So to put it simply, because that magic gem was overflowing with mana outside of its capacity, all sorts of abnormalities were happening in that dungeon and the ones that were close. The mana that gets trapped into such items comes from corpses of high level adventurers and normally necromancers looked for magic stones that were dropped by rare monsters. These morning trapez hedrons were artificial and their purity was also artificial 
and knowing that there were people who left such items all over different dungeons was enough to explain all the abnormalities that were currently happening in the magic world. Elmer realized that this piece of information changed a lot of things, while the rest of his group silently listened to him as he didn't have a clue about how serious the situation actually was. Elmer knew that the person that set that magic item there wouldn't allow themselves to be captured and killed, and Elmer knew that they must have escaped the dungeon in one way or the other. But then Kelt felt something that sent chills down his spine. He heard a loud scream coming from very far away, and those screams were then followed by the sound of footsteps that were coming towards them, and Kelt said that they were approaching fast. Mabel started panicking and said how they should have gone straight to the meeting point first, and Kelt told her that the sound was actually coming from the meeting point. Elmo was already aware of what those sounds represented, and he told everyone that it must be a wandering lord. Kelt and the others refused to believe that that was true because they knew that that would be a complete disaster and Kelt's first thought and instinct was to try and run away if the meeting point was compromised but Elma told him that such an option didn't exist. Elma explained that a wandering lord could smell and track human mana and that it always chased after that smell. On top of that, they were all very well aware of the fact that the dungeon was full of tiny detours and that the Wandering Lord would easily catch up to them, but there was still another thing that worried Elma. He knew that the usual monster that appeared as a dream lord in such dungeons was the giant skeleton and Elma knew that such a monster wasn't known for its speed and that its specialty was its huge size and high attacking stats. Kelt explained that he knew what he had heard and the footsteps belonged to a four-legged creature and it was then that Elma knew that they were going to have to deal with a monster called the Night Bone. On top of that, Elma added how they should expect that it had evolved by then and that its level was around 85, which sent Kelt and Mabel into another round of desperate crying and ranting. There was one thing that Elma was happy about, and that was that they knew what they were going to be up against, and that was all thanks to Kelt's special skills. Elma said that he was going to tell Kelt and Mabel everything about his and Lucy's powers and skills, and that Kelt and Mabel should do the same thing. Elma explained how that was their only way to try and defeat the Wandering Lord because only after Elma was aware of everyone's skills and strengths and weaknesses, he could come up with a viable strategy to bring the monster down. Kel thought that Elma's proposal was absurd because every single adventurer in the world kept their strengths and weaknesses a secret and that was what kept them alive and gave them an advantage. Kel thought that if everyone knew about an adventurer's true skills that they would never be able to find a true party because they would only end up being ordered by others and told what to do and what not to do and Kelt's view of what a party was was a bit different than Elma's. Kelt said that parties weren't real teams and that they were formed just for the sake of certain quests or raids and Elma was aware of the fact that that was the way the world functioned. Kelt couldn't stop himself from saying how much a wandering lord would be too big of a bite for them now and he also added that they wouldn't even damage it properly before dying. However, Elma tried to reason with him by saying how he had a skill that could deal a lot of damage and the only thing Elma needed was an opening and there was another thing that Elma wanted to say. So Elma said how Kelt only acted like he was returning the favor to Lucy when he risked his life to save her and because of that Elma already looked at him like he was one of them and he asked him for his help which shocked Kelt quite a bit. Kelt reached out his hand with his status menu opened and that was his way of showing how he believed in what Elma said. Mabel said that she would also comply and she joked how she wouldn't make a whole fuss about the whole thing like Kelt and with that being said all four of them opened their status menus and reached out their hands towards the middle. They were determined to clear the dungeon by defeating the Wandering Lord with their strengths combined. The Wandering Lord was quickly approaching their position and it was indeed a four-legged monster and its head looked like a skull and everything concerning the monster felt a lot more dangerous than any monster that Elma and Lucy faced up until then. The party spent some time figuring out other skills and specialties and Kelt was the first one to comment Elma's relentless vigor skill and he he, while he had never heard of such a thing before, Kelt thought that Elma being able to increase his strength sixfold was totally OP. Mabel commented Lucy's luck skill tree and even though she knew such things existed, she had never seen anyone use it like Lucy and to that extent to affect drop rates and critical strike chance. Lucy felt a bit
bit shy, but Elma didn't say anything. Kelt asked Elma whether or not he thought that they would be able to win, and Elma said that now he had come up with a strategy, and even though their chances of winning were quite slim, there was nothing else they could do but try it out, even at the risk of their lives. Elma had 16 unused skill points, and by opening his skill trees menu, he decided to spend 7 of them on his Vow of the Heavy Armor, and by it reaching the point of 41 skill points. Elma unlocked a new skill called Protection. So the way this skill worked was that it created a barrier around the user, which decreased the incoming damage by 30% for the next 3 minutes. The time period of 3 minutes was a general rule, a lot of skills that had a time limit on them, and Elma's protection wasn't an exception to that rule, and he would just need to pay attention to when to activate his skill as not to waste mana points without a purpose. Elma realized that that skill would only make it much safer for him to reach the conditions for his half-dead savage dragon ability, and it would also help him gather valuable information on the Wandering Lord. Mabel said how she would love to heal everyone, before the fight started and she wanted to heal Lucy and Elma, but Elma told her that it would be much better if he wasn't at full HP because of his special skills and that she should prioritize healing Lucy and Kelt instead, which surprised Kelt quite a bit. They did what Elma said and after that, they got ready to fight the strongest monster they had ever encountered. The footsteps were approaching more rapidly and they were now louder than ever. The monster's hoofs were making a loud sound through the empty hallways, but our party took their positions as they had agreed after they learned each other's skills, and with that being said and done, they would know the exact time when the monster would appear in front of them thanks to Kelt's special skill. Elma knew for a fact that if things didn't go well, they would all be killed with one blow from the monster, and that also meant that they couldn't allow the fight to last very long, so their only chance was to try and defeat the Wandering Lord ASAP, so as soon as possible. The sound of the monster approaching became even more louder, and at the end of the hallway, the monster's silhouette could be seen from where they stood. Everyone prepared themselves, and the monster seemed to be enjoying its anticipation and the fear it could sense from the adventurers. The monster let out a loud roar, and when it finally showed itself, they could see its true level and stats. So the full name of the evolved Nightbone was Skull Lord and it was a level 85 Wandering Lord. On top of that, its total health points were 787 and the total mana points of the monster were at 315. Even though the monster wasn't at its full health, it was still a very intimidating opponent and Mabel started to cry because that wasn't how she envisioned things to go. The monster had a lower body of a horse and its upper body was that of a skeleton. It had a shield made from bones and a sword in the other hand, and on top of the monster's head was a crown that symbolized its superiority over other monsters in the dungeon. Elma thought that even though the monster was in its evolved form, nothing should have changed much when its strategy was concerned, and the only difference should be on the statistical spectrum meaning his stats were higher. No new mechanics that you have to learn for this boss fight. Lucy was clearly upset, but she wasn't allowing her feelings to scare or intimidate her, but Mabel seemed to have some trouble hiding her fears from showing on her face. As the monster came nearer with constant roars, Elma gripped his mithril sword even tighter, used his life shield to lower his health points so he could activate the half-dead savage dragon, and after that was finished, Elma was completely ready to start the hard this battle he had ever fought and he reminded everyone to try and stick to the plan as much as they could. The party started running towards the monster that was rushing at them with Elma leading the way and Lucy and Mabel behind him. Kelt wasn't in the picture because he was probably waiting for an opening to fire some arrows at the Skull Lord. As Lucy jumped onto the walls with her acrobatic steps, Elma thought to himself how his vision of the monster was almost accurate because he knew how the night bone looked like and after Kelt said that the monster whose footsteps he had heard was a four-legged monster, Elma envisioned the monster almost the same as it actually was. On top of that, Elma thought that the monster would keep the same fighting style as the Nightbone, and with that in mind he devised their strategy. But the one thing that Elma didn't predict was the fact that the Skull Lord had a shield which completely changed the entire situation because what the party was aiming for was that they wanted to end the battle as soon as they could and if the monster could defend against their attacks with its shield, then they couldn't stand a chance against 
against it. So with that being said, the action was about to start as Elmo continued rushing to meet the monster head on. And just when he came really close, he started shouting, Now! Immediately as Elma shouted those words, Kelt appeared out of the dungeon floor right behind the Skull Lord. And he aimed at the monster before using his skill called Point Shot. And Kelt's arrow connected to the monster's core under its rib cage. The monster immediately turned around as that arrow drew its attention. And now it shifted its focus on Kelt. However, both Elma and Kelt were laughing that that part of the strategy worked as they had planned it and Elma was really happy to have Kelt on his team as he was a top class hunter who could use a special shadow sync skill that allowed him to become one with the environment. The monster let out another loud roar as it turned its whole body towards Kelt and by doing so it ended up exposing its back to Lucy who was getting ready to pounce and attack it herself. Lucy mastered up enough courage to do so and while she was in mid air she used her stun barrage skill and she started spinning with her knife. However the monster managed to block her attack successfully but their strategy had worked once again because the plan was to apply the poison effect onto the skull lord and Lucy managed to do just that with a couple of cuts on the monster's lower body. Lucy was really happy that she managed to complete her part of the strategy and she informed Elma that she had applied the poison onto the monster. When Elma heard that he knew that it was his time to move in and his goal was to try and use his disarm skill to lower the monster's attack and defensive stats and Elma just barely managed to hit the monster and his skill surprisingly worked. The Skull Lord was getting quite angry and each time it was hit it was shouting like crazy and as it now shifted its focus on Elma it started to attack him. However, Mabel was ready to cast a skill she had been channeling all that time and as Elma quickly jumped to the side, Mabel used slow to further slow the enemy down which gave Elma just the right amount of time he needed to safely dodge the Skull Lord's attack. The plan had worked excellently up until then and they managed to apply all sorts of debuffs to the enemy. Its movement speed was slow, its attacking power were lowered and on top of that there was the additional poison effect. Elma was really satisfied with how everything went but his face was still dead serious because he knew that the wandering lord's resistance to debuffs and other effects was way higher than that of other monsters and the thing was that their effects wouldn't actually last forever. Because the wandering lord was so strong all of their debuffs were reduced and the duration of their effects were also halved which means that they would wear off even sooner than usual. Everyone was still aware of the fact that the fight was still on and that they could lose at any moment and as Elma rushed forward with outstanding determination and great force he explained how they would only have one full minute to try and defeat the Skull Lord before it got back all of its powers. They were all aware of how little time they had to try and put an end to this fight by defeating the Skull Lord and that's why everyone was going to give it their all because now when the Skull Lord was under the effects of three different debuffs that was their one and only and their best chance to defeat it. Elma rushed in and as the monster roared their swords clashed and it seemed that Elma was able to hold up really well against a monster that was four times his size. Elma was somehow able to deflect the monster's attack attack with his parry skill and when he tried to attack it straight on, the Skull Lord used his shield to protect himself and Elma knew he had to fall back for the time being. In the meantime, Lucy had once again climbed the wall with her acrobatic steps and she was already prepared to attack. Lucy gripped her knife and she pounced at the Skull Lord with the intention of slicing it up but once again she was met with the monster's shield and her attack did basically no damage and she had to jump away towards the wall once again. While Lucy was trying with her own attacks, Kelt was firing off arrows at the Skull Lord from behind his back but it seemed that the monster wasn't at all affected by Kelt's tiny arrows and Kelt realized that his attacks didn't concern the Wandering Lord not one bit. Things were looking bleak for Elma and the others but that wasn't the time to be desperate as their time was limited and the clock was ticking by each passing moment. Lucy and Elma didn't lose their determination and their facial expressions were still giving signs of hope and they continued 
with their attacks. Lucy pounced at the monster once again, but the Skull Lord seemed like it could completely read through all of their attacks and it once again met Lucy's attack with its shield. Only this time the Skull Lord used his shield like Elma used his many many times before when he used his shield bash. The Skull Lord sent Lucy flying across the empty hallway when it deflected her attack. Immediately after that, the Skull Lord took its giant sword with both of its hands and was channeling its attack. Elma realized how dangerous that was for Lucy as she was helpless because she was still flying through the air. Elma realized that there was actually no way of him ever parrying such a strong attack, but he wasn't going to let the monster kill Lucy like that. There was only one thing that Elma could do, and that was to throw his shield of madness in the way of the attack, and thanks to that, Lucy was able to escape unharmed. However, that meant that Elma had lost his shield of madness for the remainder of the fight, and that would make his job much more harder, as he knew that he couldn't allow the Skull Lord to break his life shield because Elma still needed to see the monster's special skill. On top of that, Elma still didn't know anything about the monster's potential weak spots and that was just another problem because they had to know all of that to be able to find a nice opening. But the Skull Lord wasn't stopping even for a single second and it took a different grip on its sword which could only mean one thing and Elma immediately recognized it. The monster held its huge sword in reverse with the blade completely completely covered in electricity and its tip pointing towards the ground. Elmo was shocked and he quickly warned everyone that the monster was about to use its special skill and that they should all fall back and jump into the air when the tip of the sword made impact with the ground. They all seemed ready to do what Elma just told them and with another loud roar, the monster fiercely struck its huge sword into the ground which unleashed the effects of a skill called lightning ground impact. The skill sent a strong shockwave through the whole hallway and because Elma wasn't able to see anything from the flashes, even though everyone was a bit blinded by them, it seemed that Elma was the only one to get hit and he was in a lot of pain as others seemed to have successfully dodged the Skull Lord's special skill. Now when the effects of the monster's special skill had come to an end, it was evident that Lucy was also affected by the impact, but not as much as Elma because she was on the side walls and not on the ground. However, Elma was standing on the ground and the impact of the skill had broken through his life shield and had shattered it completely. Elma knew that their chances of defeating the monster had become way way smaller, but they couldn't give up just yet. However, Kelt was really angry at the Skull Lord now and he took out his pocket knife to try and attack the Skull Lord. He was a very experienced adventurer and he thought to himself how he wasn't going to be defeated by such a skill. Kelt hated to be looked down upon, especially if the entity that did that was a monster and he threw his pocket knife at the Skull Lord calling him Bakayaro. The monster wasn't affected by that attack even the slightest and Kelt realized that that was actually a huge mistake. With another deafening roar, the monster attacked Kelt who was in mid-air and its huge sword sliced open his belly. Elma shouted out Kelt's name but he couldn't do much to help him as the monster left Kelt alone and turned its focus to Elma now and was rushing at him with full speed. Elma met the monster's attack with another luckily successful parry, but the monster used that momentum to change his attacking direction and it raised its sword high up into the air to attack Elma from above. That surprised Elma as he didn't anticipate something like that and he knew that such an attack would be way too powerful for him to block or parry, so he knew he had to try and dodge it. The impact of the attack was way too powerful that even the dungeon floor started collapsing and Elma barely managed to escape. When Elma saw the aftermath of the attack and what it did to the dungeon floor, Elma realized that the Skull Lord's attacking stats had gone back up to its fullest capacity, meaning that all the debuffs are gone. Elma was able to recklessly parry the attacks until then, but now even that wouldn't be possible anymore 
Why? Because the debuffs had worn off? As Kelt was lying down on the floor in a pool of his own blood that came from his stomach, Elma knew that there was no way that he could have survived an attack like that. Oh no, oh no, is he really gonna die now? On top of that, the fact that the effects of Elma's disarm skill had worn off, that only meant that other debuffs would also wear very soon if they didn't wear out already. Elma also realized that the Skull Lord wanted to get rid of him as soon as possible because it recognized Elma as its biggest threat because Elma was giving it the most trouble out of all the adventurers there. But something unexpected had happened as Kelt stood up on his feet and by yelling and cursing the monster, Kelt fired off another arrow that seemed to have passed right in between the small cracks on the monster's rib cage. It seemed that Kelt's special skill, Fake Death, also worked on such powerful attacks such as the one from just a couple of moments ago. I mean, the hunters are the most OP class ever. What the hell, man? You're baiting my emotions like that, telling me he's dying, and you're literally giving me a deus ex machina for him to survive two times with his thing that spell. What the hell, man? Kel taunted the monster by saying how foolish it was to forget about him just because his body collapsed onto the floor. I love this. Elmer realized that Kel must have used his special skill right when he was about to be slashed, and that resulted in him staying alive barely. Elmer was really satisfied with the outcome of that moment when he told Mabel to heal Lucy and Kelt instead of healing him. On top of that, Elma also used his protect skill on Kelt so the damage he would take would be reduced by 30%. They had to take that gamble and with all the debuffs the monster had on itself, Kelt barely stayed alive and his health points were extremely low to say the least. But thanks to Kelt being brave enough to put his life on the line, he was able to give Elma a great opening and Elma was really happy with his party member and he even called him a master hunter as well, which made Kelt smile. Elma ran at the Skull Lord and this time he was certain that he would be able to cut it down. The monster roared and as it was running towards Elma, Elma jumped into the air to level himself with the point where the monster torso connected to its lower body and Elma unleashed his most powerful attack with his relentless vigor and it seemed that he was able to slice the monster open. Nothing could really be seen because Elma's half-dead savage dragon was now emitting a black electrical current and his whole body was covered in what seemed to be black thunders. Elma looked a lot stronger than ever before but that could only be related to the gravity of the entire situation. He knew that if his attack didn't land or if it was just an inch off, the effort of the entire party and their struggle would have been in vain. But in the end, Elma's attack was so powerful that he was able to cut the Skull Lord in half. The Skull Lord's lower half with those horse legs was standing on the floor while the upper half of its torso was flying through the air. As soon as the upper part fell onto the ground, the monster's lower body also collapsed on the floor and with a sight of relief on everyone's faces, it seemed that they actually managed to defeat the Skull Lord and Elma had gained over 9,000 experience points, raising his level to 71. Elmo was really happy that they managed to win because he thought that the whole raid party would be in danger and maybe even the whole city of Lacornia as well. Mabel came running to her teammates and she was really happy that they had defeated the Skull Lord even when it was so much stronger than them and Lucy's face was also showing signs of happiness. Elma said that it was everything thanks to Kelt and he apologized for giving him the most crucial role in the whole plan because nothing would be possible if he hadn't been able to dodge the lightning ground impact. Kelt was lying on the ground and he added how he never ever wanted to fight such a close battle as that one and while he was crying out of sheer joy of staying alive, Elmer realized where his attitude was coming from. But after all that fighting and anxiety and anticipation and the adrenaline, Kelt could really feel happy and satisfied with himself and with everyone else in his party because it was such a good feeling to have brought down such a strong monster as the Skull Lord. Everyone's faces were showing clear signs of pure happiness and satisfaction while the monster's body was slowly disintegrating into thin air. And after a couple of moments had passed, the Skull Lord completely disintegrated and in place of its lower body, there stood its magic stone which looked huge 
and Elma looked at it with a calm face. He was probably the only person that could remain calm after seeing something as beautiful and as big as that. That's what she said. Kelt commented how he had never seen a level 85 magic stone before and he asked himself what its price was and when Elma looked at it, he told Kelt that it must have been somewhere around 10 million gold coins. Kelt was baffled with that number and he said how the reward that the guild had promised everyone if they cleared the dungeon now looked rather small and Kelt was a little bit jealous of Elma and Lucy. Elma joked with Kelt by saying how Lucy was the full package, thinking mostly about her luck increased skills. But Elma was really interested in whether or not the monster left another item drop and when he turned to take a look around, Elma saw that the Skull Lord's shield was laying on the ground. The item was extremely valuable as it was sitting at 55 million gold for the market value and its bonus to defensive stats was a whopping 88 points. On top of all that, it even had a bonus effect that said that no hell-hearted attacks would ever pass through the shield. Kelt commented how he knew that Dreamlords usually dropped items more commonly than other monsters, but he hadn't heard of a situation where it would drop items that adventurers could use on the spot and he understood how valuable it was to have someone with great fortune skill tree in your party. Mabel joked with Kelt by saying how he was probably feeling guilty for not landing the final blow and Kelt defended himself by saying how they wouldn't have been able to defeat the monster if he had tried something like that and that would result in all of them dying. But Kelt also told Elma that because he ended up getting both that drop and the one from the patchwork monsters from a while ago that Elma should at least buy him some drinks. Elma then proclaimed the shield's value and when the others heard the price of 55 million gold their jaws dropped as they were completely shocked with that information. Elma also added how he would love to keep the shield as it would be a very good upgrade in contrast to his shield of madness even though it was a bit heavy for him now because of the difference in level because Elmo was level 71 and to properly be able to wield and hold the shield one needed to be level 85. But more than anyone else, Elma understood and was aware of the fact that he was able to bring down the Skull Lord because of what others did as well, and their victory was a team effort, so that's why he wanted to share some of the rewards with Kelt, Maple, and Lucy as well. Maple said that healers always received a good compensation from the guild whenever they were called to attend any type of raids, so she was happy with that. To add even more to her satisfaction, the sheer fact that her level had gone up by 4, even though she did the bare minimum because of her mana points already being low, she couldn't ask for much more. Mabel also added a joke by saying how Elma shouldn't feel obliged to share anything with Kelt, which made him upset, but Elma reassured Kelt and Mabel that they would meet up in the guild once more to distribute the awards evenly. The dungeon started to vanish like every other clear dungeon did after the Dream Lord was defeated and they were about to be teleported back towards the entrance. Mabel said that even though their time as a party was up, she was really happy to be in the same party as Elma and Lucy and Mabel also added Kelt's name on that list but only after a short pause to tease him. Mabel explained that they would lose against the Skull Lord and die if it weren't for him but as Kelt didn't know how to properly take a compliment, he turned his head and said how Mabel was cruel and he didn't believe her. Elma and Lucy were really happy because there was a friendly atmosphere in the air but Elma didn't forget their true goal and there were a lot of things that were still unclear and rather concerning. There were three major things that Elma was worried about, even though they managed to defeat the Skull Lord and thus cleared the whole dungeon, and while they were at it, they also found out what was causing all the anomalies in the world by finding the morning trapezhedron. They still didn't know who was the person that planned all of that out, and another thing was that the person was probably still nearby. Elma and the others got out from the dungeon into the damaged church area, and once they were out, the first person to notice them was only a dark silhouette and the person didn't think that that would have ever been possible. Other adventurers were also surprised that someone actually managed to defeat the wandering lord and clear the dungeon and some of them didn't even know whether that was considered as disobeying the raid rules. Some adventurers were clearly wounded as they had cuts and bruises and were bleeding all over and they were actually glad that someone was able to beat the huge monster and they realized that they were saved now. 
Elma only saw 10 people in front of him, and by counting the 4 of them, he realized that 6 people have gone missing, and that wasn't a good thing. Their original raid party was consisting of 20 members, and there were only 14 of them now. Elma knew that the adventurers that lost their lives in the dungeon would vanish along with the dungeon when it gets cleared. However, Elma was also concerned with the fact that he wasn't seeing any new faces among the 10 people in front of him. So that only meant that the culprits could be among the original raid party all along or that they quickly escaped the dungeon and left after placing the morning trapezhedron or that they had lost their lives and vanished along with the dungeon maybe as the culprits were still unknown Elma didn't have any information about them, their class, level and stats were all still a mystery and on top of that, by the way everyone looked outside, Elma knew that they were as exhausted as they were and that he should probably remain calm and patient and wait for another chance to try and expose the culprits. Kalos noticed that there was some commotion at the dungeon's entrance and she went to see whose party was able to defeat the wandering lord and when she came nearer, Elma proclaimed that it was them that defeated the Skull Lord. Kalos seemed really happy to see them and she told Elma how she always knew that there was something about him that made him rather special and Elma said that he wasn't that special because they wouldn't have been able to make it if just one of their party members wasn't alive and helping and they seemed rather proud of their achievement. Kalos explained how she never thought that anyone would be able to defeat the Skull Lord and that was the first time Elma realized that Kalos had 42. Kalos added how she tried to fight it all by herself because she knew that her other party members would just slow her down but still Kalos wasn't able to do anything and she just decided to run away and inform as many adventurers as she could to leave the dungeon. Hildy was sobbing behind her as she was really happy that her master was alive and well. Kalos told Hildy to stop crying but Hildy knew that the situation was really serious this time and that everyone could have gotten killed. Kalos admitted that and that's why she thanked Elma for saving everyone's lives. Kalos even took Elma's hand in hers and said how she was even more interested in him now and how she wanted to thank him properly when she had the chance. Is my boy about to get some action with Kalos? Elma's face showed signs of concerns and confusion at the same time and Kalos walked up to Elma and whispered how the matter had shed a bit more light on the entire situation and it was inevitable that either the Marquis family or the guild had been involved. The only thing that was factual was that the disasters weren't happening on their own and rather that someone wanted to see the world struggle. Everyone made their way back to Lacornia, the city of adventurers. Once they got there, our heroes were accompanied by Kalos to a fancy inn that felt like a luxury hotel more than an inn actually, everything looked so neat and tidy, it was amazing. Elma and Lucy sat across Kalos on individual armchairs while Kalos was sitting on a large sofa. She started off the conversation by expressing her gratitude to both Elma and Lucy for helping her clear the dungeon and finish the raid successfully. Kalos continued by saying how thanks to them they now had more information about the true nature of all the disasters and they were closer to finding everything out and on top of that all, Kalos thanked Lucy and Elma for saving all of the surviving members of the raid and for saving the city of Lacornia as it would have been in serious problems had they not defeated the Skull Lord. Elma knew that Kalos had already reported everything back to the guild about all the errors of the map and about the existence of the morning trapezhedron as well. I always have troubles pronouncing this thing's name, I'm sorry. So Elma thought to himself how the map wasn't inaccurate because the guild had made a mistake or two and Elma was almost certain that it wasn't the work of adventurers that made made some false reports from time to time, which was usual in the magic world. The only thing that was right about the map was the original path and everything else. Every small turn and detour were all scrambled up and that was what made the whole thing suspicious. Because that was the case, even if adventurers were to somehow find out that the dream lord transformed into a wandering lord, when they started running, they were bound to get lost and eventually die to the monster. Elma knew that there wasn't any other reason why someone would make such 
such alterations to the map apart from wanting to see as many adventurers as possible die in the dungeon. Elma thought that the morning trapezhedron was placed so deep in the dungeon just because of the fact that it would make it much harder for adventurers to exit the dungeon, which would result in greater chances of those adventurers ending up killed by the Skull Lord or even other monsters. Elma asked Kalos whether or not she was able to find out any information about the map errors or about the rare magic stone that caused all sorts of disasters, and Kalos responded how the Adventurers Guild in Lacornia had a certain man that was an adventurer and later became an employee of the guild. It seemed that that man was very well trusted because he was doing an excellent job for the guild and everyone believed in him and that's why he was entrusted with all the details for that dungeon raid. But the problem was that the man was missing as they speak and no one knew where he was and Elmer realized that he had disappeared. Kellos explained how she spent quite a lot of time traveling throughout the Null Sun Kingdom to try find out what or who caused those anomalies and she was doing so without any success for a long long time. And just when there were some clues and when she had gotten some good information, the assumed culprit managed to slip away just like that and the fact that she was once again left with nothing made Kellos really frustrated. But there was one thing that Kellos was sure of and she was certain that whoever had been helping the the culprit all that time and who helped them escape, Kalos thought that they must have been either someone from the Marquis Holtod family or from a fraction that belonged to it. Kalos explained that there weren't many organizations and families that were able to successfully plan out so many covert operations and after Elma listened to her, he said how that was a sound conclusion. But Elma thought to himself how there was a big flaw in that story because he couldn't think of a valid reason that would be a motive for the Marquis's family to do such things because Elma couldn't understand how they would benefit from anything that happened in the last couple of months. Kalos continued by saying how it was inevitable that the culprit would most definitely strike again and as it was proven in the previous raid that Kalos couldn't manage things on her own, she told Elma and Lucy that she would need their help when that happened because she couldn't trust the guild with such matters. Elma was frowning a bit because he was taking his time to think about it and Kalos just sat there silently and after some time Elma responded that he would gladly help if Kalos was okay with trusting someone like him. Elma said that because there was a stigma in the magic world about heavy knights and he just wanted to put that out there. Lucy also added that she was willing to help and if there was anything that she could do she would love to be notified as well. Kalos ended up thanking them and expressing her gratitude for even having had the privilege of meeting Elma and Lucy. Before they left the room, Kalos called out to them to say one more thing and she explained that as big as the Nolson kingdom was, it was only protected by a small number of nobles, knights and adventurers, a few hundred tops, and that's why Kalos wanted to remind Elma and Lucy that she expected them to be at the top of their game whenever there was a need to help. Elma and Lucy didn't respond as they understood the gravity of the situation and they exited the inn and went into the streets. When they started speaking with Kellos, it was daytime outside and now the night had already settled in. Lucy knew that the mission was a complicated one but she was smart enough to understand the basics and she knew that the main thing that was causing all the problems was the fact that there existed some people that wanted to enhance the power of the monsters around Lacornia and to make them attack the city. Lucy wanted wondered whether it would be okay if they waited and whether or not something bad would happen in the meantime, but Elma explained that they couldn't act as long as they didn't have definite proof as that could cause much more trouble. Elma thought about the whole thing once again and he came to a conclusion that the enemy's main objective was to create something called Zerg, which even Lucy didn't hear about before. Elma explained that the Zerg was the second evolution of a dream lord, the first evolution happened inside the dungeon when the conditions are met, however, that wasn't the only evolution that could occur and the monster could continue eating and consuming adventurers for a while more. And if that happened, and if the conditions for the next evolution were to be met, the monster would then become bigger and stronger than the dungeon itself, which would force the dungeon to collapse. The Dream Lord would then take all the monsters from the dungeon and they would begin something called a Nightmares March, and that was the biggest disaster that could happen as even towns like Lacornia would be in great danger. 
because they would turn into graves. <laughs> okay, not funny, I'll see myself out. Now, Elma told Lucy that if achieving the Zerg was the main goal of the culprits, then they and everyone else that attended the raid quests were nothing but food for the Dream Lord, to put it simply. They were sacrificial lambs, and Lucy was really worried when she heard that. Elma opened the door of a tavern, and when they entered inside, they were welcomed by Kelt and Mabel, who were already sitting at one table. Seeing them made Elma and Lucy really happy. Kelt said how he was getting tired of all the waiting as Mabel was annoying him with her jokes and Mabel said that they could have taken their time as she enjoyed messing with Kelt. Elma was happy with the fact that they had been successful in delaying the disaster for now but he was also aware of the fact that even though they didn't know the exact identity of the culprit, it was evident that someone who wanted to see the world burn existed and they actively worked to achieve their goals. But as not to spoil the festive mood, Elma decided not to speak about that. Lucy noticed how Mabel and Kelt had really gotten much closer to each other and without much to add, they all agreed that it was high time to raise a toast in honor of their victory over the Skull Lord in a successful raid quest. After all, that was still a huge victory, not only for them, but for the city of Lacornia and the whole magic world as well. A couple of days had passed since the raid on the Cemetery of Sorrows, and as Elma and Lucy walked through the streets of Lacornia, Lucy thought how everything felt peaceful. Elma explained that after such a fight where one wrong step would end up with their deaths, everything would feel peaceful and he looked rather relieved that the fight was over and that they had some time to rest and charge up their batteries. But Lucy thought that the general public wouldn't be as peaceful had they seen what they were up against in the dungeon. But thanks to them defeating the Skull Lord, nothing bad happened and the city and its population could continue with their everyday activities without any problems, but that still didn't mean that there wasn't someone who tried to make things a lot worse. Elma thought about the person that Kalos mentioned that worked as an employee at the guild. Elma realized that even though they didn't know the person's location, it seemed that the person and whoever they received help from didn't really care about the fact that the public found out about their existence and their malicious intentions. As much as Elma thought about the whole thing, the more he couldn't figure out who the culprits might be because everything they knew wasn't adding up. There was nothing that constantly thinking about it would change and that's why Elma and Lucy made their way towards the Adventurer's Guild with the goal of picking out their next dungeon. Elma explained that before anything bad happened, their only way to prepare for anything that might wait for them was to get stronger and that's why it was really important that they continue farming experience in gold and Lucy couldn't agree more with him. When they came at the notice board, Kelt noticed them and came to say hi. Kelt said that he might have some interesting information and he added a phrase that caught Elma's attention. A good adventurer is quick on the uptake and quick on the run. And with that in mind, Elma told Kelt that he was a good adventurer if those were the criteria and Kelt apologized for trying to flee from the fight against the patchwork monsters. Elma turned to Lucy and wondered whether she would be interested in something interesting that Kelt had for them and the look of happiness on Lucy's face showed that she was all in. Elma turned back to Kelt to tell him that they wanted to hear him out but Kelt said that they should probably go somewhere else and when he was about to explain why, a couple of adventurers that were sitting at a table behind Kelt started making comments about how Kelt found another party to trick them and cheat their money away from them. Kelt turned around and gave the adventurers a glaring look and he told Elma and Lucy to leave the place with him. Elma commented that he thought how they were making a name for themselves as well, but as those adventurers hadn't been able to recognize him, he guessed that that wasn't really the case and Lucy joked about how everyone thought that Kelt was a criminal and scammer. But with that being said, Elma and Lucy exited the guild and went into a nearby tavern with Kelt. After they sat at a table and ordered their drinks, Elma immediately cut to the chase and asked Kelt how much money he wanted for his information. Kelt replied how he wasn't trying to scam them in any way and that he wasn't asking for money. So he continued with his story by saying how he heard that there were some rather strange things happening inside the Marquis family and Elma and Lucy all of a sudden became much more invested in the entire conversation. Kelt explained how the nobles in that kingdom also had a similar tradition to that of the Edwin family as well and that was that they valued abilities more than they valued blood ties. 
That didn't mean that anyone could become a part of the noble family, but what it meant was that even the youngest child could become the next head of the family depending on the outcome of his baptism and in special occasions, even a very distant relative could become the best candidate for the spot of the family heir. With that being said, Kelt overheard that there were some factions that had been formed inside the family and they fought and schemed against each other over the position of the next heir and from what Kelt could tell, there was quite a lot of plotting present. On top of all that, the current family had thought that such things were necessary and that the next heir needed to be resourceful and that was only a part of being the leader and therefore he was willing to turn a blind eye even if there were casualties in the entire process. Elma said that we heard about him before but he never knew that he was so wicked. Kel continued by telling them about the eldest daughter of the family called Snow Hole Todd. It was said that she was a genius swordsman and that she was famous for being calculating, merciless and that she barely ever talked. Kelt said how she was a bit strange but in the past couple of weeks she had used all sorts of schemes and connections with other nobles to make significant achievements by sheer force. Kelt said how he understood her will and desire to become the next heir but he had certain suspicions when it came to recent events that worried all of them. Elma thought that that story might have some truth to it, because such a story was believable after all. Elma could imagine such a scenario and he thought that it was quite possible. Kelt was surprised with how fast Elma understood things and because he knew that Elma was interested in that matter, Kelt decided to tell him. Elma thanked Kelt for his concerns and for sharing the information with him, but he also knew that that wasn't the only thing Kelt wanted to talk about. So Kelt told them to prepare themselves and he told them that the guild had been keeping that a secret from the adventurers, that a rare dungeon had appeared a little bit further away from the city. Lucy was surprised and Kelt said that such a dungeon could bring them a lot of gold, but Elma said that they were just B rank adventurers and that such rare dungeons should be left to A rank adventurers and Kelt thought how Elma was a party pooper. <laughs> Kelt tried to explain that he thought that Elma would be interested and that's why he mentioned it and before he could say anything else, Elma interrupted him to ask about the dungeon's name. Kelt said that he didn't know for sure but from what he had heard, it seemed that the name of the dungeon was the Tower of the Mythical Beasts and Elma repeated the name of the dungeon out loud because he was shocked. The bartender heard him and Lucy tried telling Elma to calm down and lower his voice as that should have remained a secret and Elma apologized for getting too hyped up. Kelt never thought about trying to clear the dungeon even if Elma and Lucy wanted him to come but he was curious about why Elma was so surprised. Elma explained that there were such dungeons that had special bonus stages which were really really rare and they contained extra rare item drops and monsters. Lucy asked him if there was a special special item he had wanted from himself from this dungeon and Elma told her that one of the monsters in the Tower of Mythical Beasts was a Grim Reaper and with that being said, Elma explained that that monster could drop the skill book that Lucy needed for her crit build, the Reaper's Assassin. Elma explained that that skill tree was as crucial to a jester as the smoldering fang of madness was to a heavy knight and Elma said how all other skills that a jester learned prior to acquiring that skill tree could be seen just as tutorial. Elma explained how that skill tree was really good for all classes that focused on close combat but the only one that could use its potential to the fullest capacity was the Jester class because it had a luck increasing skill which was the most important thing for the Reaper's Assassin. Elma said that if Lucy were to acquire that skill tree she might even become stronger than him for a little while and Lucy was thrilled to hear that and she begged Elma to raid the dungeon as that would make her rather happy and satisfied. Elma told her that she didn't need to convince him anymore and he turned around to Kelt to ask him whether he would accompany them because they could need some help from experienced b rank adventurers and Kelt said that he needed to refuse their invitation as he had some other business that he needed to see too. On top of that, Kelt said that he was always trying to do everything as cleaner as possible and he wasn't really keen on taking risks. Kelt also told Elma that they should maybe slow down a bit because they might lose focus of the bigger picture and even though Kelt was right, 
Elmo was thinking about whom they would invite as there wasn't a lot of B-rank adventurers left. Elmo knew that B-rank adventurers weren't abundant and that was even more true when they talked about solo adventurers like Kelp. Elmo thought about Mabel but he thought that she had a fixed party of her own and as much as Elmo thought about it, he couldn't think of a person that could replace Kelp. Elma ended up telling Lucy that they would be better off with just the two of them entering the dungeon and Lucy was really happy about that as well and she couldn't wait to get going. They immediately stood up from the table, paid their drinks and went out on the streets to search for a carriage. They found one and the driver took them out of Lacornia and he dropped them off near a mountain shed where Elma and Lucy spent the night. When they woke up, they made their way up a nearby mountain and after some hiking, they could finally see the dungeon's dream hole and Elmo was happy to see that no one had cleared it yet. While they walked to the dungeon's entrance, Lucy asked him whether or not Elmo was sure that they would be able to clear the dungeon in a short time frame and she added how she never heard of such rare dungeons before. Elmo explained that there was a catch with such dungeons. The dungeons would start to collapse after a certain number of monsters had been killed and even if the dream lord hadn't been defeated, the rare dungeon would vanish. Elma remembered how in the game adventurers rushed in and they never came back and the fact that the guild was hiding the dungeon's existence could mean that someone influential was farming drops for profit. But no one said that it was forbidden to enter the dungeon and Elma wasn't going to let the chance to snatch away the reaper's assassin's guild book slip away. When they entered, Lucy wondered that the recommended level 80 was a bit high and Elma agreed with her. He told her that because of that they wouldn't be going too deep into the dungeon and that they would try to stay away from dangerous monsters and suspicious places. He explained that their only goal was to acquire the skill book for Lucy and as Lucy took a look around she saw that there was a window even though they were in a dungeon. When she looked outside, she couldn't see the ground because they were so high up in the air. Elma explained that that was all part of Alzaroth's dream and that she should keep away from looking through the window as they couldn't know what would happen if she fell and Lucy immediately created some distance between herself and the window. Elma cracked his fingers and Lucy took a fighting stance as well as they prepared themselves to start their expedition to get Lucy's Reaper's Assassin skill book. The monster Elma and Lucy were hunting, the Grim Reaper, was very strong and its attacks covered a large area because of its scythe and its special skill called Spectral Permeation allowed it to pass through walls and physical attacks as well. Elma knew that the monster would end up giving them a lot of problems because it had high evasion skills and its attacking stats were also so over the roof. The hallways of the dungeon were decorated with gargoyle statues and while they walked further into the dungeon, Elma told Lucy that they would try to stay away from other monsters and that they would fight them only if they needed to. While they talked, one of those gargoyle statues seemed to be alive and when Elma and Lucy passed by it, the monster started following them. Elma noticed that and he quickly turned around to use shield bash to send the monster backwards so they could run up the stairs. They entered another hole which was a bit more spacious and when they realized that they were safe from the monster, Elma commented how his new shield was really powerful because the monster had gone further than it usually would. They walked further into the dungeon, climbed some more stairs, Elma had to warn Lucy not to fall through some cracks on the floor and Lucy was really suspicious of every other gargoyle statue that they came across. I mean this is literally me in every single video game I play. If I play a video game and you show me a statue and one of these statues attack me and none ever attack me again I will always think another one is gonna attack me again. Now while they walked through the tower of mythical beasts Lucy asked Elma whether or not there was any guarantee that a grim reaper would appear and Elma explained that the monster not appearing would be their worst case scenario and just like that while they were talking about the monster not appearing at all the grim reaper appeared right in front of them. A level 66 grim reaper floated in the air in front of them and Elma and Lucy quickly ran to draw the monster's attention to themselves. The monster seemed to notice the noise they made and it got ready to launch a surprise attack. It gripped its sight and it quickly turned around 
prepared to launch a powerful swing with its weapon. Seeing that made Elma realize what was coming afterwards. Elma knew that the Grim Reaper was preparing for a skill called the Funeral Dance and it was a lot similar to Lucy's stun barrage and the main difference was that Lucy wielded a knife and that the Grim Reaper wielded a sight. On top of that Elma explained that when the Grim Reaper started its attack its defensive stats would go up and even if it got attacked while doing its own attack the monster wouldn't waver or or flinch and such skills were called hyper armored attack skills but Elma's determination to conquer the monster by overcoming all of the challenges its skill had was much greater than anything else and he ran towards the Grim Reaper to meet it head on and when the monster raised its scythe to start its attack Elma used his shield bash to knock it away and his face showed signs of happiness and thrill. Elma knew that while the Grim Reaper used the funeral dance skill it couldn't use its special spectral pre BP I can't pronounce this word spectral permeation skill as well at the same time while doing the funeral dance skill and that was the time to act and while Elma was first to meet the monster Lucy wasn't going to just calmly sit behind him and watch the show and she also got up on her feet and quickly ran behind the monster the Grim Reaper had noticed her, but as the monster turned around, it was already too late for it to do anything about Lucy's stun barrage. The monster took some damage until it retreated from Lucy with its back turned towards Elma, and Elma knew that the fight was over just like that. He took out his sword and sliced the monster in half with a powerful swing, and the Grim Reaper collapsed onto the floor. They gained 2,899 experience points, and as Elma sheeted his sword back, Lucy came happily running towards him. He explained that if the monster managed to activate its special skill that they would be in great trouble and it was good that they were able to expose the monster's weakness so early on and bring it down without much effort. The crucial moment had come when they were about to check for the drops and as Elma was looking around the disintegrating corpse of the Grim Reaper, Lucy was so anxious that she couldn't even look and the only thing she did was that she was prayed for the skill book. They indeed got a drop and it was the Reaper site with a market value of around 15 million gold coins. It wasn't the exact drop they were hoping for but it was still better than getting nothing. And as Elma was picking up the weapon from the dungeon floor, Lucy was completely disheartened because they didn't get the skill book on their first try and she called the Reaper Sight a miss drop. And Elma was at a loss for words because the site itself was around 15 million gold coins. Oh my god, how would this girl farm Invincible Mount in WoW? It took me literally two years. I mean, it's not two years of grind, but you can do it once a week. And it took me two years, so just calculate how many weeks is that? How many weeks? In one month, four weeks, 12 months, it's like 48 weeks, 80, 96 weeks it took me to farm Invincible Mountain Wow. And she got it for the first try. And the mount drop was actually 1%, meaning 1 in 100 times you should get it, statistically. And I got it on the 96th try. So I was reaching the end of 100 tries of almost not getting it. Anyways, I'm sorry for all this mambling, random mambling. Let's go back to the story. Elma and Lucy kept going further into the dungeon. And because of the fact that this particular dungeon was in the form of a tall tower, going further into the dungeon actually meant going up the stairs. They had encountered another Grim Reaper and the battle was already on. It seemed that their strategy was the same and Elma was leading the way but when he came nearer to the monster Elma was greeted by a powerful attack called the Dragon Slayer and he quickly jumped to the side to dodge it. Elma was still focused and the attack hadn't taken even the smallest portion of attention and determination and Elma was already prepared to launch his attack. When he swung his sword the Grim Reaper laughed before using his special spell Spectral permeation <laughs> skill and because of that Elma's sword simply passed through the monster's hollow body without inflicting any damage whatsoever. Elma immediately realized that this fight wasn't going to go as smoothly as the one before and the Grim Reaper was already going after Lucy. Lucy got a bit intimidated because she didn't know what to do as the monster was in its spectral form and she knew her attacks wouldn't work. But Elma had something to say about that and he used Shadow Stomp to catch the monster's shadow and he was able to capture it and restrict its movements. 
Emma was really happy with that because now they could try and use that to their advantage. It seemed that Elma had gotten the monster's full attention and with that done, he released his Shadow Stomp skill and he continued fighting the monster head on. Elma realized that after the effects from its special skill had activated and the Grim Reaper had lost quite a lot of its attacking power and Elma taunted the monster by saying how it was much weaker than just a couple of moments ago. The monster kept on attacking and when it heard Elma's words, it seemed seemed like it was provoked and it decided to change its attack and to attack Elma directly from above and that was just what Elma wanted. He smiled because he knew that Lucy had already pounced at the Grim Reaper and by gripping her knife she used her stun barrage skill to completely slice up the Grim Reaper. Lucy deactivated her skill and the sliced up hollow corpse was slowly falling onto the ground. Lucy and Elma gained some experience points and Elma even leveled up yet again. Lucy commented how it was really tough to fight the Grim Reaper when it used its special skill and she thought that it would be good had they hired someone like a mage that could use long-range magic attacks and Elma confirmed that to be true as the monster's spectral permeation was only good against physical attacks and magic ones could still harm them. But even if they had a mage on their team, Elma knew that the mage had to be really good because the Grim Reaper was rather fast and their hitboxes were quite small and because of that, the mage would have to be quite precise and he or she needed to know how to properly spend their mana points. Lucy realized that they would have to stick with cutting the Grim Reapers down using their own wits and strengths, but Elma noticed that Lucy had gotten used to hunting them down as that was the third monster they had killed. Lucy explained that she had finally realized the range of her stun barrage skill and that helped her a lot with timing her attacks and Lucy added how she would be delighted if they were to get this book already. Elma knew that searching for Grim Reapers wasn't the easiest job and as the monster's body was disintegrating, Elma and Lucy were a bit skeptical about the drop and after the smoke cleared out, they saw that they had gotten another reaper sight which completely shattered all of Lucy's dreams and hopes. Lucy started losing her mind and she shouted out a rhetorical question. She really wanted to find the skilled book. Elma tried calming her down by saying how even the sight was really valuable and he thought to himself that even though they were a little bit unlucky, Lucy's great fortune skill should be enough to make the Grim Reapers drop their skill book. Elma thought that even in spite of them being tired and the fact that they had used quite a lot of mana points, they were still able to defeat three Grim Reapers and Lucy thought that they won't get another chance to acquire the Reaper's assassin skill book. Elma explained that if they were a bit more thoughtful of how they spend their mana and energy that they would still have a chance. While Elma was explaining to Lucy that they would try their best to avoid other monsters so they could preserve as much power as possible, a monster croaked behind them and it was evident that it was some kind of a frog. When Elma turned around and saw the monster, he immediately recognized it as the wealthy merchant Lena. That one in particular was level 90 and it looked way bigger than all the other Lena monsters they fought up until now. This was the first time that Elma's eyes glistened with excitement. Elma, forgetting what he was just telling Lucy, told her that they were going to try and hunt the Lana down. Elma started sneaking his way towards the Lana, and Lucy wondered whether or not that was the exact opposite of what Elma said about other monsters. But it seemed that the wealthy merchant Lana was so valuable that Elma couldn't let the chance slip away. In the meantime, the dungeon's entrance had become way too crowded as a group of shady looking adventurers entered with their knives out and with mischievous looks on their face. Things seemed like they were going to get really messy for Elma and Lucy. And back to our protagonist and the waifu material that's following him last couple of chapters, we see them sneaking behind the Lena as not to scare it away and when they came close enough, Elma told Lucy to try and catch it but the Lena noticed them and it started running in the nick of time. Elma couldn't believe how fast the Lana moved in comparison to its body size and the way it jumped but since Lucy wasn't going to quit just yet, she continued chasing the frog all over the place. Lucy jumped into the air and she activated her dice thrust skill and the Lana seemed really frightened because it thought that Lucy would land a hit but what ended up happening was that the Lana was able to dodge Lucy's attack in the end even though Lucy ended up successfully rolling a 6, she 
ended up hitting the ground instead of the monster. The frog quickly ran away and her ribbit ribbit sounds became more silent. Elmo finally caught up to Lucy and saw her on the floor and Lucy explained that she thought that she could reach the Lena but it ended up running anyway. Elma consoled her by saying how even getting close to that Lena was praiseworthy as well. Elma also added how the hallways of that dungeon were a lot wider than the ones in the Angel's toy box where they farmed gold and Lenas and their original strategy couldn't have worked. On top of that, the wealthy merchant Lena had a movement speed of 244 points, which was two times faster than Lucy, and there was no way in any mind, sane mind, that Lucy could catch it. Lucy felt a bit disappointed because she thought that her knife was just going to make it, but Elma assured her that that wouldn't make any difference at all, because even though that Lana had only 22 health points, its death stats were over the roof, and Lucy would need to roll three consecutive sixes to bring it down. Wait, is this some Illuminati conspiracy theory happening here? Three sixes? Hmm. <laughs> Anyways, Lucy was shocked and she realized that they never even stood a chance against it and Elma laughed and said that he thought that they might have been able to kill it with Lucy's help but it seemed that he was wrong this time. Lucy turned around and she realized that they had gone quite deep inside of the dungeon and when Elma suggested that they try to trace the path back to the entrance, somebody had seen them and was approaching to meet them. Elma quickly grabbed his sword so he would be prepared if a fight happened and he turned around to see two women, one dressed casually and the other one wearing a full armor set and the one that looked like a knight was angry at the guild for having spilled out the secret information about the Tower of Mythical Beasts. Elma looked at the two women and he immediately noticed that one of them had an enhancing rune on her sword and her hair color was the same as that of the guild master Harleen. With those two pieces of information, Elma concluded that she couldn't be anyone other than Snow Harrowlad. The other woman seemed to be her servant because she became angry with Elma saying her mistress's name out loud and she ordered Elma and Lucy to immediately leave the dungeon as they shouldn't be there in the first place. Elma remembered their conversation with Kelt and everything Kelt said about Snow Harrowlad and Elma thought that that was the perfect chance to try and get as much information as possible about the incident with the morning Trey, Paisal, Hedron, they found in the Cemetery of Sorrows. Some of you bros told me in the comments how to pronounce this word properly, but I'm just a hopeless case when it comes to the word like Trapezhedron, Trapezhedron, I don't know. Anyways, Elma asked Snow's servant whether that was an order from the Marquis family and if that was the case, they should have placed a guard at the dungeon's entrance and no one would be able to enter in the first place. Elma knew that that probably wasn't the case, but he wanted to provoke them a little bit to see their response. The servant became even more angry and just when she was about to start shouting again, Lady Snow called her name and they had a silent conversation between the two of them. The servant's name was Isabella and after a couple of moments, she bowed down and decided to do as she was told. She couldn't say no to her mistress after all. Isabella then turned towards Elma and Lucy and started a barrage of insults towards them and said how adventurers like them mostly ended up losing their lives because they were so greedy and ignorant. Isabella tried saying how they were just trying to warn them for their own good but she was once again cut by her mistress and Lady Snow whispered once again to explain to Isabella how she was a bit too rude and that she should try being a bit more indirect and Lucy couldn't understand why Lady Snow couldn't simply talk for herself. Isabella once again said that they should look at their warning and at the fact that such a rare dungeon was kept hidden from the public as a kindness from Lady Snow and that if they still persisted behaving like that, Isabella said that their skills must be on another level and she drew her weapon which was a huge lance. Elma was really surprised with the fact that Lacornia had so many people and adventurers that were really short-tempered and Lucy tried calming Elma down by saying how it would probably be better if they don't mess with the Marquis family just yet. But it was already too late as Elma had already drawn his mithril sword and he told Lucy that they would never have a chance like that ever again and Elma told Isabella that they would love to be taught by them. Isabella was a bit shocked to see Elma draw his sword as well but 
but with a smile on her face, she said that she would never be intimidated by a random rascal adventurer. Lucy tried to stop Elmo once again by trying to talk some sense into him, but Elmo explained that they weren't fighting the Marquis family as a whole, and the sole fact that they were also resorting to violence meant that they were acting without the family head's knowledge or approval, and the mischievous look on Isabella's face clearly meant that Elmo was right. Elmo also added how the skill book they were after was way too valuable to simply give up on it and that they shouldn't just give up and retreat. The mention of a skill book caught Isabella's attention, but she wasn't going to just simply stand by and listen, so she decided to go on the offensive. She started running at Elmo with her lance pointing straight at him. Elmo knew that the fight had started, so he took a moment to focus himself completely on the enemy in front of him, and he met her lance with a block using his mithril sword. Isabella realized that Elmo was an experienced adventurer, and she even deducted that he was a B-rank adventurer because he was able to defend well against her attack. However, Isabella also said that if Elma was from Lacornia, she most certainly would have known about him, and that's how she realized that Elma was from somewhere else. So he asked her if that exchange was enough for her to stop the fighting, and that question riled Isabella up even more, and she continued the fight. Isabella broke off their weapons from the clinch and tried stabbing Elma with the sharp tip of her lance, but Elma successfully deflected her weapon. But it seemed that Isabella was going for such an outcome as she used an attack called the Fortress Breaker and the attack was so fast that it ended up going through Elma's hair as he just barely managed to dodge it. But Isabella still wasn't stopping even for a second and by changing the grip on her lance she used another attack called the Helmet Piercer which came directly from above but Elma was able to block that with his Mithril Sword. Isabella was shocked to see how well Elma was holding up against her and Elma explained how he grasped the basics of a sword fight and they broke off their clinch. Isabella was really shocked with how good of a swordsman Elma actually was, but she wasn't going to give up as she didn't want to embarrass her mistress. However, Lady Snow just calmly observed everything, but the look on her face had a kind of villainous feel to it, is it me? Isabella and Elma exchanged views and when Isabella made her next move, Elma was really shocked. She used a special skill called the Sword Wave, but Elma was able to block it with his new shield. It was safe to say that Elma didn't expect Isabella to use a skill, but while Elma was hiding behind his shield, Isabella already charged a new attack and her lance was now covered with bright light and traces of mana were floating around it. Isabella rushed forward and jumped up into the air to use her Blade of Holy Light skill, which left Elma speechless. Elmo wasn't surprised with the skill itself and he was able to use parry to deflect Isabella's lance to the side which completely caught Isabella off guard and that gave Elma a good opening. Elma took that chance to use his shield bash to send Isabella flying and that gave him enough time to think about Isabella's skill which only meant that she was a holy knight which was another defensive class. Isabella said how she had underestimated Elma but if he wanted to finish her off he had used the wrong skill and Isabella said that she wouldn't give him such an easy opening again. But as Isabella was getting ready to attack once again, Lady Snow finally spoke out her name out loud and told her to retreat. Isabella was completely shocked with her statement and she tried to protest, but Lady Snow explained how Elma had defeated her when it came to a sword fight and he even defeated her when it came to the use of a skill as well. Lady Snow concluded her speech by saying how she couldn't find another reason to continue the fight. Isabella was saying how that would tarnish her reputation, but Lady Snow told her that the only reason why Elma chose to use his shield bash instead of another skill was to try to avoid inflicting some serious damage to her because they were inside of a dungeon after all. Lady Snow added that if they were to continue any further, it would only end up worse for both Isabella and her. Isabella was hard to accept defeat but she couldn't act against her mistress's orders. Elma thought to himself how Lady Snow was much more mindful and more open to conversation than her servant and then Elma had previously thought and Lucy was really shocked to hear Lady Snow's voice as she refused to talk out loud just a couple of moments ago. Isabella was angry with herself for losing to an adventurer that was around the same level as her but she couldn't blame anyone else but herself. Elma tried to be respectful as possible so he kindly asked them whether or not they could continue with their expedition and Isabella desperately 
secretly turned towards her mistress. However, Lady Snow told her that there was nothing else they could do because Isabella had lost the battle of strength which she brought up in the first place. Isabella lowered down her head and she apologized to her mistress. She was still in shock from the realization that Elma, who she thought was an ordinary rascal adventurer, he was actually stronger than her. In the meantime, Elma was thinking about Lady Snow and how she seemed to be much more different from what the rumor said about her. Elma thought that she was rather honest and she gave off a confident vibe. Isabella said that Elma and Lucy actually possessed the experience and strength that was needed to enter this dungeon, but that was just an excuse she made up for fighting Elma. She made it look like it was a quick test to see whether they would be okay without anyone's help, so they would allow them to keep exploring the dungeon. However, Isabella Isabella was still angry that she had lost and she told Elma that she hadn't even used her trump card and before she could say anything else, Lady Snow stopped her once again and Isabella ended up shouting at her mistress because she couldn't control her emotions. Elma and Lucy just silently observed their interaction and after a brief moment, Isabella realized that she had made a mistake and Lady Snow explained how they needed to keep their composure because they were nobles after all. Isabella reminded her lady mistress that the head of the family looked down on nobles that tried being considerate and compassionate of people under their care, and Isabella said that they, meaning everyone else in the family, still had doubts about Lady Snow's personality. But after a conversation with her lady mistress, Isabella turned back to Elma and she finally admitted her defeat and she told them that they could move freely around the dungeon and that they wouldn't be bothered. Elma thought a bit more about Lady Snow and as as much as he had time to observe her, it seemed to him that she wasn't really in an open competition for the position of the next heir and he thought that she wasn't as bad as the rumors say. Elma suddenly remembered the guildmaster Harleen and he thought to himself whether or not those two were related. However, Elma also thought that some parts of the rumors were true, like the part that said that Lady Snow was going around and clearing dungeons to farm and level up and try to clear as many difficult dungeons as possible, but Elma didn't think that she was in any way related related to the morning trapezhedron incident in the Cemetery of Sorrows. Lady Snow told Isabella to find out Elma's name and Elma couldn't understand why she was constantly using Isabella to convey what she wanted to say. Isabella said that Elma impressed her with his skills and that she wanted to hear his name and Elma simply introduced himself as Elma. Isabella explained how she had heard of that name before and now she could finally connect the face to the name that defeated the Skull Lord in the recent trade quest. Elma bowed down and thanked them for being worried about their well-being, but he asked for the permission to leave. Lady Snow had something to say and that was the second time she spoke out loud and she wanted to thank Elma for being kind towards Isabella even though Isabella was acting like a little bitch. However, it seemed that that was too much talking for Lady Snow and her face turned completely red. Isabella tried comforting her because she knew that Lady Snow was extremely shy and even small talk with strangers could make her blush. Elma and Lucy smiled at each other but they went on to continue with their expedition. Oh my god, I knocked everything over. Oh my god. <laughs> they got into another fight with the Grim Reaper and after defeating that one as well, Lucy found the fourth reaper site and she had lost all hope of finding the reaper's assassin skill book. Elma commented how their drop rates were really good but that the only problem was that they were looking for a specific item that wasn't dropping particularly. Lucy realized that she had gotten quite better at hunting down and fighting grim reapers and Elma told her that she was able to do that because she could learn and remember their attack patterns and their weak spots and he also added how the most crucial part of every fight is taking the chance to strike whenever they saw an opening. Lucy knew that they had to try and stay positive but she really thought that they wouldn't find the skill book they were looking for and Elma thought to himself that they maybe had the strength to hunt one more Grim Reaper. Elma thought about the dungeon itself and whether it would still be there the following day. He thought that if it was only them and Isabella and Lady Snow, the Tower of Mythical Beasts would most certainly stand tall the following day, but Elma decided that it would be safe to assume that there were other adventurers that entered the dungeon, he could at least count the ones that Kelt spilled the beans too. 
Elma told Lucy that they could try and look for the Reaper's assassin in some of the back alley shops, like the one where they bought his smoldering fang of madness, as there was a possibility that some adventurers could have found it, but Lucy seemed a bit skeptical of that idea. On top of that, she thought that the chances of that happening were very slim and Elma defended his suggestion by saying how the chances were larger than zero. And just when they were about to leave the dungeon, Elma turned around as he had heard something and when Lucy asked him what happened, Elma explained that he heard a scream which could only mean one and one thing, only. The Dream Lord had been spotted and someone was calling for help. And that's all for today's video, bros. Thank you so much for watching this mega video of all chapters of this manga. As soon as more chapters come out, I'll be sure to recap them. Please check out my anime recap channel and also live stream channel. We've already done some giveaways on it and we'll do more in the future. Always stay awesome like this, bros, and peace!